Yes, hello everybody. I'm Phil Liggett. This is Paul Show, and welcome to Roubaix. This is where the rides will be in a few hours' time, having made their traditional annual, annual crossing of the Hell of the North. 27 sectors of cobblestones. It really is a race that the riders feel they have to ride, but the vast majority don't really want to. Why? Well, it's a mad race. It's a race from a different era. I just remember going back to my performances in Paris Roubaix. My best performance was actually 15th. It was a wet Paris Roubaix. I fell off on nine occasions, but I really wanted to get to the finish. But on this day, I lay on the ground, still strapped to my bike on the cobblestone section at Mont Saint-Pavel, and the crowd picked me up and pushed me off. That's the only way I got to the stadium. Well, by the end of this day, of course, every cyclist who completes will indeed have a story to tell. There are 27 sectors of cobblestones on this course, and this year the police are out in force on some of them because they felt last year the crowd misbehaved a little bit, too much beer, and that they caused something of a risk to the rider's safety. Uh, what are the sort of hard sectors, Paul? Well, I always think about the first real rendezvous is the Forest of Arenberg. It's a 2.4 kilometre section of cobblestones, and that's where you can lose Paris Roubaix but not necessarily win it. The riders are also saying this year that they feel the Mont Saint Pavel section is almost as difficult as the Forest of Arenberg. But if you want to win Paris Roubaix, you've really got to be on form. You've really got to have the power in the slightly uphill drag over the Pavé de l'Arbre. Well, all the festivities for this event, by tradition, always start on the Saturday afternoon in Compiègne. We were there yesterday, particularly Paul Sherwin, talking with the riders. It was a lovely sunny day. There was a big crowd. The atmosphere was electric. Here's what Paul had to say then. <laughs> Robbie, pretty good performance this week in the Skelder Prize, but uh, this is not really the kind of race that I think you adore, Paris Roubaix. Well, I've ridden it twice before, but it was a long, long time ago. Uh, Twelve years ago, to be exact, I was on the start of Paris Roubaix, and uh, I actually quite enjoyed it. But since then, I've always had sort of leaders in the team, you know, uh, you know other riders who make a, a real goal of Paris Roubaix, and I, I focus on other things. But you know, I'm here this year and uh, going to make the best of it and try and enjoy it and see how far I get. It's quite good for a sprinter though because you've got to be in the right place at the right time to get onto the cobblestones and then it can actually make the race just a little bit easier if you are in the first 10 or 15 places. Yeah, getting onto each section is a little bit like a, a bunch sprint and uh, you know sprinters can do that well and I, really I, I ride not too badly over the stones and I will see when I'm on the really rough sections and when the, the big guns come out how far I actually get. What people don't understand though is it's really important to have teammates with you for as long as possible and that's probably what people at Podzato is thinking and expecting from you tomorrow. Yeah, well that's that's the thing, when you've got someone in the team who can actually win the race, the very important thing for them is to have as many guys around them for as long as possible. Uh, a big part of Paris roubaix is uh, having that little bit of luck that you either don't puncture or if you do, that you get a wheel really fast. So if you've got a teammate riding behind you who can give his wheel, that's uh, a huge advantage, so that's what it's all about. Well, with this weather, you might just enjoy it a little bit more tomorrow. Yeah, it'll be pretty dusty, though. Good luck, Robbie. Thanks, mate. Well, George, a week after the Tour of Flanders, uh, you had good legs in Flanders, but maybe, you know, the tactics uh, robbed something away from you. Yeah, I felt good in Tour of Flanders. I missed some opportunities that um, I probably should have tried to take advantage of, but, uh, you know, I'm happy with the way my form is right now. This is the kind of race that you dream about uh, through the whole of the winter season. Is everything right for uh, a good attempt to try and win Paris Roubaix for a first time? Definitely, it's as good as it can be. I feel great. Um, I got a good team behind me, and I just need some good luck. And uh, you know, hopefully, it'll finally happen. A little bit of bad news for you this week because you've lost Alessandro Balan, who seemed to be riding quite well last week in the Tour of Flanders. Is that going to be uh, a little bit of a disappointment for you and the team? Well, yeah, I mean, I, uh, Balan was a great uh, teammate. You know, he's a he's a he's a good guy. Always uh, very good spirited. So we're missing him already, and I'm sure we're going to miss him a lot tomorrow. How's that going to change the tactics? Because I think we all know it's important that Paris Roubaix to have big teammates alongside you, especially going down to the last 30, 40 kilometers. Yeah, it'll change a bit. I mean, he was uh, getting better. His form was uh, coming coming along quite well. He was there at the final in Flanders. So we expected big things from him on uh, tomorrow, but uh, we just got to, you know, play our cards and you know, possibly focus more on myself and Marcus um, and hope that uh, we have one or two guys there at the end that uh, can make a di the difference in the final case. One final question. It looks like this is going to be this kind of weather for Paris Bay, which will make it a fast event. Is that to your advantage or will that go against you? Uh, I've done them all. I've done them in all different kinds of conditions. So I think, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm so focused for this race that the conditions don't really matter. Bernard, great form. You've still got good form. Uh, Paris Bay. what are the ambitions for Team HTC Columbia? 
Uh, the first ambition is like to show a good race and to be out there well, when, yeah, when the big boys move. And now we have a good team, like just to work together, stick together, like we showed the last years and yeah, like we showed in every year, in every race the last two years. And I think it's a kind of race tomorrow where you might be able to take advantage of maybe a marking between Cancellara and Tom Bonin, the two big favorites, and it may create rather a strange race for a change. Uh, I think it's like, uh, it's more that like it's not going to be four names for me. It's even Fletcher is in, the, in that group and Pozzato, they have like really, really big form. And behind us, like even Matthew Breschel, Tor Hushoff, never forgot those names. And I'm there. And yeah, we all need a little bit of luck, no crashing, no punctures. And uh, I think it's going to be a group that just splits up uh, every sector and still big favorites will decide it at the end. Having won uh, Game Wable game just recently, you must have uh, changed your ambitions and uh, come, become a much more confident rider, especially for races like Paris-Roubaix. Now, I was always confident for those uh, for Flanders or Roubaix, but at the mo moment, it's like, yeah, of course, it gave, it gave me something. Uh, yeah, I know I, I could I could do it there. And normally, Roubaix suits me more than to a Flanders did. I was good in Flanders, had a bad crash at the wrong moment. And no, I'm looking forward to it. And uh, But I also say, like, winning a Game Valve game also put more pressure on my, on my shoulders from myself. But do you have that special motivation that you have to have if you really want to be a, a Tour Paris-Roubaix? contender oh yeah that's like <laughs> I mean I'm 10 years pro now I have to show it now because otherwise it's too late and it's like the question is always how long you are talent <laughs> thank you it was a little bit difficult last week in Tour of Flanders for you and the team but I think this is a race Paris-Roubaix that suits you a lot well I think tomorrow is Roubaix Sunday was uh, Flanders was one week ago so well as you say it was difficult but uh, we are not worrying about tomorrow. I think all the team we are going to do our best, and, and that's I think it. you seem to be very happy with this new team Sky. They work very well for you, and they work very well together in only their first year on the circuit. Yeah, I mean, for being the first year, I mean, important is that we are such a nice group. We are riding, racing together a lot, and having a lot of fun. That's the most important. Doesn't matter if it's working for me, like in some classics or to Edwal or some other rider. I think that's a really, really good, important, really good group uh, team. Sorry, and we are doing really well. It's nice to have the experience of someone like Kurt Adler Arbison, but also the power of someone like Matt Heyman and, and Chris Sutton to look after you on the cobblestones. Exactly. It's, uh, I think we are really an homogenic team. Everybody, the experience of, of Michael Barry there, uh, Kurt and CJ, Matthew, I think he's going to play a really good, he's going to do a really good race tomorrow. So, yeah, we are all happy with this new team. And a rider from Spain, you seem to be quite happy with the weather conditions. Well, I don't care about the weather conditions. <laughs> I mean, I will accept it as, as they come. Nobody knows. They can predict a little bit, but uh, let's see. Still tomorrow to come. Okay, good luck tomorrow. Thanks. Thanks. Good, good, good. Just a couple of questions. Uh, Tom, I don't know if you ever think about history when you come into a race, but you won this race three times before. You, you could be looking at equaling the record of Roger de Vlamic, but do you take each race as a time, or do you think about that? You think about it because you get the question a few times a day, yeah? but uh, I don't really uh, start to, to uh, have a record or to get an equal score with Roger or something. No, it's every year is important, and uh, every year when you win, it gets more important. But the motivation is the same as, as the last five, six, seven years that I took the start. And uh, I've been riding to win ever since, uh, since I turned pro, and I'll try to keep on doing that for a few years to come. Well, you have had one week to think about the defeat by Fabian Cancellara last week, but uh, Paris-Roubaix is a, a different kind of race, isn't it? Uh, it's almost the same riders, but uh, in the classic it's a little bit of a different race. It's not really a race where you have to be explosive or anything. Uh, and most of all, it's the same four or five riders that uh, end up in the final, especially if it's a little bit harder than, uh, than the other years. And We'll see. I hope uh, I can defend my, my title with my, uh, my legs that I had last week. It will already be good and maybe be a little bit better. Final question. Do you ever fear being marked out of the race because you're a super favorite like Fabian Cancellara and, and somebody else are running off up the road? It's live, eh? 
I already won more races than Fabian did, so I don't think I have to be uh, the unlucky one. And uh, I think after the last few weeks, uh, the only thing we can do is be happy because it was really, really beautiful races. I enjoyed racing them, and Fabian was uh, was the strongest. And uh, if you did everything that you need to do, yes, there's only one thing you can do and say, okay, try it again next year, please. Well, Tyler, great, role, great performance this week in Game Wavell Game. That must uh, be a good indication for you that the, the form is still there. Yeah, uh, Skelder Prize. <laughs> Skel <laughs> good, good. Great, great win for you this week in the Skelder Prize on Wednesday. That's a, a sign, I think, that the form is still there. Yeah, you know, this uh, this stretch is the, the really important um, from Kent Wevelgem two weeks ago through Depana, Flanders, Skelda Prace, and now Rebe. And uh, yeah, to win to win uh, on Wednesday was really good for the morale. I think uh, everyone's really positive going into tomorrow. I think what's positive really is the, the way the team is structured. The team rode very strongly as a unit last week in the Tour of Flanders, and that's, I think, what you need to try and get a victory in paris Rebe. Yeah, you know, we've, we've put a big effort into the Classics this year, and I think we have a really strong team, and you see it in the results we've put out. So between uh, Van Summeren, Mascant, Miller, myself, you know, we have a few cards to play, and uh, it's going pretty well. It's nice for you because you can sit back as a tactic and watch uh, the attacks of riders like David Miller. Are you surprised the way Miller's riding in these Classics? Because these are races he always avoided. Uh, and I'm not surprised. I think it's a it's a pity he didn't come up here sooner. Um, obviously, they suit him really well. He's a strong guy. He rides his bike well, and you know they're they're kind of the perfect races for him. So I think if he keeps coming up here in the next few years, you'll see him on the podium pretty soon. It's a long time since you first rode Paris Roubaix, but now that you come into it uh, as an outsider to possibly win, how, how do you feel in, in in the back of your mind? Um, like I said, I feel good. The the form's right where I want it to be. Uh, whether or not I can can win, that's that's more uh, something for my teammates. I think Martijn or Johan have both proven themselves. You know, they've been top five here before. Uh, so I'm here mostly to help them, unless something changes on the road. All right, good luck. Thanks a lot. Good win. Well, sure. This is a race that you've won in the past. You uh, dedicated yourself last week to Fabian Cancellara. How are the legs on the eve of Paris Roubaix? Yeah, I'm um, feeling pretty good actually. Um, yeah, went pretty deep last week, uh, along with the whole team. But uh, I think when when the team has a win like that, we hurt a lot less than all the others. So um, you know, I'm feeling pretty good. With the way the tactics might run out, there could be a big marking between Bonin and Cancellara, the, the two big favourites. Is that an opportunity that you and Saxo Bank would like to try and exploit? Yeah, we're we're kind of prepared for every kind of situation. I mean, uh, it's very similar to. Uh, the same time 2007 similar kind of uh, running I guess you know Fabian's on probably better form than back then my form's probably not quite as good as back then um, but we're you know we're prepared for everything the team's really come up another level uh, Matty Breschel's in you know fantastic form I think uh, all we've got to do is race smart uh, like we have been together as a unit from the start of the, the classics campaign and keep Fabian uh, rubber side up it was uh, pretty impressive last week when you saw Team Saxo Bank come to the front, 140 kilometres to go, and say, right, we're going to impose our authority. Yeah, it was a little bit earlier than um, probably uh, everyone expected, um, and even ourselves, you know. We, I, we really didn't know that was a key point of the race. Um, and, you know, in a race like Tour of Flanders, if you get caught out, you know, one or two kilometres later, it can change the entire, uh, the entire race. So we thought... It's just, uh, you know, we've got such a strong team. Let's just get up there and uh, take the ball by the horns. And the fortunate thing with having someone of uh, Cancellara's power in your team is that, you know, you can unleash him 60, 40K to go. It's not going to make much difference. Same sort of attitude tomorrow then for the team. All for one and one for all. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we are all here. Fabian's the number one card and, and that's that. You know, he's uh, at the moment he's racing on another, on another level, different planet. So um, I'm glad he's my teammate. <laughs> Thank you very much. Good luck, mate. Okay. A great performance by the team last week. It really was a dominating performance. And is that the kind of attitude the team expects to have tomorrow in Paris Roubaix? Yeah, for sure. Um, gave us confidence to, and morale for, for this race, you know, the way we raced uh, the last couple of weeks. And uh, more or less uh, winning every race, you know, that um, puts pressure on us. But uh, I think we can handle it. And uh, I think. For this race, we're actually better suited as a team compared to Tour of Flanders. A big problem in a race like Paris Roubaix and like yourself last week in uh, Tour of Flanders is you can have mechanical problems and it's tough to come back from. 
It is, it is. But um, I just talked to Lars Mikkelsen uh, about this race, and you know, before you go into it, you have to think about getting two punctures and one crash. <laughs> Uh, already prepare for it mentally um, you know if it happens uh, never give up always believe in it until the the last K um, so that's the crazy thing about Pyro Bay it's a race where you know you're gonna have bad luck you have to have courage and you have to have determination to fight back all of the time and with a team like yours you, you've got great support to, as a group to come back from those incidents yeah yeah for sure we have a strong team and Everybody's 100% uh, loyal, and uh, we know we can win. So that, of course, give us the the confidence, and yeah, you know, hopefully uh, nothing serious will happen. Yeah, thank you. Well, David, I was talking to a journalist just a little while back, and he was telling me you'd never actually ridden Paris Roubaix before. You'd actually only ridden Paris Trois-Villes. Is that right? Compiègne Trois-Villes. Yeah. <laughs> In 2000, I was here for Francis Moreau who at Coffey's was our leader at the time, and I was just here to kind of ride in the wind for him until the first section and then pull out. So that was as far as I ever wanted to get before last year when I came here as a fan. Three days of La Pana with a victory there and then a great performance in the Tour of Flanders. Where's the change come from? Um, a decision. I just decided that I really wanted to commit to these this year. And uh, I kind of, you know, I've, I've pigeonholed myself a lot in the past and been pigeonholed, and I think sometimes you need to kind of break free of that. And I, I, I kind of made a real big, I, big, push for that this winter and then it's kind of paid off which I'm really pleased about and I think I'm going to spend the next few years really going for these races. But what is it? Is it? Is it the history? Is it the fact that you have to be a courageous rider? You've got to fight back from adversity? What what motivates you and what has motivated you to come back and, and try these towards the end of your career? Um, I think it's taken me this long to get tough enough. <laughs> it's taken me all the uh, my checkered and up and down history to actually get to this point where I kind of feel where I kind of can actually handle it. And I, I'm loving it. I mean, Flanders and even De Panna and stuff, I was just, I felt like I was in my element. You know, the harder the conditions and kind of the more it was deteriorating around me, the better I started to feel. And I think Flanders, I was disappointed because I made some kind of just stupid mistakes and just not not particularly my own fault, but just because I hadn't, I'd never ridden up the Koppenberg, I'd never done the Paterberg, never done the Mullenberg. It was just all new to me and it was all a bit of a frantic, frantic chase. But these are all things I can learn. I heard that you were standing at the side of the road in Pyro Bay with a broken collarbone, handing up drinks to the guys, and you thought all of a sudden, hey, I think I could enjoy this. I was uh, I was here with Doug Ellis, the team owner, last year, like you said, and it was just seeing all the fans at the side of the road and seeing what kind of knowing that I could always do that for the rest of my life, I could come back and be a fan at the side of the road, and thinking to be able to, that I would be doing that in the future and, and never be able to say, oh, I rode this, was just stupid, and so it was that was kind of what got grabbed my imagination. I actually had the opportunity to take part in it and actually be part of the race, and so that's why I'm here. You've got great form, you've got great legs, that's proven in three days of La Pana, proven last week. There could be rivalry between Tom Bonin and Fabian Cancellara. Is that an opportunity for you and Team Garmin Transitions to take advantage of? I think so, and I think particularly with the headwind, it's going to turn into a very tactical race. And often in these situations, when you have such two clear and outs and out favourites with strong teams, it can turn into a who dares win scenario because if they're launching guys off far out it means that the race is going to shut down behind and so we've got to be very careful of that and we have four very strong guys with myself tyler who's in the form of his life and then we have two guys who've already proven themselves with johan and and martin and if we're all firing tomorrow which i hope that's going to put us in a very opportunistic position where i don't know who dares wins like i said thank you Hello and welcome to what is the 108th edition of the race they call the race through the hell of the north of France. It is indeed Paris-Roubaix over a distance of 258 kilometres. I'm Phil Liggett, alongside me is Paul Sherwin and these are some of the winners certainly over the last uh, 10 years. Tom Bonin today uh, could join the great name of Roger de Vlaming if he were to win because he'd become only the second cyclist uh, to win Paris-Roubaix on four occasions. Belgium head the nation's table, 53 victories so far and a distant second is France with 28. Well, the race animation today, as we look at the uh, sections of roads here, these cobblestones, Paul, there's 27 sectors of them. They do have their rather tough ones. They're categorised by a number of stars, five stars meaning the hardest straights. Well, it's a difficult race because it zigzags through the north of France, looking for these pieces of cobblestones that have been preserved, some of them dating back to Napoleonic times. Right down towards the very end, though, the one that they all want to lead over is the Pavé de l'Arbre.
So as we look down from the helicopter here now, the race uh, with 136 kilometres to go, and they are in pursuit of 19 riders who broke away, as almost by tradition in Perry Bay, very early on today. In the breakaway, though, from Australia is Matthew Goss and Adam Hansen riding uh, for the first time, Perry Bay. They both got into this forward group and are trying to make some leeway. But I think the peloton is keeping them more or less under control, Paul. We're waiting, of course, for the real heavy sectors of the cobblestones to go. This is the peloton being led at the moment by the Garmin Transitions team. Yeah, everybody's getting very nervous now. They will get much more nervous as they get closer to the forest of Arenberg, but it is so important to hit these cobblestone sections in the first 10 to 15 places. You can see the organisation of the, the same coloured jerseys coming to the front. These are teams trying to make sure that their leaders get onto the cobblestones in an ideal position. You can tell by the way this field is so compact here at the moment. This is uh, more or less uh, fast tempo riding rather than attacking riding by the peloton. The breakaway, which we haven't seen uh, yet, we've got 19 riders in it, uh, including Jeremy Hunt, uh, the British rider on the Cervelo team, who spends a lot of his winter time in Australia to enjoy the summer months down there. Also in this breakaway is Chris Sutton as well, another Aussie riding now for a new team, Sky for him, and also Greg Henderson of New Zealand. Those are basically the English-speaking content of this 19-man front group as we now go on to sector 23. We count down to the final sector before the finish in Roubaix itself. Weather, by the way, a little bit chilly, but it is a bit more spring-like. As you can see, you have fluffy clouds around, and the gap is now up to 4.22 as the 19 riders get onto this sector. Well, of these 27 sections of cobblestones the riders will go over today, they are ranked by a star system. This is ranked as a three-star which is a medium difficulty section of cobblestones. The most difficult ones are five-star, and that, of course, is the one which will come up in around about 30 kilometres' time, the forest of Arenberg, which I think uh, brings a little bit of fear and trepidation into the heart of every bike rider's mind when you even mention the name. Yes, yeah, interesting to note that uh, this year, because there was rather a, a police had an unruly crowd in the forest last year, uh, probably primed a little bit by the alcohol, so they banned all alcohol this year and they've also uh, um, we've had pictures from the Arlenberg Forest they seem to be allowing the spectators to stand on only one side of the very narrow road there. Riders still to approach that uh, as we now continue on our way here 4.20 is the gap so it is starting to come down. It's a good lead they've given these 19 riders a good chance here strong men might go forward once the road gets onto those rough cobblestones well, they'll start to eat into the advantage of that 19-man leading group as they get closer and closer to the forest of Arenberg because these riders in the main field will accelerate every time they approach the cobblestone section. It's so important to ride Paris-Roubaix in the first uh, positions of the main field because if you sit too far back in 30th, 40th position, that's when you get subjected to the accidents and injuries and, and maybe even get delayed by riders who've got a mechanical incident. The black line on the yellow flag there, that's the fl flag of Flanders. And this is the French side of Flanders where we are now as the riders here, not too far as they get closer towards the commentary position uh, where they'll come very close to Belgium itself but it stays all in France the race today and uh, again attack starting to come, looks like we've got BMC trying to make a move now well, BMC will be trying to look after the interests of George Hincapie, who, uh, amazingly enough, Phil, is starting his 17th Paris-Roubaix today. It seems amazing. Yeah. He was, for many years, uh, when he's with the Motorola squad, his first professional cycling team, the youngest rider in the peloton for about three years in a row with Kevin Livingston. And the other man you mentioned, Paul, with the remarkable uh, palmarès in this event is Serves Canavan. Serves Canavan, yes. He's uh, now trying to attempt to break a very incredible record when you think about it he's starting his Paris-Roubaix for the 16th time and hoping to be the first rider ever to start and finish 16 Paris-Roubaix very often of course the non-finish is not down to the aching legs it's down to the condition of the roads uh, which tend to uh, break up the bikes once they get out on these cobblestones things fall off you never knew were on there to start with and uh, very often your retirement is prompted by a situation rather than by a lack of effort on your part the thing today is, although up until a week ago we had plenty of rain in the region, it's all gone away last week and the cobblestones look as though they've dried out very, very well. Some riders won't like this, a lot of dust in the eyes instead of mud and uh, can lead to conjunctive ices as well. This is the peloton virtually, there's been a crash here I think, or are they just queuing up? To, no, there's the fall on the right-hand side, it's almost to be expected in this race. 
Well, this can happen anyway on the running towards the finish. A rider gone down there very hard, and in fact, it looks to me as if that might be Stain de Volder. It is Stain de Volder. Volder. And uh, there you can get a chance to see the special bike that he's got. It's got little gels in the forks of the front and rear, and de Volder looks extremely injured there, Phil. They're trying to get himself up. All of the riders who participate in Paris Bay know that they will have some bad luck during the day. It's almost impossible not to ride this race without a flat tire or without yep. a crash or without just being delayed on a section of cobblestones like this. But the one man that uh, he won this race four times, Roger de Vlamic, he never ever had a mechanical problem. An unbelievable record. Until, until the, the last Paris Roubaix yep. that he ever rode, and that was the first time that he ever had a flat tire, but he did. Uh, however, let's not forget, go on to win Paris Roubaix on four occasions. A record that Tom Bonin today is hoping that he may well be able to equal. Well, just looking at the leaders here now. New colours for Greg Henderson, right in the centre in the black jersey and the blue gloves. Uh, the Kiwi changing teams from HTC Columbia to the British team Sky this year. And as you can see, he's in the breakaway here at the moment. There is the full list of riders in the breakaway. Mitchell Docker, I forgot to mention poor Mitch Docker, is also in here. He rides for Skill Shimano, he's read the move well, he's got a teammate in Ray Curvers also up in the leading group. So there's a few teams got two riders represented here, the other team is Rabobank, the, the Dutch setup, Rick Flaints and Tom Lisa are up there as well. The gap though is coming down now, the peloton itself is crashing along the cobblestones of sector 23, the leaders 347 in front of that. Well, the importance of having uh, teammates around in a race like Pyro Bay Phil is at the moment the main peloton has been split up into around about three or four different groups. Now, the service vehicles, uh, the vehicles that carry the spare wheels and the spare bikes, can be as far as two or three minutes behind. So, if you have a mechanical right, right, incident right. at a time like this, you're going to have to rely on a teammate passing across a wheel. Now, you can see the tactics here now, Paul. The strong men are getting to the front and keeping a much quicker tempo now. They're really worried and they approach the forest of Arenberg, which is the tranche of Arenberg forest. It's 2.4 kilometres of cobblestones. And it really is a very, very bad five-star sector. Yeah, but you can see the acceleration at the front end of the peloton. It's having a, a big job of bringing down that gap to three minutes and 45 seconds. And that will continue to happen, I think. With that breakaway group being such a large group of 19 riders, there will be a lot of passengers in that group, yep. and all of a sudden they will start to, to slow down the organisation they had in the first part. It's always the team manager's orders in the morning, go for the early morning breakaway, we need to get represented. Okay. But as the race starts to develop, they're not quite so dedicated to keeping that breakaway off the front. Liqui Gas here are moving to the front, and they are looking like a very well-drilled squad this afternoon. They've actually had a very good season, Liqui Gas, uh, and looking as though that they are going to pull off a big win sooner or later it may be today who knows they'll keep very strong pace on the front as they head towards the forest the idea being that strong men's getting to the forest first as uh, the, the leaders are now heading on to sector number 22 here which will put them on the capel sur et Gaillon. and there they are and they're also piling on the pressure they're just trying to stay away as long as they can and if they've got the strength it's a four-star section of 1700 meters if they've got the strength try and join in the party that comes up from behind. A lot of the riders that have got themselves into this uh, early morning breakaway, Le Chapé Matinal as the French call it, is that they want to be there when their leaders catch them up to have power in numbers and that's the important thing. Good to see Team Sky have got a couple of riders up here. That of course is for Juan Antonio Fletcher and of course Team uh, HTC Columbia have two riders in this break as well and that will of course be for Bernard Eisel who uh, just recently won himself game wave or game. Well, there are the carrots that force the other teams to chase now. It is a nice mixed bunch up front. A little bit uh, breaking with tradition as much that it is a big break, 19 riders rather than just half a dozen. And there are some good names in that breakaway as well. Some successful names of this year, not least uh, Greg Henderson and Chris Sutton as well. Started off the year with a big bang when he won the Jaco Bay Classic Series down in Geelong area. And now we're settling in with uh, the new Team Sky, which has had some success uh, and certainly uh, deserved it so far. Well, almost four minutes separating the leading group of 19 riders to uh, the main field. The main field very shortly will be coming up to that section of cobblestones to the cobblestones of Rua, cobblestone section number 22. They will all, though, Phil, be counting down to the forest of Arenberg because that, as I mentioned, every year is not the point where you can win Paris Bay, but certainly for a lot of riders in the past, it's been the section of cobbles where riders have lost their Paris Bay. This is uh, Gorik Garden, who's on the front, uh, on the left of our picture now. Former, uh, though his parents are in fact Russian, he is a Belgian, very much so, and lives here. 
And this is actually him now, just come through in the blue jersey for the Vacon Soleil team. A team that uh, didn't make the cut for the Tour de France this summer, a little bit disappointing for them. But it was a very difficult situation. Taking up the ring now, Sebastian Lang from the Amiga Lotto team. It's also very interesting about Paris Bay in the early section of cobblestones is it's almost more difficult to get onto the cobblestones than it as is actually than to ride them because everybody's battling to get into the first 15, 20 places on the cobblestones. And once you've done that, it's almost a sigh of relief and you back off a fraction. However, once you get to the latter section of cobblestones, the accelerations take place over the stones and that's where you try and put distance between yourself and the other riders in the group. There's a definite way to ride these cobblestones, isn't there, Paul? Because these guys are all riding fairly high gears and riding down the centre of the path. The important thing is actually not to hold the handlebars too tight to allow the front end of the bike to try and find the smoothest road over the cobblestone. You can actually almost see the bikes bouncing from stone to stone here. It is very important though to, to keep a lot of power because you can't ride the cobblestones with a supple pedaling style. You have to use a massive big gear. Jeremy Hunt over on the right hand side, a former British national champion. Good to see Jeremy riding uh, so successfully with Cervelo Test Team. He seems to have found himself a team that he's happy with over the last couple of seasons. His presence in this breakaway field, though, is to look after Tor Hushoff, who finished third in this race last year, if they come back together. Well, Jeremy is uh, the epitome of longevity, really, because this is his 15th season as a professional, and last year he finished 19th. Tremendous finish in this very event. So he's read the move. Uh, but it's an awful long way still to go. The total distance, 258 kilometres. We've now got 129 left. So 130 have been covered. There's the peloton as they leave uh, and head on to sector 22. At their 21, rather, that's their next bound after this. And they continue on their way. Well, the main field are now just uh, entering into uh, section number 22, and that's the section yeah. over Bua. Still uh, almost four minutes separating the leading group of 19 riders and the main field. You probably caught a glimpse there too of the special motorbikes that the police use when they escort this race. They actually use motocross bikes uh, because very often they take to the fields along with the riders because these roads are so narrow here. This is the three-star section. The, the worst sectors are five. And as we get down towards the Forest of Arnberg, you'll see why that's got a five-star when we get there. The crowd may not be as big as we've seen in previous years because of the restriction put on by the uh, police of Northern France. They're stopping them on one side of the road and also banning the use of alcohol. Even so, there were a lot of people there yesterday watching the riders take out the cobblestones as they rode through. Training runs at 356, the gap here. Yes, doing a lot of work at the front end there. The riders in the lime green jerseys. I believe that they will be looking out today, Manuel Kinziato and Frederick Willems. But they've got a young kid, a Slovakian rider on the squad, Peter Seguin, who yeah. won two stages of Paris Nice this year. But he really came to uh, our notice when we saw him riding in the Tour Down Under. And he was in a, a fairly uh, high level breakaway with Alejandro Valverde, <laughs> Luis Leon Sanchez, and Cadell Evans. And all of a sudden, I said to myself, who's this kid in the lime jersey? Absolutely, we didn't know him then, we certainly know him now. And as you say, he rode exceptionally well in Paris Nice. Uh, that is a race which is also promoted by the same organizers as Paris Roubaix, which is the. Uh, French uh, ASO group that organised the Tour de France. Now this is life, he's not so good at the back here. Now it looks like we've got a little bit of a problem here. This is the, the uh, Androni Giacotto team. And it looks like we've got Bertolini in the spot above her there. 356 now the gap. They're making a bit of a meal of this. Well, it just gives you an idea of how difficult it is at the back once the uh, power goes out from the engine room. It's so difficult to keep going over. The safest place, as you mentioned earlier, Phil, is to ride down the middle, the crest of the cobblestones, because that's where they're least displaced, because of the fact that most of these roads are used by heavy vehicles like tractors and like uh, combine harvesters, and they damage the sides of the road. It's on the crest in the middle where it's usually the smoothest, and that's the safest place to avoid also having flat tyres. Well, these narrow roads uh, preserved largely from Napoleonic days. And uh, many of them are protected now, they're, they're not allowed to be improved if they are repaired. They use cobblestones to put them back in, in their place. They become the monuments of northern France. And of course, this is a very famous race, starting uh, just at the end of the 19th century. 1896 was the first Paris-Roubaix, which was also the first year's ball reminded me of the first Olympi modern Olympiad, anyway, back in 1896. But uh, 
it, for the leaders, it looks as though they're just riding on the crest of a wave, doesn't it? But for those guys at the back, they're really struggling. And now you can see at the back of the convoy there the dust which is created by the passage of the race, and it really is most annoying to the eyes. Also, take a quick look at the left-hand side there. The, the teams get themselves very organised in a race like Paris-Roubaix because of the fact that very often the service cars are so far behind on these cobbled sections that they actually have their team vehicles and the mechanics go with spare wheels to the end of every section of cobblestones, and the riders know this. And if they get a, a flat tyre halfway through a cobblestone section like this, they'll keep riding on the rim to get themselves to the end of the cobblestones to get a spare wheel from one of the mechanics at the side. That's Marcin Sapa from Poland. Uh on the right hand side of the road, just rejoining perhaps after a puncture, but he's coming up strongly now. There's the long ride. The riders in the middle are not just looking for holes in the road right now, they're also trying to keep the dust out of their eyes. And as uh, this peloton is still very, very big here. 19 riders in front are getting away soon after the start and gradually building up to a leading group of 19. With a number of Australians in there and uh, one New Zealand rider in Greg Henderson and one British rider in Jeremy Hunt. There's the full list of names for you there. It's Jeremy Hunt there in uh, second, third position now in the black jersey of Cervelo Test Team. A big helper for Torhushoft a little bit later on. It's a big question mark over Torhushoft. I think we all expected him to mm. ride very well last week in the, the Ronde van Flanders, the Tour of Flanders, but he really didn't seem to have that form. I think he's had a very difficult start to the season. In fact, uh, he puts down his, uh, his bad form to the start of the season the fact that his daughter just started kindergarten she's brought a whole host of uh, little strange viruses yeah. and obviously he's been picking them up and fighting to stay healthy so the field back out of that sector of cobblestones now and then the main peloton racing in here BMC the red jerseys new uh, much more powerful team this year with the signing of Cadell Evans who steers well cleared of Paris Roubaix by the way he's not uh, part of the team but George Hincapie is their protected rider today and I think Bertol Bertolini has just had a crash at the back of the race. I can hear them talking on race radio, but we're not seeing pictures of it at the moment. That's another great challenge for our cameramen, too, is to keep in amongst it here, because that's why we get the odd bit of picture breakup. It's simply the vibrations over the cobblestones, but they do a remarkable job. They do. There you can see one of the, the bikes there that we were talking about a little earlier. They're motocross bikes that the, right, the, mo the motor cameras use on this occasion. It really is a very special event to try and cover. You can see how long the li line is of the main oh. field as well. That's an indication. These boys really are putting the hammer down. It's mainly a headwind race today in Paris-Roubaix because the northerly wind is uh, blowing down towards Paris. But towards the latter part of the race, as the riders zigzag across yep. these farmlands of the northern part of France, they get a crosswind from the left, a crosswind from the right, a headwind, a tailwind. A very difficult race to judge. Well, just take a look at this now. They really are putting the screw on at the front now to try and split this big field up before we get down to the forest of Arenberg. That is a long, long line of riders now. And if there is a change of direction and the wind comes from across, then you'll see that peloton split into six or seven different bunches. It is a hard day at the office for these riders hanging in at the back of the race just now and having to work hard just to hold the wheel in front. That's, uh, this is Jackson and uh, Stuart Jackson here from the USA, who's about to slip away from the back. Leif Hosler over to the left, I think it is. I'm not sure if you noticed the, the, the rider there from Vacancel on the left-hand side yep. of the road. He was making a sign with his hand to indicate that he was looking for a drink. Now, you may well have wondered why was he doing that. Well, every one of the team managers, Phil, have a, have a camera, have a, a television yep. in the car so they can watch what's going on. And it's a good way of getting signals back to the team manager. Clever man. There's the split I was telling you about. See a change of direction. The wind rips into the centre of the peloton. Now everybody tries to dash across. Those gaps open very, very quickly. There is a strong wind today. Hardly any trees to uh, demonstrate it to you. Certainly no spectators or flags in this sector of the race. Uh, but this is a crunch moment, I think, for a lot of riders in Paris-Roubaix today. 3.25 the gap. Another American at the back there, number 210, is uh, Bjorn Sealander riding for Team Radio Shack. He's getting his first taste of Paris-Roubaix here this afternoon, and this is not the way you want to taste it at the back end of this line. Whip lashes down the road. So much work to be done if you're going to keep yourself in touch with the race now, because once we get into the forest, the uh, riders will fall, there'll be major confusion, and when you come out of the forest and go left, then you do get the crosswind, and very often that's curtains for most people uh, once they're leaving the forest of Arenberg. It's just a quick demonstration there, Phil, as how quickly the main field can split up on the, on the smoother part of the road. And as they go in there to this next section of cobblestones, that these riders are looking to try and get themselves a slight advantage. 
looking down there into the faces of the riders from HTC. They've got two riders in the leading breakaway, Adam Hansen. It's good to see him up there. And, of course, uh, Matty Goss. There they are, HCC trying to back them all off. Hansen, I think, getting his first taste at the cobblestone of Northern France this year. And uh, seeing it from the front. Best place to be just at the moment, I think. Now they've, they've got into this narrow section of road. The other tactic is to block it off so that nobody can pass you. Uh, they've done what they wanted to do. That's to get to the front of the peloton. And remember, we're heading uh, via another couple of sections of cobblestones before we get in to the uh, tranchée of Arlenberg which is sector 17. Well, Goss and Heyman, I think, Phil, in that leading... Goss and uh, uh, Hansen, Hansen yeah. in that leading group for HTC. I think we'll always be waiting for reinforcements to come from the main field here. I did note that uh, Bernard Eisel was riding at the front end of the pack. He's in uh, incredible form at the moment, given some liberty. Obviously, with the, the slow start to the season of Mark Cavendish, mm. and uh, he really paid uh, his dues there when he got himself that victory in uh, Gent Wavel game just a couple of weeks ago. No Cavendish in this race today, the British sprinter having a little, little bit of a rough start to the season, but this isn't the race for him today. He did give it a crack in his first Tour de Flanders last week, but uh, he's still searching for his form, I think, after having tooth problems during the winter. Geraint Thomas at the back there, British rider for Team Sky. He'll be taking on board food and drinks for the other riders uh, in, the, in the team. He'll try and scuttle around the outside. Not an easy thing to do there when you can see this main field using all of the road and half of the pavement as well. But his job is to get to the front of the pack, pass across drinks to his team leader, who on this occasion mm -hmm. is going to be uh, Juan Antonio Fletcher, who a lot of people are saying is extremely relaxed before this Paris-Roubaix, looking to be the first Spaniard ever, I think, to win this event. Yes, he would. In fact, there's the only podium is by uh, Juan Antonio Fletcher and uh, Miguel Poble back in the late 50s. The only two Spanish cyclists ever to even stand on that podium at any level here. And that was in third place. So a uh, little bit of bunny hopping going on by Kinsey Arto here. Shouldn't have found himself at the back, but now he wants to get himself up to the front again as he tracks on the back wheel there of Jens Kukula, the Belgian rider on the French Cofidis team. But Cofidis, well, they're not Belgian, they are French, but they're right on the borders of Belgium. And it's a big country, that, company which wants results here. Have you seen how quickly Kinsey Arto went up the outside there? He realises he wants to get up to the, the front end of the main field before they get into the next section of cobblestones. Formerly a European time trial champion, he was also a pretty handy bike rider on the track, but he's really matured over the last couple of seasons, and he's leading Team Liquigas here at Paris-Roubaix, a race which has uh, two nicknames, one the Queen of the Classics, or the other one, which I think we all prefer, the Hell of the North. The Hell of the North, a day out in Hell, and um, into, the, into the body of Satan, I think one of the French papers uh, headlined it today, because it really can be a most unpleasant day out, the great uh, Bernard Eno rode this race, won this race, just so he could tell the organisers it was a terrible race, you'd never see him in it again. Uh, and then he joined the organisation and works for them now. Well, I was talking to one of the French journalists about that yesterday. In fact, uh, Bernard Eno won there at Paris-Roubaix mm -hmm. as he was the world champion as well, with the world champion's jersey on his back. And I remember him crashing, coming out of the cobblestones of the Pavé de l'Arbre, and I thought, well, that was it for him. And he was up and back onto his bike again almost immediately and got to the track and he showed them all that he could sprint as well as time but trial. They did not come any harder than uh, Bernard Eno, that's for sure. That man's obviously been eating too much of his own cooking down there. It's made him grow. These are the giants of Flanders. You'll see them all over the place. There's been a crash here on this left-hand bend as well. That's a Sky Rider wrestling with his bike just now. And it's uh, Michael Barry who's got himself in trouble there. And he just can't separate the bikes at the moment. That's a very strange situation there. The two bikes were completely interlocked and that creates a bit of confusion at the back end of the main field. And the rider from Quickstep also involved in that little fracas. Well, crashes are to be expected and are pretty much commonplace. There's the Sky Team car gone by and left him to his own device. It's there. Not too sure that it's just the Volder again. He really is not having a great day today. He banked his whole season, Phil, on riding well in the Tour of Flanders last week. Well, he didn't do that. The responsibility le le leaned yeah. on the shoulders of his teammate uh, Tom Bonin. But here he's been on the ground, he's been off the back, and I think today he may well have to turn around and help the rest of the team try and succeed in this race. Two bottles. Oh, you mocked uh, that one, really. <laughs> that was just to give him a hand sling. There's a retake of the crash. And there is Devolder there. No, Devolder, yeah. Uh, is just that is Devolder yeah, pulling away. he's just moving off now. And he seemed to blame the riders uh, for the crash, and he got a few words out before he finally thought he'd better get back up with the race here. These uh, very barren landscapes here of northern France as we head towards the uh, highly protected area of the Arlenberg Forest. 
there really is no cars allowed in there at all except on this day it's barriered off it's a beautiful zone and you could imagine you was pretty much anywhere in the world here's Devolder picking his way back through the pack again and getting himself back on turns but the, that bunch is slowly getting smaller now it certainly is getting reduced every time they go over every cobblestone section riders will be eliminated from the rear of this race it really does become a war of attrition as they go through the hell of the north people have often asked me why is it called the hell of the north but well, it's nothing to do with the cobblestones in fact it was the race organization when they came up here after the first world war and they looked at all the uh, devastation from the the first world war and the trenches that were left in the area around the Somme and they were they reckoned that they'd walked themselves back into hell Devolder's best ever finish in Paris Roubaix, he just about gets on the tail of the bunch, is seventh. He did that back in 2008. Now the Saxo Bank team, who are all for one and one for all, and the man they're all for one for is Fabian Cancellara this uh, this day, the winner of this event in 2006. And there he is. And he, there he is. And he wears the red jersey as champion of Switzerland, so he's tucked in off on the right there. This is uh, again a fine display by his team almost a deja vu from last week in the Tour of Flanders where the team hit the front spearheaded by Stuart O'Grady uh, to put uh, Fabian in with a shot of winning he did the rest for himself and there is Stuart O'Grady just over to the right hand side we go back to the leading group now of 19 riders they're uh, losing time uh, every time they get to the cobblestone sections they're down to three minutes and 23 seconds as they go through section now number 21 to go 27 sections of cobblestones this is the section of cobbles that takes the riders from Verchamp to Kirnan. well I know that uh, many people will be watching this in Australia it's getting late into the evening there but uh, here it is a lovely sunny day but rather chilly it is spring like at last some would say in Europe and the riders here have got a dry day forecast for the whole of the crossing of the Hell of the North. This three-star sector, the riders will continue to try and seek the centre of the road. If you get caught like that rider on the right in the corners, things happen in there. The little holes pop up and down you go and off the side and sometimes into a ditch. Well, the, the scary thing about riding at the side of that road, it is uh, on occasion just a little bit smoother than the cobblestones, but because of the rain that's been in this part of uh, Europe for the last couple of months, a lot of the, the little thick, glassy stones get pour, poured into that side there, and that's where you're much more likely to get yourself a flat tyre from a stone going into the tyre. This is the leading group, 19 riders. As far as we know, there are still 19 riders in this leading group. It includes Matthew Goss, Adam Hansen, the two Australians, along with Chris Sutton is here as well for Sky. Greg Henderson of New Zealand has made the split. So too is Mitch Docker of Skill Shimano. They're basically along with Jeremy Hunt, the English speakers in the breakaway. No rider you would actually talk about as a likely winner, but uh, you know they are in the right position in which to win right now. The gap has come down. The most we've seen, it's been over four and a half minutes. But now it's back to three minutes and three seconds. Heading to the next sector. We're only a few sectors away now. It's sector 17 when we go into the forest of Arlenberg. And that forest uh, leaves the riders with still 95 kilometres to go to the finish line. It's a, an awful tough 95 kilometres as well because they're on and off the cobblestones at almost every 10 to 15 kilometres. Just looking down there, you can just might just catch a glimpse of Tom Bonin riding in about 15th to 20th place. He's in the national champion of Belgian jersey. He's alongside George Hincapi there, just over to the left in the American national champion's jersey. Yes, I'm not sure whether it wasn't David Miller. They almost collided with an HTC Columbia rider, but he did apologise. It's also a bit strange to, to see uh, Johan van Sommeren there in the Garmin uh, tr Transitions jersey, yeah. riding very close to the front end of the main field. He was always an integral part of Team Lotto's assault on the, the classics, as well uh, as a, a big ally for Cadell Evans in the mountains of the Tour de France. Sector 21 for the peloton now. The leaders are through and off this one. With a lead of just on three minutes. Uh, Saxo Bank getting the best view of this sector as the boys in black and white bring forward Cancellara. He's in a perfect springboard position right now. He hasn't made any mistakes so far. You do need luck. No matter how good you are, you always have to combat bad luck on this race. Things just happen and you've got to recover and get back up with the leaders. You're never actually safe until you cross the finishing line, which is on the velodrome in Roubaix. Well, Phil, I was talking to Matty Breschel uh, yesterday, and remember last week in the Tour of Flanders, he had a lot of bad luck, and he was very upset about uh, the technical difficulties he and the mechanical team supporting him had. 
but he seemed to have uh, been uh, talked to during the week by everybody about Paris-Roubaix and it was talked into the mind frame that yes you have to have bad luck in a race like this but you've got to battle back for it you haven't got mm. to give up you haven't got to let it affect your mentality just fight back all of the time if you think you can win a great classic like this one well Stuart O'Grady who uh, won the race a few years ago he was uh, he came back from a flat tire to join the leaders and go on to win by himself and uh, not even the organization saw him return to the breakaway we only saw him when he attacked out of it we never saw him come back either uh, but he certainly won that race well and uh, he's the only one really to have broken up the domination of Cancellara who's won it once and the two victories of Tom Bonin in the past two years and Tom has won it three times uh, since 2005 I'm um, talking about Saxo back there, Phil. Look at right that there. for a bit of organisation. They've got five riders there sitting at the front end of the main field just ahead of Fabian Cancellara. Cancellara really is the number one favourite for this bike race. Wouldn't talk to anybody yesterday uh, compared to a very relaxed Tom Bonin who took his time to talk to the French press, the English-speaking French, mm. and, of course, the Flemish press as well. It's a sign of a very strong team to put all those riders right up at the front at this stage of Paris-Roubaix on these narrow roads. But uh, to do that, they've got to ride at a hard tempo to stop anybody else displacing them. That's a sign of a great team. And they're backed up, of course. They know they have a great man, well capable of victory today in Cancellara, if they can put him in the right place. That's Matty Breschel off to the right as well. Also a champion of his own country, Denmark, on the same team. Very unhappy last week when uh, Cancellara had a bike change. It took precisely eight seconds when poor old Breschel came same mechanic took about half a day well it wasn't very complimentary after the race it's what I always say Phil it's very often if the rider is not calm and relaxed that uh, that anxiety gets passed on to the mechanic and that forces the mechanic on occasions to make errors mm. Cancellara on the other hand was very calm and collected when he went back to the team car he explained what the problem was and said okay in about a, a kilometers time I'm gonna pull over to the right hand side I want my spare bike you can fix this one that instilled confidence into the mechanic as well who was nice and relaxed and it resulted in a very rapid change I can hear that uh, Vainance is having a change of bike at the moment. But I uh, don't think we're going to get any pictures of it. This does happen all the time. It's almost routine for the mechanics at the back of the race. The problem with Paris Roubaix is there is so much stuff going on all of the time, and uh, we only really have three cameras out on the road and one in the sky, so you can't see everything. But one thing is for certain about Paris Roubaix for once they get into the, the showers and the changing rooms at the end of a race like this, every bike rider has a story to tell. Moving on into sector number 20 here. This will take us through to Mang. Three stars, two and a half kilometers. Uh, it's quite a long way down this stretch of cobblestones. Yeah, this is the leading group of 19 riders, and they will probably be getting that information now that for the first time their time gap has gone inside of the three minute margin. But they will still keep riding, still try and keep themselves off the front end of the main field because it is an honor for a breakaway like this, the early morning breakaway, to survive and get themselves into the forest of Arenberg in the front position. Now, oh. this is the chaos. This is why you have to ride near the front. Well, they've spread themselves. The two AG2R riders on the right of our picture here have taken to the grass as they're just coming off sector 21, is where the problem has occurred. And this is in the peloton, but it looks as though everybody, oh, nearly everybody's up and running. I couldn't see who that was. The chaos over on the right. You see all the mechanics there are waiting to see whether or not they can hand up drinks. One of the important things, again, about Paris-Roubaix is because of the cobblestone uh, nature of this race, over 55 kilometers of cobblestones, what you find happening is the riders losing their bottles. Now, that, first of all, can create accidents, but you need to keep uh, taking on board drinks throughout the whole of the race to make sure that you keep the energy levels topped up. So the next sector for the main peloton here will be sector number 20. Uh, Martin Vainance was the rider in the breakaway who has had a change of bikes. We didn't see any pictures of it. And uh, I don't know if he's got back or whether he's left in no man's land. But the gap now is only 2 minutes 45. And that's without anybody escaping the peloton. It's just the infighting to hold position at the front, which is closing the gap down on that breakaway right now. Well, the reason is, if you look at that small huddle of riders and just at the, the front, line. the oh. line behind it is the big indicator, fellas, to just how fast the main peloton is going. And they're, they're really now starting to wind it up to what is a, probably the first really important rendezvous of Paris-Roubaix. Any year it always is. It's the Trouet d'Aremberg, the forest of Aremberg, a section of cobblestones which is 2.4 kilometers long and it's only ever used once a year it's only ever open once a year normally it's the the area where the the wild boar roam quite freely but today 
there'll be some wild bike riders charging down there you can bet your life on that and Saxo Bank don't look to be putting the pressure on too much at the front but by the reaction at the back they certainly are hurting it right now well cast your mind back to last week in the Tour of Flanders it didn't look as if Saxo Bank were really putting the, the serious pressure on at the front end of the main field it was only when you looked at the back of the pack that you realized a lot of men were in pain and difficulty just looking at the sky they will get in the odd black cloud uh, fly through but hopefully there'll be no rain today now it's quite sunny at the finishing line the arrival of the junior Paddy Roubaix will be coming into the stadium here to keep the crowd amused as they watch the men's on television on a big screen in the centre of the stadium 2.41 the gap and all being done by Saxo Bank who are desperate to keep Fabian Cancellara and I suspect also Matty Breschel in a position to go forward perhaps when the attacks come on the forest of Arlenberg itself as they always do people just get to the front and ped pedal quite literally as hard as they can and hope when they come out the other end they are somewhere near the front of the race I think they also hope that they stay upright as well <laughs> because it is a very precarious section of cobblestones a lot of the cobblestones are broken up and I actually went there last night on the way to the finish line here and had a look and there's an awful lot of grass and moss in between those cobblestones and that makes it even more treacherous and there is our brave cameraman there doing his own little bit of acrobatics trying to keep a steady camera they also use those motocross motorbikes and there's the shot from that picture he's taking for us now steady as a rock yeah, this is team saxo bank on the front so they really are phil assuming control of harry roubaix a long way out from the finish very similar to the, the action that they adopted last week in the tour of flanders there's tom bonin in the middle the black yellow and red jersey champion of uh, belgium and not too far away the red white and blue colors champion of the united states george hincapi amazingly riding Paris roubaix today for the 17th time Yes, the favourites have got themselves positioned well. They know the importance of positioning. It can win them the race because if anybody goes down in the centre of the field, then you could finish up chasing for the rest of the day. So the strong men are marking one another. No surprise there yet as they continue to lead across this sector of pave number 20. Well, 19 kilometres to go to the pave of Arenberg. That's at 95 kilometres to go. And we're currently just going inside of 114 kilometres to go. This is the leading group of riders there on section number 19 a three-star section almost looks like a boulevard compared to what we're going to see in a few moments time when we get to the forest of Arenberg. yes the lead has just gone on to this sector here and enjoying a little bit of work at the front this is Mikhail Ignatiev uh, just coming into our camera there two minutes 41 the gap there's the peloton still well fragmented at the back end there's a lot of work to be done to close it down to the leaders and it's all because of the solid work being done by Saxo Bank as they now approach uh, sector 19. Long stretch to the main peloton uh, still under the conduit of Team Saxo Bank. Tom Bonin uh, doesn't seem to have too many teammates around him there. He's sitting uh, in around about eighth or ninth position very comfortably. I think he may well be trying to put a little bit of psychological pressure here onto the shoulders of Fabian Cancellara, who, for everybody, Phil, is the outright favourite of this race. And uh, I note he's carrying your favourite number here as well in the race this afternoon because he wears number 51. It could be lucky for some. Gustav Larsson has just come through our picture in second place. That's Dominic Klemic. There is the red jersey of number 51, Cancellara, sitting on the back wheel of the Danish champion and his teammate as well, Breschel. But Saxo Bank are really giving us a show of strength here with all the riders and marking the back of Cancellara there is Tom Bonin and George Hincapi. This is most interesting. And also Bernard Eisel, the rider from HTC Columbia in the yellow jersey, right on the wheel of Tom Bonin. He's the kind of rider who enjoys this kind of race. And the fact is, uh, this afternoon, he's got two riders in the breakaway if they get caught a little bit later on. That could completely and utterly change the whole physiology of this race. So we're looking here now as we hit sector 19 where the peloton led by Saxo Bank not surprisingly leading the way onto the cobblestones for Fabian Cancellara. They're in pursuit of 19 riders. 2 minutes 40 seconds is the gap. It was up to 4 minutes 30 and it's been all Saxo Bank these last few kilometres, Paul. They've been doing all of the work 
and so far they're looking very strong. It's almost wi like winding the clock back just seven days because this is how they control the, the Tour of Flanders. There on the left-hand side, you can see the red, white and blue, the stars and stripes of George Hincapi. He is riding Paris-Roubaix this year for the 17th time in his career. That really is quite a remarkable record, almost equaling Servais Canavan, the great Dutch rider at 39 years of age, who is looking today to try and start and finish his 16th Tour de France, uh, Tour of Paris-Roubaix. Yeah. But 16 finishes is quite phenomenal. Well, if you're saying to the Tour de France, there's a faux pas. In fact, uh, the other Dutchman, Joop Zoetermelk, that was his record and holds it. 16 Tours de France and 16 finishes. And uh, here in Paris Bay today, surveys can happen might emulate the great Joop Joop. Well, I'll tell you one thing, just uh, mentioning the Tour de France uh, and looking at these cobblestones, it reminds one that on the third stage of the Tour de France this year, they will be going over these cobblestones. And I wonder what Alberto Contador is thinking if he's watching this at home this afternoon, because I'm not sure that he's ever really ever ridden on a cobblestone race like this. And he's going to learn the hard way come July in the opening week of the Tour de France. But the peloton, the pressure has been on all from Saxo Bank. Hincapi and Bonin also making no mistakes. They're virtually hitching up to the coattails of the Saxo Bank team, making sure they keep an eye on Cancellara. And by keeping high tempo at the front, nobody's getting into the picture at all. It's a long, thin line behind as well. And the gap continues to nibble away at 2.34. Those black clouds are rolling around northern France today. Hopefully they won't drop any water onto the riders. They'll turn these cobblestones into an ice bath. If they do, it's not terribly warm, although the sun is out. Well, to give you an idea of what we're uh, setting ourselves up to, once we come off this section, uh, the 19th section to go of cobblestones at Montchaux, we've got 12 kilometres to go to the cobblestones of uh, Wallers, and then only 10 kilometres after that is the very famous, or should I say really infamous, cobblestone section of the forest of Arenberg. Well, this is the leading breakaway of 19 riders. There are a number of English speakers in it, but no Americans. Jez Hunt, Jeremy Hunt from Cervelo is up here. HTC Columbia have got Matthew Goss and Adam Hansen from the Antipodes and uh, Sky have got Greg Henderson and Chris Sutton in there as well. There's the little group at the front and we're just looking here at Adam Hansen on the back. Well, top time trial is poor but uh, now learning to ride the cobbles. Well top time trialist and top mountain biker as well, a man who was uh, very famous in Australia for winning the Crocodile Trophy and here I think he's uh, thinking about Bernard Eisel, his teammate who just recently won the Ghent Wavel game one day classic and is nurturing some serious ambitions to try and win Paris-Roubaix. It's amazing, this, this last two weekends Phil has been quite amazing to see the national champions riding at the front. In the first five positions there we've got the Danish champion, we've got the Swiss champion and the Belgian champion. So the 19 leaders heading now for sector number 18 and the lead is 2 minutes and 18 seconds. And there Paul is another example of our giants of Flanders, they get the best view that's for sure. They certainly do, that's very much part of the folklore of this part of the world that they bring all the, the géants de Flandre out to all of the town fairs and uh, very often they have great competitions but what a, what a venue for them to celebrate the giants of Flanders at an event like Paris-Roubaix. It really is a celebration of the north of France, this. everybody enjoys the Paris-Roubaix coming through this part of the world. It's a tough part of the world really with a, a history mainly backed onto uh, the underground mines that were here for many, many years, the coal mines. And, one yep. Jean Stablanski claims to be the only rider ever to have worked in the mines underground and have raced over the cobblestones above them. That's right. Worked on both sides of the air. Yesterday, Roubaix celebrated the Paris-Roubaix with a, an old bicycle parade which went right down into the centre of Roubaix itself. Now everybody got into the right mood and now, of course, they're all out on the course watching the event here. You can actually see this race a number of occasions because of the way it crisscrosses around the country. Another good uh, indication there, Phil, as to how far behind the team cars can be. You only take three or four riders to get dropped, then all of a sudden the team cars, the support vehicles, can be a minute behind, and you don't want to have to wait for a minute to get a spare tyre. Well, we've been looking at the peloton. It is getting smaller. This is Jürgen Rollins here to Belgium. Former champion, road racing champion, and he's in the company there of Danilo Weiss, who's on the BMC racing team, the team of Cadell Evans, who Cadell not riding, as I said earlier the damage that's being done and it's all still like it was just a week ago being done by Team Saxo Bank at the front end of the main field just tapping out this pedal which looks quite easy from uh, from an armchair anyway to watch the way they're setting the tempo on the front end of the main field and then uh, all of a sudden you've got this uh, incredible long tail of the peloton behind which is a serious indication that they are dishing out some pain. 
just look at the way they blocked off here Saxo Bank Studio Grady in the centre right and uh, once you block off the whole road at this width nobody can come through so they've got themselves in a per perfect position while their boss has his lunch just behind Fabian Cancellara just keeping uh, the sugar levels topped up ready for the battle ahead because as anybody who's ridden Paris Bay will tell you the race hasn't started yet Nope, as far as I'm concerned, it hasn't really started in earnest, and that doesn't really begin until section uh, number 17 to go, the Forest of Arenberg. That is such a beast. There is a beast as well, though. They call him Spartacus, they call him Fabulous, they call him many things, but that is the winner of last week's uh, Ronde van Vlaanderen, Fabian Cancellara. Needs a serviette at the moment for, to complete his lunch. There's the peloton splitting on the roundabout as they all come together again on the other side. It looks like the pressure's gone off a little bit because of that narrow stretch of road. Nobody can really alter their position, but this is a much wider road here. Gap still coming down at 2.18 as we head towards Wallers now. And after you go through Wallers, well, the next stop is the forest itself. Well, number 201, Popo, Popovic, uh, Yaroslav Popovic from Team Radio Shack is sitting at the back end of the group here. He's a man who in the past has climbed onto the podium at races like the Giro d'Italia. I think he's enjoying this bike race here this afternoon, but you can just see the gaps are starting to appear, and that's all because of the pressure of Team Saxo Bank at the front. I think maybe asking a lot of their riders to take control of the race at over 100 kilometres to go, and that may, we, may yeah. well be why, for we're seeing a lot of uh, absence of quick step, because they know how important it is to have a lot of riders present in the last 40 kilometres. We need a lot of cards to play because the cobblestones will be playing all of their cards, that's for sure. And Popovic there, who has ridden well all week in the Tour de Pays Basque, by the way. Um, great win in the Pays Basque for the American Chris Horner, especially a year on from when he crashed out and I think he broke his collarbone uh, one year previously in the same event. He went back to Spain and one of his biggest wins, he won the final time trial on Friday and, uh, and took the race with it. It's absolutely amazing the horrendous year that Chris Horner had last year and yet he's fought his way back to the top end of the sport and I think that's a, a, great, uh, great, ch a great challenge for him to at the, the, the length of time he's been around the sport to keep fighting back from that kind of injury and illness and I think he's going to have a great season this year and he'll be uh, a big ally to Lance Armstrong in the Tour de France in the month of July. Well let's hope so as we look at the coming together of the main peloton here in Paris-Roubaix, the 108th edition of this incredible event, looking at Jeremy Hunt, I think he's been around for most of the editions actually, because he's now, I think it's his 14th or 15th season, uh, he's celebrating a tremendous uh, long time as a professional. Matty Goss on the far side, and then uh, Adam Hansen going through as well, two big riders from HTC Columbia. Interesting to note that the uh, English-speaking teams have managed to put two riders each into this leading group. So important was the tactic of having a rider up the road to act as reinforcements later on. And this is all about having a lot of riders present once you get to the end of the Forest of Arenberg. And the rider in orange, by the way, at the back is Anaki Asasi. And uh, usually a man of the hills, there he is, sitting at the back of the breakaway today. He's joined up with the leaders, 19 aware. I'm not sure whether they're all still here. But we've had no notification if they are. Looks to be about 19, doesn't it? Martin Wayne, it's uh, the rider for Quickstep, just sitting at the back. He had a bike change a little earlier on after a mechanical incident. His presence uh, in this breakaway really is uh, to support Tom Bonin a little later on when it becomes a slightly more tactical race. That's a real view of the north of France there. That's uh, an old slag heap in the background that you can see there, the, the waste from the old coal mines, which uh, zigzag underneath the roads that we're racing over tonight. Yes, forming an unusual part of the landscape because there are no hills around this region of France as we head up towards the frontier with uh, Belgium. But certainly there now, the landscape, of course, many of the mines shut down now and are becoming landscaped views of the region. And the best landscape view is certainly the Forest of Arenberg, which on any ordinary day of the year, you would enjoy parking your car on the outside and walking through the roads into the forest. And it's quite dense inside the forest, but uh, no vehicles allowed normally. And they're reopened only for the passage of Paris-Roubaix. Is this Steinbolder again. again? He's still at the back. <laughs> He's not having a great day. This is one thing that can happen in a race like Paris-Roubaix. You can have all kinds of bad luck, and he certainly has had probably the worst luck. He's not on his original bike. That's a quick thing you may well pick up because it doesn't have his number on there, and uh, that would indicate that he was involved in a, an accident earlier on, that which we saw. And then now what he's trying to do, I think, is turn himself around and look after the team. 
A man who was scolded by his team managers leading up to the start of the Tour of Flanders as having based his whole season only on one race, and that was the Tour of Flanders. So we're looking here at 105 kilometers ago, Stein de Volder here riding uh, on the most famous bike names, uh, Eddie Merckx. That's the make of his bike. Eddie, uh, in fact, is in Brussels. Eddie was the winner of this race in 1968, 1970, and 1973. There's only his big rival, Roger de Vlaminck, who's won it one more time than Eddie. Both men of that era. And Merckx, I haven't seen him, but he'll be around here somewhere. This is uh, a race he always excelled on, winning he once in the World Championships jersey. There's the peloton then as they all continue to come together in and out the traffic islands here. Well, I can tell you that the world junior champion, but I can't tell you his name, has just won the uh, junior race here. He just won the spin from five or six riders. Uh, but I need to check my notes there. I don't know who won the world junior road race championship last year. He's just won the Paris-Roubaix for juniors. Well, this is uh, the doctor here of uh, the uh, Tour de France and uh, Gerard Port. He's been around for an awful long time. He's trying to look after Stein de Volde. I have to say, Phil, that this is not ideal situation for De Volder to be in a, in a race like this, a race that yeah. he will have banked his whole preparation on this week of racing the Tour of Flanders and Paris-Roubaix, but things are certainly not going his way. Yeah, he must have clipped his knee when he went down there, uh, when he fell. It's obviously paining him. There's big Tom Bonin, Tomica, as the Belgians call him affectionately. And there's George Hincapie, Bernard Eisel off to the right as well, for having a drink. He's placed well, and he's got a lot of confidence this year. A lot of communication though between Team Saxo Bank. They're talking to each other all the time, explaining what they need to do. I just noticed Stuart O'Grady getting his hand off his handlebars, just touching his teammate in front of him, saying, Right, come on, guys. Coming up next is the cobblestone section of Wallers, and then just 10 kilometers after that, it's going to be the forest of Arenberg, and that is where our race really does begin in earnest. And again, when the roads get wider, the pressure goes on to stop anybody progressing up that line of riders. Uh, Saxo Bank are maintaining the command at the frontier. Some solid riding. Radio Shack are moving up on the far right of the course here at the moment. Lance Armstrong not riding Perry Bay, by the way. He did ride in the Tour de Flanders last week. He finished very good too, 24th place, but he's gone back to America. Reoccurrence of the testinal problems he developed in March. And so I think he's going to go home and sort himself out. And he will probably stay there to ride the Tour of California. Before, and no. there's been a massive crash this time caused by I would think that's uh, central ob um, obelisk there well the Francais de Jeu rider here is Timothy Goodzell a New Zealander trying to put his wheels back together and it looks as though Walter Whalen it, Walter there, Whalen it was, it was right in fact oh it dear, before there yeah what was happening there was the riders were splitting up to go left and right to go around that uh, traffic uh, island in the middle of the road yeah. there and somebody just crossed the wheel and I think it looked very much to me as if it was Walter Whalen it was, it was. who went down from quick step that's how it happened there's another shot of it there you see it was uh, almost preempting the situation by falling off there there was a radio shack rider down as well but I didn't uh, get a chance to recognize him quite a lot sat down most of them getting away again yeah, well that's the, the little bit of chaos again that's why you, you need to ride in the first 15 to 20 places although that accident Phil happened at around about 30th so those guys were in the right place but unfortunately that's the chaos and the nerves that are starting to come into this race they now know that uh, in, a, in a kilometer or so the leading group of 19 riders will be on the next section of cobblestones and that's section number 18 to go the cobbles of Wallers yep. and then 10 kilometers after that it's going to be the forest of Arenberg the tension is now starting to feel it. It, it really is starting to build these guys know if you just look at the the pedaling style of the riders over there that's Kurt Adler Arvison trying to bring Juan Antonio Fletcher to the front they're nervous now they realize how important it's going to be to get into Arenberg at the front of the pack yeah and somebody else gone down well this is a, this is another crash the front wheel completely it's smashed there it's a Garmin rider is it a Garmin yes it is a Garmin transitions rider who's gone down there he must have hit something in the road because that front wheel of his is completely destroyed and they're waiting for the team car to try and help him out of a mess there we couldn't be a worse possible time right now the pressure is fully on here as they try to get up to the front of the peloton before they enter the forest because the forest of Arenberg you can simply shut your eyes and wait and hope you come out the other end it is very very difficult it's voted as the most difficult section of cobblestones in the event over the years by all of the riders that, that were interviewed last week by our local paper the Guadinor 
This sector is, 18. Yeah, this is the section from Havaloui to Wales. It's section number 18. It's rated at four stars. It's 2.5 kilometers long. And this is the leading group of riders. They've got a two and a quarter minute advantage over the peloton. So they will survive going into the forest of Arenberg. But will they all be intact when they come out of that section? The 19 leaders who have dominated this race from the gun today and they're still holding on well here that gap is holding it around two minutes 18 two minutes 20 so they're not throwing it away this is big tom lisa of rabobank who is sitting on the front at the moment off to the right of our picture we've got uh, i think it was ray curvers rather than mitch docker there from skill shimano concentrating looks as though our camera bike is part of the leading group here but in fact he isn't it's just the lens foreshortening the situation 101 kilometers to go after we come through this sector at Wallers, we're bound for the tranche de of Arenberg. This section has started at 103 kilometers to go. These riders are part way through at 2.5 kilometers and a very difficult section of cobbles at uh, rated a four star rating. The Forest of Arenberg, which comes up in 10 kilometers time, is rated five stars and is probably the most difficult section. Although this year, a lot of the riders are saying that the section of Mont Saint Pavel, almost also two and a half kilometers long, is equally as difficult as Arenberg. Well, that right hand bend there very often is covered in mud, but today it's very, very dry, so they've had an easy cruise here so far. There hasn't been too many problems with the leaders. Martin Raymond's uh, forced to change his bike. We're not sure whether he got back or not. We've had no rear shots. We're looking now at sector 18, have we here, this is the peloton entering the chase now, we've still got the 19 leaders, the gap has suddenly dropped down to a minute and 53 seconds here, 100.9 kilometres to go, but uh, there is Saxo Bank and there is the hot favourite, Fabian Cancellara still holding the back wheel of his teammates, Tom Bonin and George Hincapie are not far away from him either. Well, Cancellara has not been involved in any of the accidents and crashes we've seen on the run-up to here. He's on his specialised machine there. You can see just at the front there, that little diagonal line across his fork actually contains a gel, and the reason for that gel to be there is to try and dampen a little bit the, re the reverberations coming up from the cobblestones. This man is floating. That's Bernard Reisel over to the right-hand side as well. Well, Saxo Bank so far have not made any mistakes here. They've kept not just uh, Hincapi, uh, not just uh, Breschel, as well as Cancellara up there. There is Bonham wearing number one, the win of this race the past two years, and also pushing himself into a very good position. And the Rabobank rider, Lars Bohm, never fails to surprise. This man is going to be a superstar in the next couple of years. Well, 24 years of age, Phil, that's all Lars Boom is. He's the undefeated national cyclocross champion of his country for the last 10 years. He started gaining that title when he was a junior, then went to the under-23 level. He really is a phenomenal rider, but all of a sudden he decided he wanted to ride on the road, and I have to say, he's made a fairly impressive transition. Well, what a great picture this is. Look at that flag of France blowing across the riders. Yeah. Another crash here, or is it just a routine wheel change? Two HTC Columbia riders exchanging wheels there. Was it ISIL? Well, I wonder if it was ISIL, because uh, they wouldn't have that much panic on board if that wasn't happening. Somebody else, a lotto pro rider there, has a problem number 51 there every time you look at that number remember this name because that is the number of fabian cancellara more problems on the side of the road here as riders get themselves back into the gear and try to recuperate as they lose ground this is uh, palumbo giuseppe palumbo of italy uh, trying to get back on terms i can only presume that was isol well he was right up at the front so we, when we get back up there we'll check out if he's still yeah. There That's he Isil. is. There is Isil, and just in front of him is Lars Bohm here. Well, this is a bit of an indication of the pressure, and the hammer's obviously gone down from Cancellara and the rest of his men. These guys have obviously had a little bit of a mechanical incident. Isil caught out there, trying to get himself back in contact, but look at the flags at the side of the road. The French flags are almost straight out. That indicates you've got a massive big right-hand wind coming across these riders. That wasn't Lars Bohm, in fact. It was the other rider oh, yeah. in there from... Uh, from uh, Rabobank, Bank, that was Langeveld. Sebastian Langeveld. So it must have been uh, Bernard Eisel who stopped at the side of the road. Again, this is the chaos that happens. Somebody's gone right off to the side of the road, and it's it's Eisel again. He's panicking here, Phil. He's gone off the road because all of a sudden he's seen the incident in front of him. Well, this is amazing and so typical of Paris Roubaix as we see another rider sat on the ground there. That is Johan Van Sommeren. 
the Garmin Transitions boy who is on the ground and also the Leaky Gas boys who threatened so much have now got two riders on the side of the road here as well and that doesn't look good for Van Sonnen, he's hurt his elbow. Tyler Farr is well. there as well, they've, com they've completely ca caught up by that crash, this is very dramatic for Garmin transition field because their top man, their top Thomas Deeg have all gone down in this incident. Well, they've all been caught out at exactly the same time here, and look at the split now, and this is before we get into the forest, but we've got a group powering away from the head of the race here, and in that group certainly is Cancellara. Well, Team Saxo Bank, they've really caught everyone unawares here, Phil, because everyone's thinking, oh, the Forest of Arenberg, that's coming up next. All of a sudden, they've opened up the gas on this section of cobblestones. This is 18 to go from Avrilouis to Wallers, and it really has caused devastation in the main field. Look at that. The pack is all over this two-and-a-half-kilometre section of road. In big-time professional cycle racing, uh, you often see the race ease up when riders have bad luck. That doesn't apply in Paris-Roubaix. Bad luck is others' good luck. That damage was caused by one Stuart O'Grady. Here he is on the front now with Cancellara right on his wheel, not too far back. There is Tom Boone and behind him, Torhusha, behind him, Juan Antonio Fletcher. The big boys are here. So Stuart O'Grady, just as he did a week ago in the Tour de Flanders, a massive powerhouse on the front of the peloton then, is again today. His job will be over long before the finish, as long as he puts Cancellara into the front and into a winning position. It just reminds me, Phil, of what uh, Sean Kelly, the two-time winner from Ireland of Paris-Roubaix, said to me this morning. If you think the Tour of Flanders is a measure of how you can ride over the cobblestones, think again, my boy, because Paris-Roubaix is something different. So the drama started early in the Paris-Roubaix. There's still 98 kilometres to go and there's still a breakaway of 19 riders a minute and a half ahead. Back end of the race, Arrière de la Course. This is Tyler Farah, the winner just a couple of days ago of the Skelder Prize in uh, Belgium. A man looking as if he had great form coming through to Paris-Roubaix, but it's all about luck in a race like this. He's got Steve Cozzo with him, who's trying to pace him back into the race, and they keep catching riders who themselves have had whole, all kinds of incidents and problems. Well, it's a good job he's got some strong teammates. All is not lost yet for Tyler Farrer. He's got himself back organised there, and he's got to get through a lot of debris now to get through to that league group as he picks its way through the town of Wallers. And anybody that knows the course knows the next stop now is the forest itself. Well, 97 kilometres to go, the town of Arenberg, and then very shortly they will come to 95 kilometres to go, and that will be for the leading group, and that will take them into the forest of Arenberg. Three riders from Saxo Bank in this group. Fabian Cancellara in the red jersey, champion of Switzerland. Tom Bonin shadowing him. But O'Grady is riding in fine form again, as he did last week. Juan Antonio Fletcher, the great Spanish classic rider, has made the split as well, along with Matty Breschel as well. So there's some good riders up here, and uh, there's no reason that George Hincap has just gone through. There's no reason now uh, to wait for anybody else, because all of the favourites have got themselves in the front. As is Tor Hushoft, I noticed the big Norwegian god of thunder in there as well, in the black jersey of Team Cervelo Test Team. Hincapi was in the right place at the right time, and he made sure that he wasn't going to miss a train like this. They're not too far away now, Phil, maybe three or four minutes from the start of the Forest of Arenberg. Leif Hoster in this. This is a heads of state of this bike race. Matty Heyman's in the group two for Team Sky. There's Tor Hushoft quickly taking. This is Fletcher here, this great Spanish classic rider. Uh, Lars Bohm is creeping up on the outside. Cancellara just riding confidently on the inside here, watching who's making the move. He's got Tom Bonin in front of him, the champion of Belgium. I can't think of one, the top name we talked about earlier, who has actually done this, Paul. They are actually now all in the breakaway here. Yeah, but look at the distance, 97 kilometres still to go, and all of the big boys have come out to play so far from the finish. This is really going to put a lot of pressure onto a race like this. Just looking down there, there's Hincapi coming up to the front, these stars and stripes on his shoulders. He said before the start this morning that uh, he, didn't, he wouldn't retire from the sport if he won Paris-Roubaix today, but it would make his career and his pedigree complete. There's, Bo uh, there's Lars Bohm in the Yodin's jersey. I'd worry about him. That's Pippo Pozzato there, number in 11 black, in yep. the black jersey. Now, that is to uh, celebrate the departure of Franco Ballerini, a two-time winner of this bike race, who tragically died uh, early on in this year in, uh, in a motor car rally accident, which had really was a shock, I think, to the whole sport. He was, in fact, the director technique of the Italian national cycling team. Valerini, past champion of Paris-Roubaix, in fact, the organised today are giving uh, 
a similar trophy to the winner of Paris Bay to the first Italian to finish as well it'll be a piece of the famous pavé in memory of uh, Franco Ballerini a very very popular man in northern France especially in this classic race that is a nice healthy little breakaway off in search of a mo minute and 32 Peloton reorganizing itself the question is has Tyler Farrow won the big favors to miss out on the split got himself into that second chase well you can't give up in a race like this and uh, as the team was saying to Matty Breschel of Team Saxo Bank don't worry about having bad luck everybody will have bad luck on a day like this and so far some riders have had more than their work fair share including of course Stain de Volder who uh, is a former winner of the Tour of Flanders and was looking to try and put his name onto the pedigree of Paris-Roubaix this really is a great team it has been a great classics team Phil over the last two weeks a team Saxo Bank and it really is total dedication to their man Fabian Cancellara well they might pull this one back they might live to fight again here because they're closing the gap uh, the breakaway split is still a minute and 32 so they're doing well to hold off this race now which is almost out of control in the peloton the way that they are making it go as uh, we are now heading they're waiting for the tour next and <laughs> they'll be down that way shortly and uh, the riders uh, in the Tour de France passing through this way in the opening week in July Saxo Bank got control of the peloton things going the way just now actually stage three of the Tour de France Phil doesn't finish too far away from the forest of Arenberg and that I think is going to be a rather important stage especially with the fact that there's around about seven sections of cobblestones very similar to the cobblestone sections the riders have been over this afternoon we just caught sight there of Roger Hammond too the British rider on the far right of our picture in the black he's nipping in and out of our picture had a brilliant ride last year last week rather he finished seventh in the Tour of Flanders and behind the two Americans Hincapie and Ferrer and uh, he is a man for this event too because he's finished third in this event in the past yeah but I think his uh, job this afternoon will be to look after Tor Hushoft who's there just on the left hand side in the black jersey of Cervelo test team he I think uh, may well have just come to form at the right time in a day like this now the boys at the front with big Tom Leeson tapping out the rhythm here still got a minute 32 of the lead as they get to the first really crucial sector of this race which might be the next place to decide the splits 94 kilometers to go um, well they've suddenly gone from a minute 32 to 22 seconds I'm not sure what that means well it may well be that they're putting the hammer down uh, I think a little bit further back this is the oh, leading back. group they this got is the minute <laughs> they dropped a minute <laughs> the leading group here that's Matty Goss in the middle and he'll be charging now over the railway bridge in about uh, 20 meters time they'll start the forest of Arenberg and there it is this is it now the leaders hit the forest of Arenberg, sector 17, 2.4 kilometres, five stars, making it the hardest section of the race. Well, the crowd are on both sides now, so they must have protested. They've given them both sides of the forest now, and the riders are in front of their own grandstands here. We still have, as far as we know, 19 leaders, and they've gone in with a gap of a minute 22. They may well not come out with a gap of a minute and 22 because this is a beast and a brute of a piece of cobblestones. You come in, you hit this cobblestone section full on, Phil, at around about 60 kilometres an hour. That's the headgear from the old, the old mine shafts that are down below this part of the world, the coal mines that many of the Polish people came across to work in many years ago. There you can see the main field. That certainly isn't very much more than a minute now as they're splitting up. It's a small group, they've come back together a fraction, but it's not going to be a group like this when they exit the forest of Arenberg. Well, a crash involved, and uh, Tyler Farrar, Farrar, as far as we know, has got back into the group as they're coming on towards the crossing of the forest now. A massive crowd, as we expected. There was fears there wouldn't be so many here because the police have uh, banned the alcohol drinking, and they've also put a lot, to, up to 150 policemen in here to keep order for the crossing of the forest by the riders at the head of the Paddy Roubaix. Well, Once we get out of this pool, we're going to get trouble with the crosswinds as well, I think. We will zigzag across the northern part of France. That was Fabian Cancellara on the front taking complete responsibility for the tranchée of Arenberg. There's the Belgian flag over to the right-hand side, but this is a Swiss man on the front, the Swiss national champion. Strangely enough, he's been champion of the world in the time trial. He's Olympic champion in the time trial, but he'd never been until last year the national road race champion of Switzerland and that for him is a great honor to be riding these races with that jersey on his shoulders well a big man is tapping out the rhythm others have to follow here look at the gap it's come down to 112 now just by Cancellara coming to the front he's pinched back 10 seconds in the forest there's the flag of Denmark as well flying alongside uh, Luxembourg and also the flags of Flanders 
Well, there you can see the leading group, and you can see how much that has split up over the last couple of sections. And a little bit further back, you can start to see the front end of the main field. Looks like Matthew Goss is on the front here now for HTC Columbia as we look at the leaders briefly. They look to be coming through more or less as one unit, not too many losing ground there. This Cancel is back in the peloton. Cancellara there, followed by Tom Bonin, just like it was a week ago. These two men, the two super favourites at the start of this race, locked side by side, one following the other. A little bit further back in third position, uh, Juan Antonio Fletcher, just behind him there, you've got Tor Hushoff. And then a little bit further back, Matty Breschel, all of the big names. That's Leif Hoster, the man with the white jersey, just to the back also. Yes, yeah, so this is interesting now. That could be the podium right there. Bonin, Cancellara and Fletcher. It uh, wouldn't be surprising in the least as those three riders now stay out of trouble at the front. Tom Bonin has now got to dictate the pace and he's saying to himself, whatever you can do, uh, fabulous Cancellara, I can do as well. Side by side, the top two. A little bit of deja vu from a week ago. It certainly is, but I do think that this race suits Tom Bonin a fraction better than it suits Fabian Cancellara. Let's not forget he's won this race on three occasions the man in the black yellow and red jersey champion of Belgium a little bit further back I'm looking to see George Hincapie yes he's there in the first part of this main field and look how these riders are now zigzagging across the the cobblestones trying to find if they can a smooth section of road only mechanics allowed to stand on the right hand side as we look at the course now except the police of course and the spectators a little bit of a boycott by them by the look of it they decided not to come if they're not going to have to be able to enjoy themselves they must have chosen another sector of the course but Tom Bonin here now concentrating and riding superbly a lot of people fancy him today to turn the tables nice to see Jez Hunt there the former British national champion from Cervelo test team leading them off the forest of Arenberg that group which was 19 riders strong going into the forest is certainly not 19 men now second position Juan Antonio Fletcher right behind him Cancio there is Tor Hushoff. The big men are being decanted to the front of the main field. Fletcher, this uh, amazing Spanish cyclist who uh, defies all the traditions that Spaniards can't ride one day classic races. Well, this man can. He's been up in the podium before at Roubaix, but he hasn't, and neither has Spain ever won this event. Tom Bonin has the last two years, and there he is where he likes to be at the front, seeing where the cobbles are. They're not very far behind now because they too are coming off the Forest of Arenberg. Now a change of wind direction, a minute 12 the gap. Well, having come off Arenberg, they're going to go down to the next section of cobbles at all now. That's another 10 kilometres or so away from here, taking on board their food and drinks, an important thing to do. Don't get carried away by the excitement of Paris-Roubaix. Make sure you remember to eat, make sure you remember to drink, because otherwise you'll hit the wall a little bit later on. Well, the pressure's gone off now. The idea was to keep the pressure on when you're on the cobblestones. It's eased off just a little bit. And it's down to inside a minute now, with 90 kilometres left to go. This is the tail of the peloton. And I don't see the jersey of uh, Tyler Farrar here, so let's hope he's cut his way through a little bit. Well, uh, very dramatic, badly timed crash for the uh, leader of Garmin uh, Transitions there. He was surrounded by a lot of teammates, and I would think they will help him get back into the main pack. This is Matty Goss at the front. So as Goss leads the remnants of the 19 leaders, they're still just under one minute in the lead. Uh, now the race really has begun. 90.3 kilometres, Paul, 55 seconds. You're right, there's nothing like 19 riders here. <laughs> no, it's completely splintered going through the forest of Arenberg. What the riders will now start to do, Phil, is to look around, try and get an idea of the composition of the group that they're with. The group behind will try and look and see, has anybody missed out, what's going on? They obviously feel this is a good opportunity because Roger Hammond here, the British rider on Cervelo test team, has decided he wants to keep the pace nice and high as well to make sure anybody caught out in the forest isn't going to catch back up. Certainly with the leading group, Greg Henderson is still there, Matthew Goss is there, Jeremy Hunt is there, uh, Tom Lisa is there. I make it nine light riders surviving at the head of the race right now. There might be a few others in between uh, because, as you can see, it's pretty chaotic now. It's a big quest for our cameraman to find out where they are as well now. Well, they're catching one or two of the remnants. That's uh, Inaki Elzassi, who's uh, just been picked up there in the orange jersey of Team Uskatel. So Mitch Docker, I think, with him, yeah. Yeah, these riders are getting picked up one after the other. 
It just goes to show how difficult the Forest of Arenberg is. I've always said this and I'll continue to say it. The Forest of Arenberg, Phil, is not where you can win Paris-Roubaix, but certainly a lot of riders can lose it on that section of cobblestones. We've seen some terrific races that were all, well, one of those, one of those men was, in fact, Johan Museo, who uh, really gave his knee a good crack and was out of the race at that time. And uh, he is uh, amongst the triple winners of this event as well. Now this is a little bit of reshuffling of the peloton as they scrabble back. And we've got another section of cobbles coming up in a, a couple of kilometres time and that will be the section at uh, Ovnair. And that section itself is uh, fairly long because it's two sections that bolted together actually in reality making a distance of 3.7 kilometres. That's Tor Hushoff now he's, he's at the back, he was in a little elite group, now he's at the back of a long line of riders here. Boy how the world changes so quickly on the cobblestones of France. Uh, Matty Breschel is also in that group, I think it was, I might be wrong there actually, no, this is Breschel here coming up, and there is Pozzato, second last year, dressed in black today to commemorate the loss of uh, the national coach and former winner of this event, Franco Balladini. Yes, in that group as well, I noticed, was uh, Vandenberg, there he is, number 18 on the far side, there's number 31, uh, Leif Hoster, the man who... Uh, a couple of years ago, felt that he should have finished on the podium in uh, Paris-Roubaix, but he'd actually gone across one of the railway crossings when the lights had come on, so he was disqualified after the finish by the race referees. Team Cervelo test team, I think, are fairly happy with the makeup of this situation here, and they're looking after keeping the tempo nice and high to make sure some of the riders who are left behind in the forest of Arenberg have a hard time getting themselves back into the front of the race. So the first uh, pack has been shuffled here and uh, apart from Tyler Prado was not in a position to play a card with a flat tyre uh, everybody seems to be up here in this group I can see that Lars Boom has made this bit, he's the orange boy, big man in the middle of our picture Fazzato's number 11, number 1 last year's winner and the years before, Tom Bonin 41 there is uh, Juan Antonio Fletcher, 51 is Cancellara they're the men that count well, uh, Looks like Mikhail Ignatiev is the rider there from Team Kutusha he was also one of that leading group of 19 so he's been picked up by uh, this this fraction of riders who are still just a, a little way off the front end of the main field so uh, Chris Sutton is still up in the front the Australian though uh, alongside uh, Matthew Goss and Greg Henderson so I think only Mitchell Docker has fallen back to Jez Hunter Jeremy Hunter is still up there as well he's probably known better known in Australia amongst the cyclists than he is in Great Britain as uh, he always comes over and uh, his girlfriend comes from uh, I think it's Shepparton. Yep, she's a, a former cyclist herself, and in fact, uh, they uh, spend most of the European season over here and uh, spend the, the, the summer season in Australia. That's the way to go. Sun all round, except here it's rather chilly at the moment. It is actually rather strange to think, Phil, yesterday in the start uh, of Compiègne, where they were actually uh, doing the, the team presentation, it was like a summer's day. Well, the temperatures probably dropped around about 15 degrees Celsius overnight. It is rather cold in the commentary position, but I don't think there's too many cold bike riders out there because they really have got a lot of pressure on. Well, there's the confirmation of the men who survived at the front group there, Jimmy Ongouvon from the Saw team, also up there in that breakaway. This is Matthew Goss now at the front. Adam Hansen is also, I think Adam may have been dropped because he was at the back of the group. I didn't see his name come through then, so only Matty Goss is left now for HTC Columbia. CJ Sutton in the back there, second position there, looking very concentrated, enjoying his Paris-Roubaix. Third position is uh, Jeremy Hunt. I'm just looking back to see if I, I don't think Adam Hansen made that split. I think he no, was eliminated not. by the Forest of Arenberg, but he will be in the group behind with all the heads of state. Well, next stop will be sector 16 of the cobblestones. Remember, we're covering 27 sectors, so there's still 16 ahead of us here. 45 seconds is not very much now as we saw that breakaway collapse in the forest of Arneberg and most of them swept up. Ten has gone back to the group as we continue to go forward here. Jeremy Hunt is also in this breakaway. Yeah, this really does look like a, a serious move, but you know, it's really just delaying Phil because at 45 seconds they're going to get pulled back quite shortly. These are rather quiet roads at any normal time of the year. Uh, residential roads <laughs> that zigzag. Nobody would go anywhere in a direct line that was using these roads, but these riders will switch back on themselves. The public who know this route so intimately, as soon as the rides are through the forest of Arnhemberg, they're running for their cars, cutting cross country for maybe 40 kilometers and finding the race again. Saxo Bank, what a demonstration at the moment. 
they really have done all of the damage today thus far just as they did in the Tour of Flanders last week and finally got the winner in Fabian Cancelar that's him in the red the black top jersey the champion of Belgium that's why he'd love to win today just very close to Belgium Tom Boland made a lot of friends last week he was a gracious loser but what a loser he was in the Tour of Flanders more than a minute uh, put into him by Cancellara from the top of the Mieux de Gramont and over the Bosberg and down to the finish in Meyerbecker. That's an awful lot to a rider of Tom Bolan's quality. So everybody's going to worry. This is Matti Breschel, nearest camera now. He's the champion of Denmark on the same team as Cancellara. The man in black is Filippo Pozzato, who pulled out last week, sick at, well, just before the start of the uh, Tour of Flanders and went straight back to Italy. Well, he's here again and looking as though he's fully recovered riding in the black jersey today Italian champion remembering uh, the great Franco Ballerini killed in an auto rally accident in February the world was certainly shocked by that and uh, we're back up with the leaders here now the back on Soleil uh, rider Gordy Cardin I don't think he's oh there's been another crash as well well these little touches of wheels quickly spanning around us make sure it is not uh, anybody of any significance. I think anybody that rides this race is significant this is how it happened right in the center of the bend there somebody went wide and the last rider caught it went down with quite a bump too it never ceased to be amazed how the riders don't all fall off uh, they have eyes in the backs of their heads here in case the barn rider trying to get back in there they start to pull themselves back together looking to see who was the faller here is Steve Chanel of France who's having a good season so another silly tumble and uh, there's a ricochet and a crash at the back almost in sympathy with the rider from Case Depart who's fallen down three riders officially falling Ooh. just oh, a touch pleasant fall eh? just a touch of the wheels and that's uh, because of a little bit of nervousness not being in the right place at the right time and one of those uh, what the race referees would call Phil a shoot sans gravité a crash without real yeah. much gravity. yeah I remember that once the rider came in covered in bandages but even so that was Jens Kirkeleur who a Belgian who rider in red who sat on his bike literally meanwhile right. back of the front no change at all all the tempo being done by Saxon that's a fourth position there Stuart O'Grady fifth position O'Grady I wonder in the back of his mind whether he's nurturing any chances of trying to get himself a, a repeat victory and if uh, he will be able to take advantage of a marking between Fabian Cancellara and Tom Boone and the two super favourites before the start of this race. Well, if Cancellara is to lose, he would love it. It would be great O'Grady who were to win, that was for sure. Well, Stuart O'Grady was saying to me yesterday, Phil, that the, the situation is very similar to the situation a couple of years ago when he did get that victory because Cancellara on that occasion was the, the outright favourite to win the bike race. Everybody looked at Cancellara and Stuart O'Grady took off up the road and they never saw him again way to go perhaps certainly there's been no uh, no surprises here yet apart from the loss through no fault of his own Isla Farah and uh, our camera obviously can't get behind the race now so we don't know if he's got back into the peloton I would suspect that he has but I wouldn't know well it was a bad time to crash that he had and he was involved with a number of teammates there because it was uh, around about 10 kilometers to go before the forest of Arenberg these guys now are not too far away from uh, reaching the next section of cobblestones and that is a, a long section at 3.7 kilometers uh, two sections really I would have to say which are pretty much bolted together that's right a little bit of respite in the middle but basically it's the equal longest section of the course along with sector 2 or 26 or well, the second sector of cobbles of the day let's check this 26 as we count down to the last sector the yellow flag held by the gendarme is danger in Europe so they've just got to watch here and there's the splits that they know about at the moment they're saying the peloton's a minute five and some of those groups there I think will be probably coming back from the lead group rather than going forward from the peloton Stain de Voller again. Now where is he now? He front oh, flat oh tire. dear me. Not his day, Phil. He's no. one of those things when Lady Luck is not smiling, and she, in fact she's not even smiling, I don't think she's even here with Stain no, de Voller. No, she doesn't come to Paris, <laughs> but she has a day off. That's uh, Rick Van Slake, the team manager there, and he must be wondering yep. uh, how much good bad push. luck can his man have. Push him off. Rick Van Slyke himself was a very good track rider, rode a lot of six-day races. And in fact, uh, he's uh, in the car this afternoon, uh, basically to allow Wilfred Peters to sit and keep an eye on race television. Because Wilfred Peters will be the man who is the tactician of Team Quickstep this afternoon. Uh -huh. He'll be the man calling the shots. 
now as our helicopter's being brought in more and more here to try and locate the, where Paris Roubaix has gone to at the moment. As I say, we've got approximately nine riders out in front. And then we've got a couple of groups uh, just ahead of the peloton. But the peloton contains the fancied riders once again. As we head now onto that sector of cobblestones, which will be sector 16. Yeah, sector 16 there uh, goes from uh, Ornain to Wadigny, and it's a uh, 3.7 kilometers. Fairly smooth section of cobblestones, but uh, it's made more difficult, Phil, by the fact that it's extremely long, and of course, by the fact that it's completely open as well, and the riders will get a lot of buffeting from these strong winds, which really are breathing across the north of France. Now, is this Jez Hunt who's tapping out the message on the front? Because he's very active today, he's doing an awful lot of pacemaking up here. I'm really amazed with the way Hunt has ridden over these last two weeks in the classics in the northern part of France and I think very much by the motivation of trying to look after the team. They're also a bit uh, weakened by the fact that their man uh, Hausler had a very difficult uh, approach to these classics and had to pull out with a, a consistent knee injury. Now don't be misled by that caption there, we're not back in the forest of Arlenberg. 82 kilometers to go now, 18 seconds, the spread across the peloton and the leaders, so it's all coming together here, there's no change at the head of the peloton, the favoured seem to be safe for the moment, the leaders though have thinned down now, there's just about nine of them left here, we're on to sector 16 now. Well this is one of the groups that was caught in the middle, this is uh, Mikhail Ignatiev, and just behind them you can see the front end of the main field so it's all starting to come together and I would expect that those riders there will very shortly be overtaken. This is only a three star section but look at the length of it, 3.7 kilometres, that is an awful long way, it looks as though the Amiga Farmer rider there, which is Sebastian Lang near his camera, has come back from the leading group. This is uh, the section uh, from Ornain to Wadigny, 3.7 kilometres. You can see the complete control at the front end of the main field is Saxo Bank. Fifth position there is Fabian Cancellara. A little bit further back, you can see behind him Matty Breschel. Tom Bonin there in the black, yellow and red, champion of Belgium, always attentive at the front of the pack. And that is a big peloton which is regrouped, and there's a few more in the convoy as well, about to try and get through here. Those following cars are ever vigilant to make sure those riders get priority as they cut their way back to the leaders, or in this case, the main field. As we have gone literally to the leaders now to pick up Jeremy Hunt, the British rider here for Cervelo who has been simply marvellous today, he's been driving over every stretch of cobblestones, but the field is rapidly coming back now. Well, they will bridge some uh, serious time gaps over this section at 3.7 kilometres uh, the distance. You see the water tower in the background, that Chateau d'Eau they call it in this part of France. <laughs> These are very smooth cobbles that they're looking down on uh, there, you can see the front of the main field, that's again under the control uh, of Team Saxo Bank leading their man they hope to the double Tour of Flanders and Paris-Roubaix in a single week. Tom Bonin, however, Phil, he's done that before. A little bit more common sense there. This is Matthew Goss now of Australia and HTC Columbia. Big Tom Lisa in the background. There's the names of the survivors of the breakaway now. Martin Weinens, who had a bike change, is still up here. Clastergaard, Goss, Flemsingle, Engouvant. These are the only riders left of the original 19 now. Actually, there's another group starting to, to come across to, to reform that group and make it slightly bigger than it was earlier. Well, it's Goss. always difficult for everybody to know where exactly everybody is. Uh, number 152 there, Gorik Garden. He is in the second group, I presume, Paul, because they... Or is he with they're the leaders just, still? Just, they've just caught, caught back up over this ah, section of cobbles. He was originally there, he's come back. I have a feeling that may well have been Adam Hansen just getting himself back into that leading group for Team HTC Columbia. These guys will battle to try and stay at the front of the race for as long as possible because they know in the latter part of the race they've got another role to play and that is to help their team leaders, the men who were dedicated and des designed at the start of the day to be the leader for the race and for the team and for Team HTC Columbia that's obviously Bernard Eisel and I'm not sure that Matty Goss uh, realises how much bad luck that uh, Bernard Eisel has had and I'm not even sure whether he's in this leading, this chasing group. I, I thought I saw him, I think he did come back, these are certainly the leaders we're looking at at the moment, Matthew Goss is only 23 years of age, he's riding extremely well. Um, he comes from Tasmania, but he's, uh, he's in third place here and enjoying himself now. He got three good wins last year, but he was on the Saxo Bank team last year. Let's not forget that, Paul. And that's the team that might destroy him today. But uh, he, will, he will know their tactics and he will know the way that that team will ride. They're just cl climbing his way through the field there as well for B-Box Telecom. This is Johan Genet. 
Well, this is the section that they will use in the Tour de France this year, and uh, so the boys who are thinking of doing well in the Tour will remember these uh, today. Let's hope the dark clouds aren't over the Tour de France in the month of July as well. Well, Alberto Contador Phil has said that he's never really raced over cobbles like this in his life before, but he will come up and train here. I think that's slightly different to the approach of Lance Armstrong, who came and raced in the Tour of Flanders to try and experience the cobbles in a race situation. They are completely different. I have to say, I think Armstrong has so far taken the psychological advantage over his Spanish counterpart. Now everybody just uh, grasping at straws here, just trying to survive the passage of the cobblestones. We're trying to organise and see exactly how the spread is situated out on the road now, because our cameras are all over the, the course, and it's only when we get a helicopter view we know exactly what's going on just at the moment. Well, one thing we do know is going on is that one team have decided that they've got a great chance of winning as they did last week in the Tour of Flanders, and that's Team Saxo Bank. And they're looking after the interests of their man, Fabian Cancellara. And, of course, let's not discount Matty Breschel, who no. I think Phil might be just slightly, lightly built for a cobblestone race like this, but he's still got a lot of uh, talent in front of him. Now, this is at the rear race, uh, of rear of the peloton. This is Dominique Grolin, who's coming up, the Canadian on the Cervelo test team. The way he's coming back, he may have been involved in one of those tumbles because he's riding back very, very strongly to the rear of the peloton. Yeah, Roland, a Canadian rider, former winner of a stage of the Amgen Tour of California and uh, certainly wetting his, uh, wetting his appetite for the big classics in the northern part of Europe this year by coming across to the, the strong Cervelo test team. It and looks Messick, the organiser of the Tour of California, is on the race today in one of the team cars, so he'll be enjoying the spectacle. Remember, California this year will be moved to the month of May from its traditional February slot. And it's got a very good feel, I have to say, as well. 43 seconds is the gap now to that little handful of leaders, the survivors of the 19 breakaway. This is they. Jeremy Hunt on the left, never short of a turn. Tom Lisa, I think it is, on the right there. Adam Hansen has come back into this group, so he had a hard time going through the Forest of Arenberg, but he uh, didn't want to... Uh, move too far away from the front end of this race and I think uh, he probably will be enjoying being in the front of the race like Paris that's him there just wearing number 94 yeah and the b-box rider there Johan Jen has come back as well because he was dropped originally but he's also back both the Sky Boys are now here Henderson and Sutton back on Soleil rider is uh, Gardine he got back there's the flags of Brittany now a little bit away from Brittany where we are at the moment well, they've come out of that section at 3.7 kilometres and uh, they've also, uh, let's not forget, Saxo Bank are in a good tactical position too because they've got Casper close to the guard in that leading group of riders. I don't think he'll do very much at all because the team tactic will be to look after themselves for a little later on. Well, there's another way of hanging onto your water bottle in case it bounces off out of your mouth because they're still on the cobblestones just here. But they've had control of this race now for as long as they've wanted uh, the Saxo Bank team. They're not in any way uh, being pushed or challenged just at the moment. Well, if you think it's uh, easy, the way we were looking at the Saxo Bank riders at the front, you get a chance here by looking at the way these guys are struggling to stay in contact. So as Sebastian Minard hangs on to the shirt tails of the peloton, we're still looking here for a 48-second bridging. I think it'll come soon. Stain de Volder again, and that's not something he would like to see. Phil Arrière du Peloton, that means at the back end of the main pack, and he certainly has had a horrendous day. If he could have uh, any luck at all, it wouldn't be the luck that this man has had, because it's all been bad. It's a long time since I've seen a particular rider spend so much time at the rear of the Peloton, uh, paying attention to detail rather than getting on with riding his race. He had so many problems today. He's surviving at the moment. His race is certainly not yeah, done. If he wins it today, he'll remember these moments, certainly. Good smooth tarmac again, chance for the bones to replace each other. Settle back down again. 48 seconds the gap. So it looks as though the pressure's gone off by Saxo at the front here now, so the gap is nudging out just a little bit. Yeah, they were they were concerned about one section. Oh, there's a What's problem it? at the back. Uh, that's why. That's it's a flat tire, I think. I can't see which one. Well you see, no panic at all. He's looking at the tire, he wants to check what the problem is. Uh, he, the, the reason he's not panicked well. is he knew that his mechanic could... Well, the mechanic can't... I'd just let him go if I was you. 
Mekano was trying to catch up with him there and carry a bike at the same time. But not one ounce of panic for Fabian Cancellari. You've got a little problem with the side of the wheel, and that's the, the thing to do. You've got to try and make sure that you stay calm and collected, wait for the right time if you need to check your machine, and then just ride into the pack. And he knows that his team is the team that's been there dishing out the pain, so they'll cut out the pace making yep. in the front and he will catch back up within a kilometer and or that's so reflected in the time gap which has gone up to 50 seconds now because Cancelo told the team to turn off the gas he had a problem with the bike quickly got changed and uh, again another smooth change indeed and it's Matty Breschel who was so critical of the mechanics of the bike change he got last week in the Tour de Flanders has come back to help him out so that's uh, that means there's no animosity in the team between these two well Cancellara he really is an incredible athlete uh, champion of the world in the individual time trial look at that he's just chatting with the team saying look there's no problem at all i'm going to stay here i'm alongside the race referee's car and that would indicate to me that he's uh, not completely and utterly satisfied no. with uh, the bike but he's uh, going back again well i think he may well be just getting himself uh, stripped down for the the next part of the race and is this lars bohm who's just decided to attack from the front of the peloton because cancellara is in trouble it's that not be rather interesting wouldn't it it isn't lars bohm Boomer sports the uh, bands on his jersey as a uh, former champion of Holland, uh, current champion of Holland in the uh, cyclocross discipline of the sport. This is a slight move here by Team Radio Shack as well. Now they've decided to liven it up or to use the, the little bit of um, abeyance here to try and get up to those leaders, knowing that Saxo Bank have stopped driving. There's Cancellara in amongst the cars. The red car is the chief referee, so he's virtually at the peloton tail. This is a man who is completely and utterly relaxed. He's got no fear at all of where he is in the main field. Is this uh, looks like Stuart O'Grady's come back to look after him and pace him up down the outside? Is there anything Stuart O'Grady doesn't do? He's amazing, Kay. Oh, Stuart's been around for a long time. At one time, regarded as the best track cyclist in the world, and now uh, certainly one of the the great uh, bike riders on the road. Well, Gerard Thomas was the other rider in black there for Team Sky. So they've got two riders trying to take advantage, all breathe in. This is one of the many canals in this region, but fortunately the bridge is down. Looks like a cantilever action bridge there. And the riders at the back have to queue up to make the narrow approach over the bridge. There's the peloton. These are the two who've just escaped there. We've got one rider from Radio Shack, it looks like, and it looks to me as though, in fact, it is uh, Gabriel Rash. No, it can't be. It's not Rash wrong team to start with so they're saying it's Jean Thomas Vakers. Jalingi no, and Thomas Vakers. Vakers. Yeah, this uh, this is big Thomas Vakers I think from uh, Radio Shack see they've just taken a, a slight lead off the front end of the main field I'm not exactly sure why they're making a move like that because very shortly no. once we get to the next section of cobblestones you could very easily see uh, the acceleration coming again from Saxo Bank it might well be Gregory Rast. Yeah, actually, the, the big, the big boy. Judging by the yeah, size of his yeah. shoulders, it probably was the former Swiss national champion. Yeah, but anyway, it's only a matter of time before they're put back in their place. 50 seconds is the gap. The chase is reorganising, which is indicating Cancellara might be getting himself up through the peloton now. Although, having said that, these are riders who are not Saxo Bank riders here, trying to move clear. Can't blame them. Make it a little bit hard. Fabian Cancellara. Next section of the to the riders. 74 kilometres, 50 seconds the gap. We are now on to sector 15 here as we go to Brion. Only three stars, but 2.4 kilometres here. 38 seconds, the gap has suddenly plummeted again. Cancellara changes his bike. The gap goes up to 50, and now it's come down to 38 as Cancellara has got himself back in this peloton. Well, this is another section of cobblestones that we're looking at that uh, if you tune in into the month of July and the third stage of the Tour de France, the Tour de France will be uh, hammering over this section. And uh, I think a lot of riders will be casting their mind forward to just exactly what that's going to do to a race like the Tour de France because casting my mind back to when the Colombians first came to the Tour de France, Phil, many of them lost between 20 and 30 minutes on these yeah. cobblestone stages. Yep. It was no good being able to fly in the Alps and the Pyrenees if he couldn't fly across these cobblestones. Just popping out of our picture in the top there was George Hincapi at the head of that line of riders. So he too on his 17th Paris-Roubaix is enjoying life today. He's not done anything out of turn yet, but he's never missed a move. 
Well, that's the important thing, to be at the front. Make sure you avoid as often as possible any mechanical incidents, accidents, or crashes that might delay you and force you to use a little bit too much energy. This is a long section of cobbles as well here, section number 15. It's a 2.4 kilometers in length. And again, it is a boulevard really compared to the forest of Arenberg, but it's all about eating into the, the nervous energy of riders. Well, looking in the distance there, everybody's grabbing what they can here. This is the advance party at the head of the peloton. Tom Boland's on the far right, second in line. Radio Shack, have they just picked up those two guys, Gregory Rast and Jangley? I thought they were a little bit too far ahead. 32 seconds is all the gap is now. Well, they're picking up riders one at a time now who are being shed from that leading group. It was an early morning breakaway of almost 19 riders, and there now, all of a sudden, you can see so this race is about to come back together again. At 72 kilometres to go, it's well over 100 kilometres since the front of the race came together. As Jeremy Hunt again taps out the rhythm at the head of the survivors of the breakaway. They're going to have to move those cars very shortly. There's just uh, two referees' cars left in the middle. The trouble is, how do you get out of the way right now? That's always a problem. Matthew Goss comes through. Well, they've got to get the referees out fairly smartish now, although we're talking about this section, Phil, as being a section of 2.4 kilometres. In about uh, three kilometres after they get off this section, there's another 2.4 kilometre section of cobblestones as well, making this almost a five kilometre section of cobbles in seven kilometres. Doesn't bear thinking about it. Those cars are going to start panicking, I think, very shortly because the gap is now at 32 seconds. This is the head of the peloton. The peloton, which was down to a handful of favourites after the Forest of Arlenberg, has regrouped largely. All come back together again, living to fight Not another day here. Look at Bonin sitting in the middle on the crest of the cobbles when he sees a little bit of smooth tarmac, hops down on there. He looks as comfortable as you please sitting at the front end of the main field. Well, Team Sky are riding a very strong race as well at the moment. Two or three riders also mixed in there as well as their man, which is their leader, Fletcher today. But Roger Hammond also having a very, very good day, just like he did last week. This is a Stefan Pouhi, Pouli from France of the Seo team, we just caught a glimpse of. There's the gap. Now you can see the whole of the head of Paris-Roubaix today. Just 20 seconds, it's not really very much, and there's a lot of difficult sections of cobbles to come. We're on section 15 to go, followed uh, in about two kilometres by 14 to go. Matty Goss is still riding at the front end of this race, and he's up here now to try and take over the responsibility of looking after Bernard Eisel. His teammate, Adam Hansen, also in the yellow jersey of HTC Columbia, a little bit further back as well enjoying his outing today fill over these cobbles well in fact they are saying it's thomas vaitkas paul and uh, it is yangali and they've contacted the breakaway now they've just got onto the tail of this breakaway so it's a fresh extra firepower for them but the gap is only 20 seconds so they may have left it too late now to cross that gap but they're in a very good position to go with the next one as we pull back from the leaders this peloton now is very, very big, and I think we can assume that Tyler Farah has got himself back into this group now. Uh, the big problem is you're going to have to get to the front of it, and that uh, might be a different task. Off the tail end of sector 15 now. Well, from the end of that sector, Phil, there's not too far till they get to the next sector, sector number 14 to go. Just 20 seconds, 71.8 kilometres to the stadium from where we are sat here, where the wind is blowing strongly in the bowl of the old velodrome. They're building a new uh, velodrome here from next year, but they've said already that this velodrome will be preserved and will always host the finish of Pairu Bay. So they're not going to knock this one down. And thank heavens for that, because it's such a wonderful venue for the crowd as well. Well, Phil, it is, uh, after all, one of the only one-day races nowadays that actually finishes on a track, and that that's what makes it so very special to get onto the velodrome in Roubaix. Talking to uh, a number of riders, uh, especially like uh, Stuart O'Grady from Australia or George Hincapie, these are guys who, uh, in their youth, they watched the videos of the race uh, like this Paris-Roubaix, and they felt when they first came to ride the event that they knew exactly where they were coming once they came into the stadium because they'd followed it so many times and for so many years on television. There's a bit of a bold bid here, but it looks like Shanghai, who just came up, has gone away again. It is. Trying to get away from the front of the peloton. He's got the fresh legs. As he jumps onto this sector 14 of cobblestones now, 2.4 kilometres of bone busters. 
This is sector 14, and he's got just over two, just under two and a half kilometres now. And De Jangeli, who just came up to the leaders, has gone through them, and he's putting in a bid to go it alone. It's an awful long way, Paul. It is an awful long way to go, but he's a very special rider. You know, he uh, turned professional a couple of years ago for the small Marco Polo team then, when nobody really knew who he was, and especially with that rather complicated name, which doesn't yeah. sound Dutch at all. He came out, and he won himself the Tour of Belgium. And he's on the big team now, Rabobank, Holland's top team. And uh, you have to be really good to make a place in the Rabobank team, that's for sure. Well, he's trying now to tempt them to come out. And, of course, this attack will favour Lars Boon, his teammate, who won't have to counter that move. He'll go along with the second wave, perhaps. Skill Shimano here at the back, and I would think that it's one of uh, maybe Ray Curvers who has come back from the breakaway now in difficulty there bit of organization here coming from Team Sky they've got two riders moving up to the front you can see Bonin sitting there nice and comfortably they're picking up riders one by one these are the riders who are being shed off that leading group which is splintering on this section of cobblestones again a long section fill at 2.4 kilometers in length yes difficult moments here Matty and, Goss. Uh, yep Matthew Goss still stamping on these pedals been a power in this breakaway I must say followed by Jez Hunt Jeremy Hunt, former British national champion. There you can see Sky moving up to the front. And there's one of the riders from Sky who was in that leading breakaway. I think that's CJ Hutton or Sutton. And he's realized now that his teammates are laying down the foundations, possibly for a move by Juan Antonio Fletcher. So he finds that little bit of extra force to try and help David his mates. Miller. So uh, at least his, his body's OK, but another shaking up for you today on the cobblestones. He's falling back now. And uh, Bonin is setting the pace on the right of our picture. He's beginning two, two races here on both sides of the road. This is a crucial stage of the race today. Well, uh, Jangalai about to get pulled back into the fold, I think, there, Phil, as you can see these riders now. Boonen is riding with incredible confidence here. He's quite happy to go to the front end of the main field. He's not asking for any help from anyone. And, in fact, he doesn't appear to be having too many teammates present here this afternoon. Maybe this is not the quick-step team that has dominated these uh, one-day classics over the last number of seasons. The team that seems to be well represented, though, of course, is Team Sky. There's Juan Antonio Fletcher's team getting themselves organised at the front end of this pack. Yes, and it's Juan Antonio Fletcher himself there, but alongside him is Matthew Heyman, who totally revitalised Australian on this new team. He says that he's, he feels so much better now, and he's riding like uh, he is uh, the Commonwealth Games champion that he really is. It looks as though O'Grady now has cracked, and the pressure just a little bit too much for Stewart after all his hard work all day to keep Cancellara in the thick of the mix. Uh, this is taking an interesting development, I feel, now. Well, what's going to happen now, it's going to be the survival of the fittest and the team who has the largest representative numbers in the front of this pack. I can't see too many riders from Team Quickstep up there to help. So, for the first time since we left Compiègne, the Paris-Roubaix is all together. Now, who's going to make the next move? 67 kilometres to go. Well, the next section of Cobblesville is only a couple of kilometres up the road, and that will be the section from uh, Beuvry to Orchy, a very difficult section, number 13 to go. And uh, that uh, runs out at a nice 1.4 kilometres, but it's the two sections that come after that, two sections which have very romantic names, uh, the Road of Prayers <laughs> followed by the Road of the Abattoir. Yes, it, it all goes the same way to hell, I'm afraid, because that's what they call it up here, the Roads to Hell. 12 seconds is the gap, so we've got somebody just uh, still not refusing to give up. It looks like Henderson here. It's Adam Hansen and Adam Jez, Hansen, sorry, yeah. Jez Hunt. There's and Henderson. That's CJ Sutton. Oh, it's CJ. Well, they've only got a couple of uh, hundred metres or so off the front end of the main field. Not long before they get pulled back into the fold, but what that last section of cobblestones has done, Phil, it's reduced the number of riders. Well, for the first time, we're now seeing Stain de Volder at the front of the pack. Gosh, if he were to win today, he'd be a great story, wouldn't he? Ten That's seconds now. These are the last four survivors of the 19 today. On the left of the road is Martin Vainance of Quick Step. Then we've got Adam Hansen here, gritting his teeth. Jeremy Hunt and uh, CJ Sutton. They're now all together. It's official. That's the front end of the Who's main field there. They've still got around about 10 or 15 uh, metres vantage. There oh, they, there are. they are. You're quite right. That's uh, Jez Hunt there, just... Uh, pressing his push to talk button on his jersey there to say what is going on why am I still in the front of this bike race this is Adam Hansen but if you just peek around the corner of the uh, motorbike behind them you can see the front end of the main field and it is still not very much more than 10 or 15 seconds advantage 
and uh, Martin Winans is the other rider in there from Quickstep and that will be uh, a little bit of an advantage for Tom Bonham because he doesn't seem to have too many riders from Quickstep in that group with him in the main pack uh, little bags full of food everything they like to eat they usually throw most of it away but that's very dangerous there but fortunately the motorcycle policeman clipped it away a bottle going onto the road can cause a terrible accident these are the last four survivors they are still just in front by a quarter of a minute with 66 kilometers to go there's one of the auto routes which link uh, Valenciennes on set you fair for Paris and Saxo Bank tried to re-establish at the front here with Stein de Volder also uh, putting those food in his little pockets at the back and uh, Leif Hoster just behind him there too two top Belgian cyclists I would think Phil just uh, looking at the way that Stein de Volder has had so much bad luck here uh, in Paris-Roubaix this afternoon he'll have to turn himself around and uh, try to be a super Thomas Deek for Tom Bonin who looks to be floating across the cobblestones certainly doesn't have the same style and, and form that he had last week in the Tour of Flanders when visibly we could see he was a little bit inferior to Fabian Cancellar but yeah. today I think it might be a different story well for the moment they've just picked up quite a strong tailwind here and that's caused a bit of a split at the back I saw the British side we've seen Stannard in trouble there that gap of 12 seconds just won't come down they can't quite shut it off uh, maybe they're doing it intentionally because uh, while they've got something to chase the pressure's off for the attackers at the back in the field there It's uh, frankly, they're stretching out their advantage a little bit uh, Maybe some confusion coming into the front end of the main field in the organization as they go through that feeding station To take on board their drinks before the next uh, series of cobbled uh, reactions We're going to be well in fact having said that the main field is only just there Yes, it's just there, but it can't quite cross the gap to hunt uh, CJ Sutton Vaynance and Matthew Goss who know that it's only a matter of time now before they're back in that chase group over the uh, well, it's no mu not much more than five seconds now they will get caught before they start the next section of cobbles which is the section of cobblestones at Orchie Bevry, La Forêt is that where we are so we're right on to the next sector 13 uh, unlucky for some here the peloton reduced in size yet again the left turn for the cobblestones watch that central island and we get to see some idea of the size of the peloton there's still a lot of riders there for this stage of the race today yes but it will start to become that elimination when the riders who have done a lot of pacemaking on the front end of the main field get popped off the back uh, one by one riders like Stuart O'Grady have done an awful lot of work for Fabian Cancellar and Team Saxo Bank have uh, paid the price of that energy that they've left on the roads here of Paris-Roubaix this afternoon and have been left at the back end of the pack Hansen looked over his shoulder wouldn't have liked what he saw there as he rides the first time Paris-Roubaix is written exceptionally well I must say so too Jez Hunt sitting just behind him in black for Cervelo Martin Vainons representing Quickstep but who's going to take over for Quickstep when uh, when he comes up will it be Tom Bonham making his big play here we go this is now sector 13 as we go on to the Beverly La Forêt in Orchi this is a three star 1400 meter stretch of cobblestones just as the field is virtually all together here you can throw a blanket over them now we've just got Jeremy Hunt, CJ Sutton, Martin Vyans and Adam Hansen the survivors of the breakaway dangling tantalizingly off the head of the main peloton it's not really very much at all it's probably only five seconds in real time but Adam Hansen here does not want to give up he wants to continue to enjoy the front end of Paris-Roubaix and of course maybe try and give a little bit of an advantage to his man Bernard Eisel who should be in that group behind with Tom Bonin there's the front end of the main field and for the first time really leaping out to try and grasp these men who were survivors of an early morning breakaway of 19 men but these are real beasts of roads in this part of France. Well, we're finding a new talent in big Adam Hansen, the Queenslander here, because he's riding these cobbles terrifically well. The face of Jeremy Hunt just behind him as he holds those handlebars in the centre, lets the bike find its own way over the stones. And the peloton, well, our camera's committed here, and the wind blowing from the cross which is a difficult section now for these riders. It might well split the peloton here. That's what makes it very difficult once we get into the final part of Paris-Roubaix, Phil, because we're zigzagging through these farmlands in the middle of France here, and uh, sometimes you've got a crosswind from the left, sometimes from the right, sometimes it's even a tailwind. There's a rider in a red jersey I making an acceleration at the front of the main pack from uh, the altitude from the helicopter a few moments ago. It was hard to see, but I wouldn't be surprised if it wasn't Fabian Cancellara. I think it's Cancellara because I noticed that Tom Bonham was 
quick to react to the move so they don't want to aim right away from the front here let's just close in a little bit so that looks like the style of Fabian Cancellara to me Fletcher's trying to get across Bonin is across we need to see the whereabout of George Hincapi right now he's in this group somewhere but that's a big three going clear now warning bells are ringing again Phil it's 63 kilometers to go to the finish and just like last week in the Tour of Flanders at 44 kilometers to go to the finish an awful long way to go out these boys have decided to take the risk of going for a long one Cancellaro not as Asking for any help at all now is trying to ride away from this race but he's covered by Tom Bonin and Fletcher and a few more they've got across now uh, Bernard Eisel has got across there I don't and uh, Pozzato I think too there's George Hincapi popping in the bottom of our picture he's also joined the front group Big George is just looking for that one huge result he's had huge results in this race before but he's not stood on the highest podium yet that's his dream and that's something he wants to do before the end of his career. That's Hincapi just on the wheel of the Belgian national champion there. US champion George Hincapi has said that one thing he would like to take away from what has been already a long and illustrious career is that sacred cobblestone which signifies that you've been a winner of Paris-Roubaix. 62 kilometers to go, the dirty dozen. There are 12 riders now in this group, uh, sweeping up the four remaining riders of the breakaway. But boy, the heads of state just hit town now. Cancellara, uh, Hincapi, Fletcher, Tom Bonin, Pozzato, they've all crossed the gap now. Phil, we are now circumnavigating the town of Orshi, which in the past was renowned for being an area where they made chicory. You could smell it for miles around here as it was roasted. Here, there's one or two riders looking for a roasting on what is going to be the next section of cobblestones, 12 to go, the road of prayers. And I wonder how many of these guys are saying prayers now to whether or not they can win Paris-Roubaix. I'm glad that dog got out of the way. Well, he's going the right way. Let's hope he keeps running because the riders have made the turn. Now we're crossing the streets of Orshi here. It's a... Uh, it's a strange little town. That dog as though that's a little playback. Oh, he's a big boy as well. <laughs> a big old boxer. There's some boxing going to take her place here when they he get the gloves off. He to go on off. a diet, I know that. But anyway, he's gone, 61 to go. And uh, now we've got a reshaping. And this is really a nasty stretch of cobblestones coming up once we get through these streets. Again, it's two sections of cobbles really bolted together, the road of prayers and the road of the abattoir. Adam Hansen has noticed that Bernard Eisel is in this group and says, right, we've uh, managed to reduce this group in numbers. I've got my man in this group. This is why I was in the early morning breakaway. Now I'll put the hammer down and see if we can keep this decanting going. Also in this group, Roger Hammond, he's thinking about his man, Tor Hushoft. He might be thinking about himself because he's riding so well at the moment. With seventh last week, he's had a third in Paris-Roubaix, which is the equal highest finish along with Barry Hoban ever by British cyclists in the Paris-Roubaix. So he'd love to go one better. He's looking down at the field now. Hansen looks over his shoulder. This is Tom Bonin now. So there has been another shuffling of the pack and all of the cream is now back at the front. 60.9 kilometers, Paul and a few more just trying to scramble across before the train leaves the station maybe well they're trying to scramble across Stain de Volder. he's had a horrendous day he's been on the ground he's had a flat tire he's uh, been delayed by accidents but all the time he's trying to fight himself back into this race because he realizes if Tom Bonin is going to have a chance of victory this afternoon he needs teammates alongside him for as long as possible oh not far now before we make a flick and get onto the cobblestones the auto route is running down on the left shoulder of the riders but then we're on to this very narrow section of bumpy old cobbles. He need to get on before then. Now, where's Tom Bonin? Off the front, I think. He's, he knows this sector of cobblestone. He's heading to the section which he really does hate at mons en -Pavel. But right now, there's a whole reshuffling going. This is a huge attack here. This is a huge move by Tom Bonin. He's seen this as an opportunity. It was Adam Hansen, I think, who made a slight acceleration at the front end of this bike race. And it is. And there you can see the reaction coming from uh, Fabian Cancellara. He's not letting Bonin go anywhere. Hansen, Bonin, joined by a rider there. I think it's a uh, Johan Jen from B-Box in the blue. There's a little bit of bunny hopping practice for Bonin. Now, where's Cancellara? Third wheel, fourth wheel. 
59.9 kilometers. Bolin has forced the pace, and the, the reaction has come immediately from Fabian Cancellara here. This will be another reshuffle at the front of all of the pacemaking being done by the Queenslander, Adam Hansen, who's trying now to defend for Bernard Eisel. Hammond is in here too. Yeah, but look at the other riders. There is Hinkapi, Tor Hushoff, Pippo Pozzato, Fabian Cancellara. These are all of the top men. Everybody who wants to win Paris Roubaix this afternoon is in this group of riders. Juan Antonio Fletcher, Leif Hoster over to the left hand side. All of the big men are present and correct. This is such a different bike race to any other here as we get into sector 12 now. It's an ugly piece of uh, road, this I can tell you. There's the long sweeping right hand there. Now, this could change the face of Paris Roubaix today. Hincapi straight onto the wheel of Tom Bonin there, trying to follow oh. the Belgian. Right on his wheel is Juan Antonio Fletcher, but Tom Bonin now on the road of prayers. The man who's won this race for the last two years, Phil, he's going for it at 60 kilometres to go to the finish, and Cancellara has been blocked out, but look at the way the man in the red jersey is going to ride across this gap. Well... They say it's a very different race to the Tour de Flanders. Last year, last week rather, it was this man dictating the pace to Bonin. Bonin's decided as the winner of this race for the past two years, he's going to show him just how strong he can ride the cobbles. He has put the attack in this time. But doing it so far from the finish is an extremely brave move. The shadow there is Tor Hushoff getting across to the Belgian national champion. Bear in mind, Phil, this is two sections of cobblestones bolted together. Cancellara is having to get out of the saddle now to try and nail down the gap to Tom Bonin, the national champion of Belgium. That was a very brave move by Tom Bonin to see who was still strong in that group. A very vigilant too was Fabian Cancellara, who's making one final effort to come right up alongside the Belgian rider. Got rid a little bit of a tall hush off there. Pozzato comes across now in black. He joins the leaders. The favourites are regrouping at the front this time. Well, I tell you one thing, the road of prayers has caused a few uh, consternations for many of the riders. This is the right time to make a move, and it looks as if that may well be That's the Hammond. shape of Hammond That's going. Hammond. That's Hammond, who's now launched an attack. Are they going to uh, chase the British rider down? The only British rider, apart from Barry Hoban, to have made the top three in any Paris Roubaix. Roger Hammond has promised us something big this year. He was seventh last week in the Tour of Flanders. He's gone past our motorbike anyway. Well, he's now heading down into the road of the abattoir, and that's where he's uh, going to try and open up a gap. This is a very good tactical move, because right now, after that effort, Bonin will be watched by Cancellara, will be watched by Pozzato, will be watched by Tor Hushoff. Somebody has to be brave enough to make the move, and it's Tom Bonin in person who says, right, I know this hurts, and I'm going to make it hurt just a little bit more. So Roger Hammond trying to fly the flag now for Team Sky. Or oh, is he still in Cervelo? Can't see. Cervelo. Cervelo, sorry, Roger. Gave him the wrong team there for the moment. The Cervelo man quickly brought back by the champion of Belgium, followed by the champion of Switzerland, followed by the champion of Italy. They're all in the mix. Hushoft over to the right-hand side, saying thanks very much to his teammate just for keeping the hammer down. A little fraction there. Bonin does not care this afternoon. He wants this race. He rides every time that he comes to Paris-Roubaix to win. He doesn't even think about history. He could write his name into the history books today, Phil, by winning Paris-Roubaix for a fourth time. But that's not what's in the back of his mind. What's more important is to win the bike race. Well, that attack has uh, gone. It's hurt a few, but it hasn't hurt Cancellara, who's now trying to slow it down just a little bit and bring a semblance of common sense back before we hit the next sector of cobbles. It's only a brief respite, this. Roger Hammond uh, peeping into our picture. Welcomed uh, to the area of the Nord Pas de Calais here on the northern coast of France. And we're going to be in there now for the rest of the day. Time to have a look back on the, the flatter part of the course to see what sort of damage has been done. And uh, it really is quite amazing to see how many great champions there are still here. That was uh, something you don't see very often. The rider from AG2R there knew that he was blocking in the HTC Columbia rider, took the bottle on from the HTC helper and passed it across. That was a, a very gentlemanly thing to do. Yes, it was. And Tom Bonin assessing the situation there to see who made that crunch. And uh, not a lot by the look of it, but all the men that seem to matter. The one rider we haven't seen, we don't even know if he rejoined, is Tyler Farrer. And he certainly hasn't got across in this split either because there's no Garmin transition team colours down there. Well, there's a little move there coming. It looks like it was a Saxo Bank rider. It's chased immediately by Tom Bonin. 56 kilometers still to go and the push is on again this time is it Leif Hoster no it's Roland so Roland who's gone away for Belgium followed by Tom Bonin 
This race now will not lie down till we get to Roubaix. There is still 11 section of cobblestones to go to the finish. There you can see the little move there by Bonin. He's looking for every possible escape route this afternoon, whether it's on the cobblestones or on the smooth section. But you know, even these boys, these boys in the lead group here now, they're all answering the call of each other's attacks there. There's still a way to go and there's still plenty of decisions to be made. Now let's have a look, Paul. The sun is right on their backs at the moment. And there goes the AG2R rider. He's put in a move. Well, everybody's looking and they realise now that the, there are so many big names in that group at the front there, Phil, that there yeah. could be a, a chance of everybody watching each other and wondering whether or not the marking may well create a surprise winner of Paris-Roubaix this afternoon. And they will be very keen to hopefully take advantage of that. Well, I think that's a very, very valid point here because the favourites are so obvious um, and they're looking at each other, so it is open for a surprise here. Now, get a good look at the AG2R rider right, and see if we can identify him for you here, but he's a big boy. Well, the move coming across there as well from uh, Milram, followed once again by Sky. They realise now they've got to be attentive now because uh, any of these silly little brute moves could actually clear off the front. The obvious guess to me here, the leader, will be Anthony Ravar because he's bang on form. He's just had a very good stage win on the last stage of the Circuit de la Sarthe, which isn't too far away from here, actually. And uh, just the sort of man who might want to make good use of that form. Anyway, two riders now getting together. At last, the uh, first time we've seen the Team Milram colours come into our pictures. And I think this is Roger Kluger who's got himself up here. Well, these guys need to uh, just maybe hold a little fraction back, Phil, because uh, coming up shortly, we've got uh, some very nasty cobblestone sections, especially the one going through to uh, Bercé, which is followed then by the cobblestone section at mont saint pavel at two and a half kilometres long and three kilometres long. And they are ranked by some of the riders as being almost as difficult as the Forest of Arenberg. Well, it's nice to see Hayden Rolls and Paul sat at the back of this bunch, the uh, New Zealand rider riding for HCC Columbia. Is this is the big split of the race now there's a good performance coming from him I think today if he can keep this up so it looks as though it's Eno who's got in the lead that's not Bernard by the way that's Sebastian Eno who's in the lead and Nicky Terpstra is the Nicky rider Terpstra in there for, it, yeah. for Team Milram a man who on uh, occasions has been uh, very aggressive in races like the Tour de France and here he's trying to make a name for himself in Paris-Roubaix well there's no better race for Frenchman to do well in than this one Sebastian Eno is actually a pretty good finisher too. He's a good sprinter. He loved the track finish. Coming across the gap, this is Frédéric Guédon, a French winner, <laughs> a former French winner of Paris-Roubaix. And uh, he's a man who is very clever, very attentive, and he will know just exactly what's going on in that race behind. Uh, he's won himself for two big classics. You know, he doesn't win very many big bike, be, many no, bike races at all, but he has won uh, not only Paris-Roubaix, but also Paris-Tour. That's right, and uh, won it well too, but he's obviously confident. He's getting a bit old now. He's riding Lance Armstrong, in fact. He's only a, a, a month younger than Lance, I think. 38 years of age, uh, Federico Guédon. And hasn't won a race uh, since he won a small race uh, in France back in 2008, but he's joined the leaders. Yeah, but uh, a couple of years before that, he won himself Paris Tours, and that's not the sort of race yep. that anybody would have expected him to win because he's, he's much better suited to the slightly hillier races, what not I a race for the Paul, sprinters. It's, it's 10 years since he won Paris Roubaix, it seems like last month. Yeah, he uh, caught everybody off guard on that occasion. It was uh, an interesting breakaway situation. They were all looking at each other. There were some big Belgians right. in the group. Then all of a sudden, he knew exactly how to time his sprint on the track. And that's an important thing to remember if we do get to a sprint on the track. It is so difficult to judge the sprint. And you can lead out from a long way. But with the banking, making an advantage of picking up some speed as you come down the banking, if you've got any track skills at all, that can win you the race. This is when the commentators look a little bit silly now, I think, Paul. There are three riders in the lead and none of whom we'd ever mention as a likely winner and there they go but I think the field is reacting to it right now what's left of the field this is a very select little bunch who's coming across now there's George Hincapi fourth rider in our picture looking as relaxed as ever here we're heading on to sector number 11 now yeah. there's the peloton what's left of it now in pursuit of three riders as we crash on to sector 11 here 
at the Berse, 2.6 kilometres. They're chasing Nicky Terpstra, Sebastian Eno, and Frederick Gaydon. And Robbie McEwen has just been seen in our picture as well. He's up in this chase group. I can't believe that. I spoke to Robin McEwen yesterday. He says, oh, I'm just going to go into this race to try and look after people Pozzato. Not my kind of race at well, all. He's in the right position to look after people. <laughs> there he is in the black. I think he was He was so happy. He was, he was going to enjoy it, and he was very happy with the weather conditions and the fact that it was dry and was going to be fast. Developing into an extremely interesting race. This the Savella boys on the front. They've got Tor Hushoft here. They've got Roger Hammond up here. And you can see also there is uh, George Hincapi, the American, who has a terrific love-hate relationship with this race. When George, his best chance of winning the race, uh, when Tom Bonham was on the same team as George, George went down the ditch and Tom Bonham went home and won the race. It was an amazing event. No, he certainly did. Uh, Bonham uh, was looking after to George Hincapi on that occasion. Yeah. Hincapi so far has not put a foot wrong. There he is sitting right in the middle of that arrowhead, nice and comfortable in the middle of the cobblestones, not even taking the possibility of a risk. Hino here is uh, putting the hammer down quite a bit on this section as we go through uh, the uh, section from Orchie to Bercy section number 11 to go he's been a professional for quite a while and uh, been uh, given a very famous name but he doesn't really win an awful lot of bike races his major victory his only major victory he won a stage of the tour of spain a couple of years ago and that was a huge result for him he uh, hasn't won a race in 2009 but he did win the tour of limousin uh, back in 2008 but he's, uh, you know, it might be the year of the French. They're appearing in our television cameras a lot this year. And Bonan goes again. Another kick by the big man and a big acceleration. Now, ch chase me and catch me if you can. They're going to have to go for him because, and look at Cancellara in the red. A little bit slow to react today, I wonder. Well, Tor Hushoft is straight onto the wheel of the rider for Vacance Soleil, who's going up there. Fletcher is always in attendance. Look at the way he went round that corner. He was not going to give anybody a chance. Now he's got a bit of respite, Phil. Uh, probably about three or four kilometers and then all of a sudden they will go on to this very very nasty section of Mont Saint-Pivelle and that's the section that a lot of riders are saying is almost as difficult it's ranked as a five-star section yep. of cobblestones almost as difficult as the forest of Arenberg I think in many ways it's more difficult because of its strategic position on the route it's three kilometers long and as you can see we're getting closer and closer to the finish in Roubaix well, again, a little, a little plug away here by Sebastian Eno. The others have all been swept up. The dust behind, uh, rather unpleasant as it might be, but Eno's in the best place possible just now. Out of trouble, bouncing over these cobblestones. Well, there's Robbie McEwen. He is uh, not really built for these kind of races. Uh, Robbie's the kind of rider who uh, we normally would expect to be showing his wares in races like the Giro d'Italia and of course the, the Tour de France and here he stayed in this race for as long as possible to try and be of assistance to his own teammate Pippo Pozzato who is uh, hoping that he can be the man to come up with the win. Oh dear me, that looks as though uh, Michael Barry who was involved in that crash made this group but he's now losing ground a bit, he's just gone through our camel lens there. Robin McHugh and I make him just three, runs, three wins short of 200 race victories since he turned pro. And this is a bit difficult to get around that corner. That's a bit of a tight fit there. And uh, that is William Bonnet. He's having a problem keeping his bike upright. Well, he's uh, the big sprinter. He used to ride for Team Credit Agricole. He's had a fairly good season so far this year. Now there's a, a move again uh, coming up for you. Roland's is uh, really inspired here this afternoon. I wonder if he's trying to toughen this race up for his man, uh, Leith Hoster. Well, he was something of a surprise when he won the Belgian Championship a couple of years ago as he sports the flashes on his sleeves there, but uh, certainly riding very, very well today. I think there's also a crash at the back, which uh, we're not seeing pictures of, but they're reporting a fall. Yeah, it was Danilo Hondo who went down there. He is, he know, really is giving it everything he's got here, Phil, and uh, he's hoping, I think, by a move like this, he's hoping there's going to be a split at the front end of the pack and a small group of riders will join him. Well, if anybody's going to force <laughs> that split, it's Big Tomica. Look at him, Tom Bonin now. I think it's Fletcher on his wheel, uh, crouched over the handlebars, trying to okay, stay in touch. Not too far away is Hammond, is also here. Cancellara, maybe... Uh, I'm not too sure whether he's feeling good right now because he's riding fifth or sixth down the line. That's not the place to be if Tom tries to break. But Sebastian Eno, I've never seen him ride so well in a Paris-Roubaix like this in my life, is now waiting for this group to bring him back into the pack. It's going to be a very select group, this one. I have to say that Bonin is riding with a man full of confidence in his own ability this afternoon, not asking anybody to come forward. Hincapi 
is in this group. Hinkapi Phil has not done anything wrong so far, and no. I wonder if it could be his day, but they're going to have to control all of these attacks, which will continue to form off the front end of this group. Well, there were ten riders in that group, but they'll shortly be joined, maybe another three coming across the gap. We've got one little push here. This is Hosta trying to get on terms in second wheel. In fact, this could be three a move. Riders. This is a man who's tried to win uh, the Tour of Flanders. He's got uh, three second-place finishes in the Tour of Flanders. There's another Belgian rider in that group, and I just saw the little nod from Leif Hoster saying, come on, this is a chance for us. Well, they've got to keep the pressure on because the riders are not recovering very quickly now from these tough stretches of the race, and there's still a long way to go, 50 kilometres, and still some really tough stretches. One of the real tough stretches now, literally around the corner at mons en -Pavelle, and that is where we might see some changes here. Be surprised to see this being uh, Bjorn Lukeman, uh, the man in this He'd group He'd be the here. choice, I reckon. He was in fine form last week in the, the Tour of Flanders. And he's a man coming back up to the top end of the sport, but you see the reaction there. They're not going to give Leif Hoster a lead going up to the next section of cobbles, which is going to be this one that all of the riders fear, Phil, like they do the Forest of Arenberg, the section of mont saint -Pavel, three kilometres long. Well, Lukeman's finished fourth in this race a couple of years ago, so he likes it. Four riders now become the carrot of the race as the peloton behind gets smaller and smaller. If you were right, Paul, Host Lukeman's in the breakaway. Lukeman's is riding on great form. He's the boy in blue here. Tom Time Kip. off at the back. Time for a little bit of a drink and a rest, says Tom Bonin. As he says, somebody else better take up the chase. He falls behind this little group of nine or ten riders. Well, it's uh, quite a nice situation for him because if he's got a group of three or four riders uh, off the front and he can bridge them on a section of cobblestones, then all of a sudden he's got a couple of allies. And bear in mind, two of the riders in that leading group of three are from Belgium. 50 kilometres to go. The riders will have seen that for sure as they've slowed right down here now. Number 18 at the back is Stein Vandenberg. Shot to the top once as a winner of the Tour of Ireland. Never seen too much of him since, to be quite honest. He's in there now. Watch out for this. This is Cancellara uh -oh. uh -oh. going to make his move now. He's seen that Boonen is a little bit too far back, and this is a move they can't let a man like this ride right well, off the front. Well, that's a classic, isn't it? Fabian Cancellara has just accelerated away from the field. He noted Tom Bone and go to the back, and there he is. And now he's decided to go. Well, Tom Bone may have made a mistake. He's certainly going to have to waste some energy now to contain the Swiss rider. You can't let a man time trial his way when you're the world and Olympic champion. Well, this is a very oh. good move. This uh, tactically was perfect. He looked to see what Bonin was doing. Bonin had gone to the back end of the group, and he said, right, I'm going to go now. I know that the next section of cobbles tend to go is mont saint -Pavel. It's very difficult, and it would appear to me that the two strongest men in this bike race are Cancellara and Bonin, because well, nobody else really has the power to chase. And the echelon forming down there, indicating the crosswinds, as well as the rides are pushed over to the left of the road here. This is a most difficult time and a crucial time. Cancellara rapidly is crossing to the three leaders now and they're putting the favorite right up there and Bonin may well have missed the boat here well he's going to have to react Phil on the next section of cobbles there because it's a long section of cobbles at three kilometers in length and he has got the strength and ability to bridge that gap it's Hushoff going around there first then in about fourth or fifth position is George Hincapi this is Morson Pavel third position in that line there was uh, Bernard Eisel but Leif Hoster now has been joined by Lukeman and been joined by Fabian Cancellara. He has ridden across that gap as if it wasn't even there. Well, they're going to be very surprised and wonder just how on earth he did come across here. But uh, there he is, and Bonin knows he's really got to show his skill now on these cobblestones. He is a man for the cobbles, he rides them better than most, and now he's going to have to cross the gap because look at Cancellara as he breaks up the lead group. 47 kilometres to go, and Cancellara, he knows in the back of his mind that he will be chased at this point by Tom Bonin, and he knows this is a great opportunity to get rid of the Belgian. He's probably the only man that Cancellara fears in a bike race like this, but this, Phil, is three kilometres of cobblestones. Lukemans has come across the gap, uh, looks as if uh, Leif Hoster is struggling to get into the slipstream. Hoster sits in the back there now, the four riders fly. Now there's a select group here of Hushoff, De Bonin, uh, Fletcher and Pazzato, and no Hincapi just yet. No help, no help required, no help requested by Tom Bonin. He knows how important this is. He's got part way across the gap, he's splintered off the front, but Cancellara knows that they will be chasing hard and fast. He wants to go alone, he wants to get rid of everybody off his wheel. He had great form last week, 
and he's carried it over seven days later. The champion of Switzerland, he's been the champion of Paris-Roubaix in the past, in 2006, uh, but now, as the most recent winner of the Tour de Flanders, he's trying to stamp his authority on the double. Remember, Tom Bonham was the last man to do the double of both races in the same year. We go back five years to that occasion. There's the crosswind, the most destructive wind in the world of cycling, and that's why Cancellara chose to move. He popped up onto the top of the cobblestones there, the little crest right in the middle. If you can say the smoothest part of a cobblestone section, Hushoft in second, people Pozzato in third. Bonin has not asked anyone yet no. for any help at all. Fletcher's the man in second position just behind him, just sitting there wondering what it's going to be like when it's his turn to come forward and do some of the pacemaking. Oh, he's going to be so annoyed he went to the back of the group and had a drink. He really is. I think he was a little fed up with doing all of the work because just before he dropped off, he was waving at riders to come and do some pace making they didn't so he thought right I'm going to the back you can look after yourselves Cancellara saw that and attacked and he got the gap he wanted over the Belgian champion I think he wanted to use as much of that road as he did as because he went over to the grass on the side there this is Mont Saint Pavel this is the big chase now Phil two great champions yeah. the two great champions of last week Cancellara on the left is powering away he's putting Lukemans into a spot of bother there and I think he may well just be starting to open up the gap because Lukemans can't stay in the slipstream Bonin is not happy, he missed out, he made a big mistake going to the back of that group to a man who he was up against last week. 21 seconds is the difference between Fabian Cancellara and the Bonin group. And what a chase it is too between the four most famous names in the world of cycling, Pozzato, Fletcher, Hushoft and Bonin as they try now to nail back this man who refuses, refuses to succumb to anybody in the world of cycling. He really is superb at the moment, Fabian Cancellara, and has been for the past two or three years. He can't do anything wrong, whether it's time trialling in the prologue of the Tour de France or on the uh, slopes of the Great Wall of China. Just look at this acceleration here. Oh. He, he's oh. actually, well, Lukeman's there complaining about the bike, but, you know, Cancellara is not slipstreaming that bike at all. There is a gap between oh. the two of them. The man is just so powerful. Bonin said last week, what could I do? I was doing 55 kilometres an hour, and I just couldn't stay with him. That's absolutely right. Boone and nailing back a couple of the riders now as things get a little bit rough up front. This is Hoster coming back along with uh, Eno. Eno, thank you, as uh, they get together, leaving just two riders very shortly. Lukumans will be back as well. Then it's the race versus Cancellara. A familiar tale. A familiar tale, but have they got the power? There's some powerful men in that group. They're off the cobbles now of Monson Pavel. Have they got the power or the will to organise themselves to trade to chase this Swiss train? Well, 45 kilometres to race, and Cancellara is now on his own. As he's uh, right up behind our camera, our camera's trying to put him in front now, so he's all his own work. Cancellara goes by, there's the gap. Oh dear, 19 seconds. Wasn't that the gap he got on the top of the Mieux de Gramont? It was something like that. He got it very quickly indeed, and now they're picking them up one by one. By one. There's Lukemans now back into the fold, so the race situation is there is only one man left yeah. in front. These guys in this group here are great names. Bonin, Posato, Hushoft, Hammond, Hoster, Fletcher. They're all in this group, Phil, but have they got the power to chase a single man? I don't know. At the moment, it doesn't look like they have because, again, they're leaving all the work to Bonin. Nobody can help him chase. The firepower is going from this race, and the gap is going up here. Again, Bonin is saying, come on, give me, give me a hand. That's what he did last time, and he went to the back of the race. Cancellara saw it and attacked and went. It's a big decision now, it's going to be a tough chase. It's going to be a very hard chase, because let's not forget that when you want to know the pedigree of this man, it's in riding alone well. against the clock, it's in riding uh, to three World Time Trial Championships, it's in riding to the Championship of uh, Switzerland in the time trial, and of course in the Beijing Olympic Games, he was the fastest man against the clock. Now, there's ten men behind after chasing. These are terribly crucial moments now, and if Cancellara is to win the 108th Paris Bay from 45 kilometres out, he'll go down as one of the finest winners of this event. Well, it's a brave move to go so far out from the finish, but you know, apart from uh, Roger Hammond and Tor Hushoft here, everybody as individuals in this bike race. There are no teammates left. It's all a question of survival of the fittest. You've got to do it yourself if you want to win. Well, you don't get any much closer than that, I must say. The pictures these days are fantastic. Fabian Cancellara alone in the lead. His gap, 26 seconds and 44 kilometres to win.
This really is quite remarkable and brave, Phil, to go out so far from the finish, especially when you know and read the names of the riders who are in that group behind him, because they are no small men in the sport of professional cycling. They are no small men in the specialised part of the sport, which is these one-day cobblestone classics. Well, this is what he does best, rides alone against the watch. We've seen it happen so much. Now we're looking down there. Is that pressure we're looking at there? No, this is the move here. This is the acceleration oh, is the by Cancellara. Sorry, yes. When he came up to the front, he was looking back there. He could see Tom Bonin at the back of the group. He'd gone to the back, and then all of a sudden, just look at the ease with which he opens up oh. that gap. He's looking at this point in the race of getting across to that three-man group that was in front. He caught them, got rid of them. And these roads favour the attacking rider because we're always round the corner and out of sight often in the urban areas around here then out in the open countryside and nobody seems really to have the strength of Tom Bonin here he's having to do all the work to hold this man it's out to half a minute for goodness sake already and still running I've not seen Pozzato do any work or Hushoff or indeed Roger Hammond Hoster Fletcher you name them they're all following Tom Bonin at the moment Yes, Bonin is definitely one of the super favourites of this race before the start, but he's caught out, he's, uh, he's in a stranglehold here, and uh, I don't think any of these other guys have got the power of Bonin. Bonin, what he has to try and do now is encourage these guys to work, get everybody to work and try and keep that gap at 20 to 30 seconds, then hopefully, once he gets to another section of cobblestones, try and leap out of the pack and get himself across to this man, Cancellara. But, you know, it's such a tall ask, such a tall order to ride across to this machine. Magnificent study in motion now of Fabian Cancellara. They've let him go. They've let the favourite in the race disappear up the road. And there was nothing they could do about it. We enter now sector number nine as we come into the Merigny à la Presse. This is sector nine. It is three quarters of a kilometre long. It's only two stars. And is Fabian Cancellara going to build on his lead on these cobblestones? It's now up to 33 seconds and there's nobody can chase behind. Well, 33 seconds doesn't seem like very much, but if you're not on Fabian Cancellara's slipstream, it's very difficult to bridge the gap to him. Tor Hushoff there taking the responsibility, probably casting his mind back to last year when he was a rider who climbed onto the podium in Paris-Roubaix, and here they may well all be riding for just second or third place unless they decide right now to bury themselves, because if they don't pull back Fabian Cancellara, Phil, in the next 15 to 20 kilometres, they won't see him again until Roubaix. Oh, it's a huge gamble, but he did it in the uh, Tour of Flanders when he went clear with Bonin on the Molenberg, and then after that, he just got rid of Tom Bonin on the Mur de Gramont and rode home alone. He's gambled to go alone all the way today, the last 45 kilometres. A little bit slippery there, a bit of wet on the corner, but he's made the right turn safely. He's added a couple of seconds as well. 41 kilometres to go. The way this man is time trialling, that's about 45 minutes. It certainly is. Well, it's almost a marathon distance as well and he's uh, looking to become, I think, the marathon man of this last week of racing. Hushoff now taking the responsibility. He's decided to set the pacemaking on the front. But this, Phil, is an incredible group of riders to have behind one lone leader. But the way he is looking, he's not going to be seen again unless they can do something extremely special in this group. End of sector nine for the chase group. 35 seconds is still the gap here. As the road sign says there, c'est de la passage, which means give way. Well, I think they've all given way right now to the man from Switzerland. Bonin keeps coming back up, trying to keep the pace at least realistic. But take a look at the faces of the guys behind him. They are all under pressure here. Well, they really need to get themselves organised. This man does not look under any sort of pressure at all. The amazing thing about this northern France race is the roads are so open, there is no forested area at all. These riders can look over their shoulders, as Cancellara just did, and judge the difference between himself and the rest of the bike race. Looking at the face now, I wonder how he's feeling, because when he was in this situation, heading for the finish in uh, Mia Becca last week in the Tour de Flanders, he said, I had wings on my feet. I was just flying, and I think he's probably saying the same right now. He looks as though he's flying. Well, he's such a specialist against the clock, such a specialist at riding on his own. He doesn't have to wor worry at all. He knows just what sort of effort he can dish out, and he knows just how much he's got left in the petrol tank as well, Phil, and he will judge that to make sure that he uses it properly and economically to get himself to the outskirts of Roubaix alone. He's building on that advantage, uh, maybe only a couple of seconds, but it's up to 38, but this is exactly the same way as he laid down his foundation a week ago in the Tour of Flanders. Face there of Roger Hammond as he grits his teeth. Hammond's known success in this event. 
having finished third in the, the Paris-Roubaix and he was seventh in Flanders Tom Bonin oh, he looks as though he's almost shaking his head there as he tries to hold on to the back wheels of the riders there but he knows he's beaten I've just got a feeling he knows he's beaten the gap is now pushing out to nearly three quarters of a second as those huge pistons which are often known as legs jump out the saddle and pump again well it was a very crafty move by this man he was uh, he knew the strongest man in the race was Tom Bone and he had a very close eye on Bone and his position in the pack and he saw the opportunity even though it was a long way to go to the finish to leap out and try and build himself a big lead look at this now Hoster saying come on give us a hand well heavens to sake the only man that's doing any work leaf is the guy on the front right now Tom Bonin well Bonin uh, he must be kicking himself at making such a mistake you know just going to the back there relaxing for a moment that's what it's all about you have to be attentive all of the time very shortly Phil we're still looking 25 miles to go just inside of 40 kilometers we'll be looking at the top of the screen there to a one minute gap and that is almost going to be unassailable well, uh, it's a bit early to preempt the victor, but uh, unless he has a real problem, I can't see them pulling him back. And we could be seeing a huge winning margin if he's getting the nearly a minute now. He could be winning this race by three, even four minutes. This is the next group on the road, a little bit further back. Uh, Bernard Eisel, Hayden Rolston, just at the front there is George Hincappy. He was caught out by that acceleration as well. George is going to feel a little bit disappointed about this, uh, philosophical perhaps as well, as uh, Jürgen Rowlands, former champion of Belgium, goes through. Now Bernard Eisel, former teammate of George Incapi, they're all making their way through. And they've got a little working group here. Well, the first target is the Bowman group. Catch them first and then see what they can do. As we bounce onto the next sector of Cobblestones at Cobblestone Sector 8. This is Pont Thibault now, 1,400 metres, and he rides these cobblestones like it's a smooth tarmac highway. Well, he goes around that corner as if it's a smooth highway as well, and hardly any slowing down, hardly any loss of impetus. Watch out for that little bit of wetness in the middle because that can make these cobblestones quite treacherous for Fabian Cancellara. He's got a long section of cobblestones here, and they really are, for him, a chance to build up on his advantage. One man has got so much more power than everybody else in this group, and that's Tom Bone, and he must be feeling, Phil, right now, a very frustrated Belgian champion. You bet your bottom dollar that's exactly the way he's feeling as Fletcher comes up, Roger Hammond heads up the pace, Tor Hushoff just behind him, two great riders on Team Cervelo here, but everybody has been put onto the back burner by the flying man from Switzerland, who is now 55 seconds to the good as they start Sector 8 on Pont as well, 38 kilometres to go, it seems to be tumbling down the distance now. Well, uh, the time gap is tumbling up as well because it's up to 55 seconds. Can you tumble up? You can tumble <laughs> up and tumble down. It depends on whether you're on the moon or not. Right. Well, 37.8 now, and we're going to be a minute any second. It's the two Cervelo riders now and Fletcher who are trying to drive at the front. Tom Bonin taking just a little bit of time out, but he's going to be absolutely fuming at the way he missed that move today. Cancellara had to do something special to rid himself of Tom, because I really thought that Bonin was the better of the two riders. Well, he looked the better of the two riders, uh, but it was just a moment of frustration. He, he uh, just relaxed for a fraction of a second there, and all of a sudden it was gone. Now he's going to go to the back of the group, and he will be looking, I think, at his Paris-Roubaix disappearing away from him here people put Zato at the back there wearing number 11 Italian national champion this is such a, a role of honor of riders in that group Phil, and they can do nothing to stop this man who for the moment is untouchable well just look at those huge legs of his now just crunch those cobblestones up and spit them out it's gone over the minute 61 seconds Lance Armstrong once won the Tour de France by 61 seconds 2003 I think it was 37 kilometers to go now uh, for Fabian Cancellara well he's got a couple of very difficult sections uh, up ahead of him but uh, the more he continues to build on this advantage the more it's going to be inassailable for Fabian Cancellara and the more Tom Bonin will become frustrated for the fact that he missed out Look at the flags represented in this chase group. How the world has become really worldwide cycling-wise now. A Spanish rider in here, a British rider, a Norwegian rider, all there. The Giants have never seen anything quite like this as we head towards Bevelgum here. Well, that's over the other border, but still, we're heading that way. Well, he's a giant of the Flanders, and it doesn't matter today whether it's the Flanders of Belgium or the Flanders of France, because it's a Swiss rider who's dominating the front end of this bike race, and he continues to build an incredible advantage. He really has uh, come to his former uh, 
makes me just cast my mind back to last year, Phil, where everybody expected he would get blown away in the mountains of the Tour of Switzerland, a tour of his own country. But when it came down to the final time trial, he blew everybody away and won himself that Grand Tour just before the Tour de France. Yes, he's done just about everything, but his one ambition is to win all of them, what we call the monuments of the sport, and he's won this one already, so he doesn't need to win this one, really. But he's going to anyway, by the look of it, and it'll be the second time last winning this uh, back in 2006. And then that year also, he became the world time trial champion a bit later on, as well as being his national champion. So uh, he really is a terrific bike rider. He's won 29 races in his career, Fabian Cancellara, but boy, what a great selection of races he has won. Oh, certainly not too many small races on the, the pedigree of uh, this man, Fabian Cancellara. It's an incredible thought, and in fact, this is very resemblant of a move uh, by Johan Museu, who broke away a long way out from the finish when he was on a Team Mappé. And everybody was petrified on Team Mappé to be the one who waited too long to go out and try and get the victory. They had to attack further and further from the finish, and I think that is the risk that Fabian Cancellara has taken today. Well, just look at this man, he's just hes just free to fly here. He's just sitting there, he's pounding those pedals down. I can't see anybody closing in, he's nudged out another five seconds, he's gone to 106 now. As Cancellara powers his way towards the finish, he's now a road twist and turn on the road to Roubaix. But he continues to ride on that specialised machine there, perhaps it has worked for him today. The sharp forks and the little uh, absorption in those forks of the cobblestones, it certainly is worth for Cancellara today. Well, you can see that uh, part of the machine which absorbs all of the bumps and takes the, makes the ride a little bit smoother for Fabian Cancellara. The little diagonal lines across the forks there, in the front and the back of the machine. However, for Tom Bonin, it's slightly different here because he's locked, he's being kept a prisoner now in this group of riders with him because none of them are as strong as he can be. So, five more kilometres ticked off, 35 left to go, the gap continues to ascend, 1 minute 19 seconds, can anybody catch Fabian Cancellaro today? Now there's a question. Very difficult question to answer, Pippo Pozzato must be asking himself that, riding here alongside his former teammate on quickstep, uh, Tom Bonin, when uh, he won Milan San Remo, he was the teammate of the Belgian on that occasion, now he's moved across to a different team now to try and get himself a victory in Paris-Roubaix. But the names of the men in this group, a lot of the numbers, Phil, they bear the number one as the leaders of their squads. Hoster, the leader of Lotto, Pozzato, the leader of Katusha, Fletcher, the leader of Sky, Hushoff, the leader of Cervelo Test Team. Yeah. They're all there. They're all, They're all there. chasing a man who also bears number one, but that is number 51. Well, in fact, there's only seven of them there at the moment, I think. If I've counted correctly, which means somebody's gone. I suspect it's probably Sebastian Eno who's been dropped from that chase group because he'd be tired from his attack earlier. But we'll try and catch up as we look at the face again. And Fabian Cancellara gives nothing away. Just snatches a bottle. No doubt a little encouragement. Does he need any encouragement? He seems to be doing very well without any. Yeah, it's absolutely no encouragement. He will be a man on a mission here this afternoon. He's looking to be one of those very rare riders who can do the double. He wants to try and win, if he can, the Tour of Flanders and Paris-Roubaix in the same week, very much as Tom Bonin did back in 2005. Well, indicating that he was second in this event in 2008, having won it in 2006, that's absolutely correct. And now we'll see if he's going to add his name back on the list and continue the domination of Bonin and Cancellara in the Paris-Roubaix over these last few years. He's, I've never seen him ride so well, he's just getting better and better and better. He's 29 years of age, he's still got at least two or three more years at this level. Well, talking to his teammates, Phil, over the last couple of days, they've just said that he's above and beyond anything that they can do, and all they can do is just try and support him as much as possible. Lukemans was the man who seemed to have disappeared away from that group, and he's just managed to tag himself back on again. Well, Saxo Bank withdrawing from the sport at the end of the year, their term done as sponsors. So the team is up for sale, and I must say, with a man like Cancellara on the list, surely they're going to set, announce a new sponsor very, very shortly. Tom Bonin looking as though he's a little bit depressed now, having realised the elastic has stretched a bit too far, it has snapped. Leif Hoster would like to go faster, encourages others to do so, but the firepower is no longer there, that's Hoster in the white. I think they've been broken, the spirits have been broken, yeah. we're now looking at the seventh section of cobblestones to go to the finish, this is Tom Bleuve.
We're bouncing along the cobblestones of Sector 7. This is Templeur Lepinette now. It's only 200 metres. Is it worth including them? Well, uh, yes, it is, really, because these are two sections that are bolted together to make them uh, a little bit longer. They do bounce uh, around uh, quite a fraction here for Fabian Cancellari. You can, you can see the way those muscles of his are, are vibrating because of the difficulty of the cobblestone section at Templeur. But look at the time gap, which is much more important, Phil. Yeah. One and a half minutes over the rest of the race. If he keeps his up, Paul, he's going to win the race by four minutes, Take which is unthinkable. Which is pretty much uh, um, unbelievable for this man who just a week ago got himself that great victory in the Tour of Flanders. Well, the windmills are blowing round, and this time it's not in the Flanders, it's in the north of France, and it's in Paris-Roubaix for this man, Fabian Cancellara, who I suppose is riding this bike race with complete and utter precision of a French watch. But this Swiss is watch. Flanders, a Swiss watch in this case, yes. Uh, there are the fans here, some will be Belgian, some will be French. Uh, they may even be able to communicate in the language of Flemish. The, the Moulin de Vertan, that's the windmill of Vertan where we've just seen it. This is the second sector of that double header. Now it's 500 metres of cobblestones, given a three star status, so it's uh, not too easy. But really, his biggest worry now is a flat tyre, isn't it? But if he keeps pushing this gap open, he'll be able to change it. I can let you into a little bit of a secret as well. I was uh, looking at Fabian Cancellara's bike yesterday, and he's got some handmade tyres on there, tubular tyres made by a special artisan, and they are just labelled on the side Paris-Roubaix, and that's all it says on them. No brand marks or anything. And they're actually a slightly wider section than most yep. of the tyres that you can buy. They're a 27 millimetre section, and that allows his bike to actually absorb even a little bit more of the vibrations coming up through the cobblestones. And hopefully be a little bit more pumpy resistance as it bounces because uh, the biggest problem for the cyclist is what we call a snake bite flat, which is when they smash the cobbles with the back of the wheel rim and it just puts two little nicks like a snake bite into the back of the inner tube and down goes the tire. So maybe that wider section is answering the prayers here of Fabian Cancellar as he makes his way towards Roubaix. A minute 37, there's Vertin, the, the windmill of Vertin, and there's the crowd looking for the chasers in Paris-Roubaix. Well, uh, he's now, uh, as he gets away from those cobblestones, he's got himself a, a ride of about uh, about five or six kilometres to the town of Cizouan. Then he's got a, another tough section of cobblestones to get across, but uh, that clock on the top of the screen field just keeps counting up and up all of the time. Bonin, he's very frustrated. He's not getting the firepower and help from anyone else in this breakaway group this afternoon. He would not have been dropped in a man-against-man -man race with Fabian Cancellara. He was caught out tactically this afternoon. He was, and uh, that was the way Cancellara got rid of his nemesis, and he's gone. At a minute 37 too, I don't see anybody fighting back. Tor Hushoft here sat at the back now and doesn't seem to be contributing. I'm, I wasn't sure he had the best form of his career uh, this season, and it looks like he's just read the race, but he hasn't got the strength to do much about it right now. Well, Bernan has all he can do is just tap out the tempo on these cobblestones and know that he's got a butt like an anchor and a sandbag tied to his back tyre there and all he can do is hope to survive and hope that he can stay with this group to the finish and uh, maybe clean up with second place because that gap continues to expand. Tom Bowen having to uh, lead again to try and get some life into this chase group but they haven't got the power there anymore. They're racing for second place if they continue in this manner. Inside a third, well, just on 30 kilometres, but inside uh, 20 miles. What's he doing here? Cancellar just freeing his brake. So as Cancellar, just a minor problem, his brake's rubbing on the rim, but it looks like he's adjusted it. Cancellar remains free to fly with a gap of a minute 40 seconds. One minute and 40 seconds, it really is remarkable. He's getting closer and closer to the velodrome here. 18 miles of racing left to go, uh, 30 kilometres for Fabian Cancellara. Riding uh, now uh, like he would ride in a World Time Trial Championships or in the Olympic Games, uh, completely on his own, completely against the clock, with no other rivals in this Paris-Roubaix. And he gets down into that time trial position that has taken him to three world titles at that discipline and an Olympic title too. Uh, chance chance here, Phil. Look, yep. Sorry, just a chance to look there at the well. He uh, on this uh, special Paris-Roubaix bike that he's got from Specialized. There, he's actually got carbon fiber cranks in there just to keep as much power as possible at the bottom end of the machine. Well, a chance to eclipse all of the brake there. There are still eight riders, and in fact, uh, Sebastian Eno is sat there at the back having lunch as they continue to ride through here. Luikmans is second from the end just now. And we've got Hoster in here, Fletcher. Roger Hammond having another brilliant day out in the Paris-Roubaix event which he seems to do so well in but none of them have the answer to the runaway 
as this is Hammond again pushing on. Now looks like Bjorn Eriks has gone up to give him another bottle and a quick chat uh, with Fabian Cancellara saying, you've got a minute 45, just go steady. But looking at the whirring legs, not of the windmill of Vertam, but those of Fabian Cancellara here. His gap is now a minute 45, inside 30 kilometres to go. And uh, barring a physical mishap, I can't see anybody stopping him. Well, physical or mechanical or mishap, mechanical, yeah. that's the sort of thing that this man, the only thing I would say, Phil, that can stop this man from winning Paris-Roubaix for a second time in his career. Well, last year he set something of a Swiss record because uh, he uh, took the pressure off Henri Souter, the last winner of the Tour de Flanders in 1923. Uh, this time he's taken the pressure off himself because Cancelo is the last Swiss winner of this race back in 2006. And it looks like this is going to be win number two. Leif Hoster there looking round. Tom Bonin, the champion of Belgium. This is Leukemans passing through the inside. These boys have got no answers here. Well, I wonder what's going through the mind of this man, the champion of Belgium, uh, the winner of the last two years of Paris-Roubaix. He was strong enough, I think, to rival Fabian Cancellara today, but when you get to the top end of the sport like this, these kind of riders, if you're not on the wheel, if you're not in the slipstream of somebody like Cancellara who makes that move, you have no chance at all of getting across the gap. And now we've got eight riders behind working together, and they can do nothing to resist the increase of the time gap on Fabian Cancellara. 1.45, they just added 10 seconds. 1.55 now has come up on the clock, so he's continuing to the two-minute marker now. That is going to be well over a kilometre ahead, probably a kilometre and a half now ahead of the chase. And that is tremendous. Remember, he went to 45 kilometres to go. Just about the same distance he went to go uh, last week in the yep. Ronde van Vlaanderen, and that was 44 kilometres to go on that occasion. But there he had a, a man with him until 16 kilometres to go. That was Tom Bone, and this is all on his own. And if he gets win number two, then he can start aiming at the elite of this sport in the, as far as the Paris Bay goes, because there's uh, four or five cyclists have won it three times, and only one has won it four. And Bone was hoping to be the second one to win it four today. I don't think it's going to happen now as uh, there's a huge crowd in the Roubaix Velodrome now waiting to see who is going to come on. They're watching the same pictures as we are on a big television screen at the bottom end of the Velodrome here. And I can tell you there's not a lot of action as far as cheers goes because they're just mesmerised by the speed of Cancellara. Well, it's uh, just going to tick the two-minute mark now as uh, Bonin, I think, Phil, is pretty much resigned to just doing his turns at the front in this group and uh, all they will do is just try and make sure that they don't get caught by any of the riders from behind. Well, there it is, just inside at 28 kilometres to go and Fabian Cancellara has gone over two minutes clear of the field. He is continuing to pull away from the chasers. Their race is done, they race for second today. Cancellara is heading to Roubaix in style. Incredible style as well. He's hardly wavered from the, the same cadence that he's had over the last few kilometres. Uh, he's a man now who's totally dedicated to one thing, keeping himself off the front of this race as he comes now into the small town of Cizouin. Once he gets to Cizouin, he realises, and he will know this, having done the cobblestones over the last week and checked them out, he only has six sections of cobbles left. And really, you can only count that as five because the last section, Phil, is really only ceremonial. It is. He's down the centre of the approach road and it is very, very smooth indeed. I wouldn't even give it one star, Paul, I must confess. But we don't know where the rest of the race is because our cameras are staying with the chase and with the leader. We know that George Hincapi is in the next group on the road along with a few others of the big names, but they are losing ground, we think, uh, to this group here who are now in pursuit. But they're losing ground to Cancellara at 2 minutes and 6 seconds. And there's the content of these eight chases. Now, what's happened here? Nothing, it was OK. I just wonder why everybody was running straight at the camera, but it was just to get him out of the way. This is, this is the small town of Cizouin. It's around about 27 kilometres to go, and uh, the next section of cobblestones will be Bourguel. But those are two sections, again, bolted together, making around about 2.4 kilometres. After that, it's confin en pavel and then the very, very famous cobblestone section of the Pavé de l'Arbre, where this man will probably broach that on his own ahead of the main field and not have to worry about getting rid of anybody in this bike race because he's already dammed them to the back of the pack. Well, the Pavé de l'Arbre also under police control today to try and uh, keep the crowd orderly for what is a very difficult stretch of cobblestones. Filippo Pizzato in second place here. 
the field that they were looking at the faces here of beaten men today as they remain two minutes 14 seconds behind Fabian Cancellara well leading up to today Phil all of the men in this group every one of the men in this group nurtured hopes of victory in Paris Bay and they all knew who the number one favorite was and that's this man here who's going on to the cobblestone section this is the sixth section from the end of the cobblestones from Cizouan to Borgel followed very quickly by Borgel to Wanin here he is again, bouncing over sector six now from Cisuang to Borgel at 1.3 kilometers for Fabian Cancelor. We give it a four-star rating, so the toughies. But look at the distance now. In all terms of 15 miles to go to the finish, his gap continues to climb over the elite of the world of cycling. It's now 2.14. Well, you can see how difficult it is by looking at the chain there. He's right over to the left-hand side of the cluster. That indicates that this cobblestone section is slightly uphill. he got to keep those uh, pedals of his ticking over nice and smoothly. He knows how important it is. He's still got to look for the safe part of the cobbles. He has to make sure that he doesn't take any risks of riding down the gutter at the side and maybe having himself a flat tire or another kind of mechanical incident. But for him, it really is going to be a procession of honor. It's amazing how, if you just look at the clock, it's ticking away from 44 kilometers to 30 to 24 kilometers to go to the finish now and this man has done all of that on his own and the wind again is crossed now as he comes out of the murk of the dust of these cobblestones continuing to climb up here the uh, shoe covers there reflecting the color of his country as he's champion of Switzerland 2 minutes 14 23 kilometers to go and a massive crowd here but they're under control now as that man with the red jersey on just dodges along just about visible to our cameras well this man he's not even slowed down a fraction phil we're all about just ready to tickle the two and a half minutes swinging round there he hardly slowed down at all he get, gets his pe pressure back up again looks for the middle of the cobblestones that's the smoothest part then all of a sudden his body starts to hurt a fraction he'll duck down into the road at the side there which is dirt still slightly smooth you can't do that in a wet paris Bay. but the speed of this man over these cobblestones is quite phenomenal it's frightening the way he flattens them out at these sorts of speeds the time trial is extraordinary underway those big 27 millimeter cross sector tires are paying off today because he's taming the cobblestones with them that's for sure those are the eight pursuers but i'm afraid they're not pursuing they are losing ground at the moment over the over the leader they are now entering section number six so they're about now will anybody try to get away is this going to be a move by tom bonan because they should really try and split this group up well, I think Bonin uh, has been caught as a, a prisoner in this group, and if he wants to do anything this afternoon uh, and save a little bit of his pride, he needs to ride away from this group and prove that he is equally as strong as Fabian Cancellara. 25 kilometres to go for the Swiss champion. So 25 kilometres to go, we are half distance, and uh, well, for half from the 50 marker we saw a while back, remember, he broke at 45 to go, the field all came together with the leaders at 51 kilometers to go and then it just split up to pieces with the attack of Cancellara and now it's at 225 the gap and building we're going to be heading up to three minutes very shortly this is going to be a huge winning margin today by Fabian Cancellara this will be an even more dominating performance Phil than his performance last week look at the dust being kicked up this is a dry Harry Roubaix it probably would have been slightly different for Tom Bonin if it had been a wet one because a lot of people and the specialists do say that Bonin is better suited to a wet Paris Roubaix but this afternoon we're being treated at the front to a man who's got incredible power and that's Fabian Cancellara well it's probably just as well it's not raining then he might have won by six or seven minutes if that's the case but we're looking at the chases here and there's this bit he had to come now is that a move by Fletcher, Fletcher I think yes chased by Bonin if they've got to break up the composition of this group and the strong men have got to get on with the job of chasing down Cancellara a good tack by Juan Antonio Fletcher second in the uh, Paris-Roubaix but has never won it no Spanish rider ever has well Bonin is a man riding on sheer pride here this afternoon Phil he's not going to let anybody ride off the front he's let one man slip and that was Fabian Cancellara and now he's paying dearly for that because he's a prisoner in this group but Juan Antonio Fletcher of Team Sky came here with a chance of trying to win this cobblestone classic he wants to try and do it for Spain and he's got great form here and this is a fabulous move and he's really turning the screw tight too he's putting his head down here 
Now again, Hushoft is tucked into the back wheel there of Tom Bonin with Roger Hammond on the right. Uh, but uh, I don't believe Hushoft has got the strength to work with Bonin right now. And again, Bonin is finding all of the riders coming back to him. And he's let someone else go. Now it's Fletcher going clear. Well, Fletcher now is going to try and eat into this advantage. He's got a, a very tall order in front of him to try and bridge a two and a quarter minute gap in 23 kilometers. But you will have noticed the acceleration. The acceleration of Fletcher has eaten into the advantage of Cancellara. Well, maybe this race isn't done and dusted. And that's the word right now as Fletcher runs off that sector number six. Heading now, we're in Borgel just at this moment in time. And uh, only two Spanish cyclists have made the second place finish. The other one's Miguel, Miguel Poble, I think it was 1958. Uh, and they're the only two ever to stand on the podium, but they've never won it. Now, do we have a fresh challenge? Because the gap for the first time in the last few kilometres has reversed. And that one Antonio Fletcher is now chasing down Cancellara. The gap is 2.17. Well, this is going to be a huge chase for the man from Spain here on the brand new team on the block, Team Sky. He's going round these corners like a man possessed. He'll be looking at another section of cobblestones in a very short period of time, and that will be the second part of the cobbles at Borgel. He's opened up a very serious gap, and once you get the gap, it's hard to close it down. I do feel a bit sorry for Tom Bonham because he's being caught out by all of these guys who can't work with him, but he can't get rid of. It's the price you pay. You try to race at the front to limit the the escape of the rider you're chasing at the same time the other riders are sitting there saving them energy and jumping around him and leaving him in exactly the same position that he was at the beginning Cancellara did it now it looks as though Juan Antonio Fletcher has done it Fletcher free to pursue this isn't Fletcher this is Eno here and yep. I think he must be in trouble in the breakaway he's coming backwards yeah he's being caught out by that acceleration from Juan Antonio Fletcher chased then by Tom Bonin but this man is doing a great ride for France because he's one of the names that we probably wouldn't have mentioned at the start of the day well this is a, a very very encouraging ride for Sebastian Eno it really is but it looks as though his job may be done now he's never had a top 10 finish in any classic race and he's certainly in that position at the moment of course well, there you can see Roger Hammond trying to do the pacemaking for Tor Hushoft. Uh, this group has been reduced in numbers. Lukemans is still there, just sitting at the back. Is people Pozzato. They just don't have the firepower to do anything, and this is probably a very good chance for the man who's trying to ride across the gap, Juan Antonio Fletcher. But I don't think he's got the power in his legs to get across to Fabian Cancellara, who will now feel just be judging the amount of effort that he needs to put in to stay in front. Well, I have to say, I've never seen Roger Hammond ride so aggressively and so well today. He really is uh, taking the ball by the horns there, but got no answers. Fletcher is riding away on Team Sky. Roger Hammond is on the Cervelo team. So it's a British rider chasing a British team with a Spaniard in the jersey right now. <laughs> Complicated, complicated, complicated old sport when it comes down to the nationalities involved now it is such a broad sport it's a global sport nowadays 215 to Fletcher 224 to Tom Bonin you can see the group there behind but Fletcher has to make this move right now he has to give everything if he wants to live the dream of possibly becoming the first Spaniard ever to win Paris-Roubaix there's the composition of the group and what's the show I make uh, two riders missing this group Fletcher's gone one way and uh, Eno has gone the other leaving this six-man uh, group in the middle. And uh, as you can see from our cameras, there's only five of them, so somebody is also missing from that group. Well, there's Fletcher, and Bonin has uh, made the big effort himself now to try and get across the gap to the Spaniard, and again, everybody. Look at the face on Roger Hammond there in second place, the face on Tor Hushoff. These are top men, and in fact, they're just about to pop Pozzato. He's in big trouble at the back there, as we're coming back up to Juan Antonio Fletcher, thanks to the big man from Belgium who's dragged everybody across to his side. He's not going to be beaten by the same tactic twice. He's not quite there yet either. But there's only four of them left, so the strong men, Hammond, Hushoft, is there as well. Is that Leukemann at the back there? I can't tell. Yep, that is Leukemann sitting They're there Leukemann, in fourth yeah, position. Yep, and uh, Roger Hammond comes up to give a little bit of help to Tom Bonin, but nobody is doing anything to this man, and he once again starts to open up. The lone figure of Fabian Cancellara, 220. He's added three seconds of his lead back again now, just as they bring back uh, Juan Antonio Fletcher. But at what expense? Because in the distance is Pazzato and Leif Hoster and Eno have been dropped from the chase. 
well Bonin he comes to the front again doesn't ask anybody for any help at all looks over his shoulder Tor have you got any power in that engine of yours because if you can we've got to keep going because we are losing time to Fabian Cancellara two minutes and 20 seconds that acceleration though by Juan Antonio Fletcher really ate into that advantage of the Swiss rider and there's Filippo Pazzato now, he's unhitched from the train and it looks like he's going back to the goods wagons behind which contain George Hincapi at the moment in that chase group. We just do not know how far back that group is containing Hincapi. But Pazzato here, who's still trying to become the best Italian, <coughs> and should be, uh, because there is a pave, a piece of cobblestone for the first Italian today in memory of Franco Ballerini who died in a, a rally accident in February this year and was a great part of Paris-Roubaix for many, many years. Two-time winner of Paris-Roubaix and the uh, Italian national team coach at the World Championships. Uh, this man, though, is ticking away and getting closer and closer to the velodrome in Roubaix. 20 kilometres to go, a two and a half minutes advantage. And just looking at the body language of this man here, Phil, you look at his shoulders there, they are not moving, they're not rocking like a man who is about to crack. He's still got plenty of firepower right in there. Well, I agree, but we should uh, take note of the fact that his gap has stopped going up. He's sticky, sticky. Oh, now it's just gone up to 232, <laughs> but he's actually sticking in the same era now. And I wonder, the boys behind have found their second wind. And there's. Um, this though is Canfin on This Pavel. is the big one. Six to five. Is the climb. This is the sector where a couple of years ago George Hincapie crashed when he was riding alongside Tom Bowen. I think it was also the sector where the fork snapped on Sean Kelly's bike once and he was very lucky to avoid a very serious fall. 232. Now, can he survive through this one? Because this is a very ugly sector. 19 kilometers to go. Cancellara just flying over these cobblestones, but the time is telling us that he's no longer running away with Paris Roubaix. Well, Pippo Pozzato knows how important it is to have energy and courage in a race like Paris Roubaix because he's fought himself back into this group. He will suffer for the next couple of kilometres and realise riding up in front of him is Canfam en Pavel, which goes slightly uphill, and then after that, of course, it's the very difficult Pave de l'Arbre, and he'll be wondering whether or not he can stay in contact when Tom Bonin accelerates again, and I'm sure he will. Well, it would be also very fitting if the champion of Italy were to be the best place the Italian finisher today. He'd be on the podium to receive a cobblestone, as we said earlier, in memory of Franco Ballerini. But this rider here is thinking only of the cobblestone, which will go on his sideboard to match the one he got in 2006. The gap still holding at 2 minutes and 32 seconds now. This is a most difficult stretch of cobblestones here. You just don't realise how difficult these cobblestones are to ride. The pictures somehow just don't bring it out, do they? Well, I don't know. If you just look at the arms there on Fabian Cancellari, you can just see how they're vibrating, the pounding that he's been getting. 55 kilometres of cobblestones are in this year's Paris-Roubaix, and you get that pounding. It's one of the only races where the next day you don't worry about having sore legs. It's actually the joints in between your fingers that hurt. Back to the six uh, chasers. There they are now. As a little helping hand from the champion of Italy for the champion of Belgium. Leukemans is 153 there. He's had a great classic campaign already this year. He's in at the killer game, but the race for second place at the moment. Tom Bonin, who managed to nail back uh, Fletcher, who's having a drink there. But again, nobody really getting on with the job in hand of catching up with Fabian Cancellara. Now, what's this? We've switched up. A little chance to see something in slow motion. Let's hope it's not bad news. Cancellara, no, that was just a little study in motion of Cancellara. He's got him on with the job again now. It's great to see this man has still got that energy in his pedalling style here. He's still comfortable, he's still got power, he knows that he can still keep riding. You can see the difference in the, the size of the tyres that we normally witness in uh, professional bike racing, but those are much wider. The reason is because of the nature of the road that we've been over this afternoon. Those are the chasers, and it's now Phil, having come down to 2 minutes and 20 seconds, started to creep back up again to closer to three. Yes, Sydney shot away once there, they all reassembled there, and Pozzato got back, the pace has gone down again, and we've gone up to two and three quarter minutes, we're now on the same sector five, here at uh, Camp en Pevel. Uh, four star section for these riders, 1800 metres in length, uh, but remember Cancellar is virtually off them at the other end now, he'll be speeding towards Roubaix in a zigzag fashion, as we dodge around the flat countryside, Occasionally you might get the shot of the helicopter in the distance and that'll be directly above uh, Cancellara. Here he is now, watch that. 
Oh, a nasty kick there as he bounced off them, but he's off them. Well, he's taking all the risks now to make sure he keeps that advantage as much as possible. The team helper just at the side of the road yeah. there was there on hand. Just in case there'd been a mechanical problem or incident, they will rush to the end of all of these cobblestone sections with a spare pair of wheels. This man, though, is really flying. He's not too... Let's just have a look at that one more time. You can see the risks that he took there. and He just had a little bit too much front brake on there, but the fact that he was able to recover and control that field just proves that this man has still got the energy and he's still thinking straight. Well, this is an amazing performance by this great Swiss champion, Fabian Cancellara. He still has four sectors of cobbles to go, and I don't think the chasers can do much about it. Tom Bonin certainly can't. He's a prisoner, a hostage in this group. He's an extremely strong rider in great form this afternoon. He made one error in the whole of the race over a period of around about 30 seconds, and Fabian Cancellara took advantage of that error and took off over the front of the bike race. And since then, he's continued to build on his advantage almost up to three minutes. There we are now at the Pave de l'Arbre. Sector number four, the Carrefour de l'Arbre for Fran for Al Fan. Fabian Cancellara as he hits the cobblestones. Take a look at that chain there. This is the man who's riding a bucking bronco rather than a bicycle right now. 16 kilometers to go, and he's nudging the three-minute mark over the rest. Well, have a look at the bike, the wheel at the front there, Phil. You can see the bike is bouncing on the front end of these cobblestones. This is probably the third most difficult section of cobblestones in the whole of Paris-Roubaix, the famous Pavé de l'Arbre, the blue cobblestones. When it rains here, they are slow slippery as an ice rink. This man is taking all of the risks. He's flying around these corners as if they weren't cobblestones at all, as if they was on a smooth autobahn in Germany or Switzerland. He's continuing to build. He wants this race now. And you know, when you're in a situation like this at Paris-Roubaix, almost a three-minute advantage with 16 kilometers to go, you can push the pain barrier a little bit further back. You can accept that pain for a little bit longer because you know this is what it's all about. Look at the way his machine is bouncing. These cobblestones are horrendous and this is where the crowd has come to uh, rather than go to the uh, for forest of Arlenberg today where there was a stricter control on them they've come here to this section of cobblestones and they are witnessing a man and his bike conquer these rough roads that were built in Napoleonic days and it's, it really is a demonstration today there are the chasers the two riders from Cervelo at the front Hammond and then Hushoff followed by Fletcher they are just coming out of one section here, but the gap is now virtually three minutes for the leader, and he's still building. Well, it's nothing now for Cancellara but to concentrate and make sure he avoids any potholes in the road, any pieces of missing cobblestone, and just continue to build on his advantage. He now will be starting to feel extremely confident because a three-minute advantage is very much a safe buffer for a man like this the only thing that can rob him Phil as you mentioned earlier really now is a mechanical failure because looking at his body looking at the way he's pedaling over these cobblestones there's no sign of weakness in this man well in all honesty he will survive a mechanical failure now because the car right behind him will have spare bikes to help him on his way so I think the only thing that can uh, stop him now is a serious fall and we would not wish that on one of the world's greatest cyclists ever I think he's done just about everything in the sport now he's not the quality or not the quality he's, he's not the type of rider who could win the Tour de France he has yet to conquer the high mountains but everything else in the world of cycling I think he could do well, he can do and has done, uh, including world titles and Olympic titles. He was so devastated last year when he won the World Time Trial Championship because he also wanted to win the road race as well. And he was so close to doing it on that occasion. He was probably the strongest man in the bike race. But that's not always the way it works in the professional cycling as Tom Bonin is learning this afternoon. 15 kilometres to go, just over nine miles. Three minutes and one second is the uh, gap here as the crowd cheer on this great Swiss champion. You can see the strength of the wind in those flags. This is a very, very difficult ride. Just over on the left-hand side there is the very famous Café de l'Arbre, which gives its name to this section of cobblestones, the Pavé de l'Arbre. He's coming to the end of that. He's got a, a right-hand bend and then a left-hand bend, and he will go on to the cobblestones of Grouzon. And then there's not really very much left to destroy Fabian Cancellara this afternoon, the single-handed destroyer of Paris-Roubaix this afternoon. Yeah. 
a massive crowd here cheering him on. There always is at this section of the race as he wisely rides down the centre of the road now to let the crowd see him and he more importantly sees them. Clips the corner off, almost got a punch off that guy there as he goes now on to sector number three at Gruzon and that leaves just two more to go after this and as Paul has said the last sector really is a bit more ceremonial. Well, this is the last tough section because even the section going through the town of M is fairly smooth. There's a bit of tarmac down towards the side and Cancellara just continues to punch out that incredible cadence and he's riding a fairly supple gear over there. You may well just notice every now and again when you get a glimpse of his cluster, he's over in about the second or third sprocket down from the top. Keeps the pressure nice and high there. He really is a phenomenal athlete. Well, Cancellara, though, his face now is a little bit pained, and well it might be here. He knows if he can just hold this pain for approximately 17, 18 more minutes, he'll be on the stadium in Roubaix, and then his ears will be aching because the crowd will give him a huge cheer when he enters the stadium. I would seriously like to know what the viewing figures are like in Switzerland here this afternoon because they will all have turned on, especially having seen that Fabian Cancellara won himself the Tour of Landers last week and they will all have been wondering whether or not they could witness another victory from this great Swiss rider. Here you can see the riders in the group behind getting onto the cobblestones in Gruson. Roger Hammond is doing a phenomenal job here this afternoon and look at Bonin under a little bit of pressure there followed by uh, Juan Antonio Fletcher. It's Tor Hushoff. Tor Hushoff now has decided to come to the front and see if he can hurt Tom Bonin at the end of the race here as we get onto this third from the end sector which is the last seriously bad cobbles and uh, the last chance I think to hit anybody otherwise this group is going to the sprint and remember Hushoff the only Norwegian ever to win the green jersey in the Tour de France is a very very good sprinter meanwhile up at the front here the Swiss champion dodges through this corridor of noise as he dances his way now towards the Roubaix stadium well, he's inside of 10 miles of racing to go to the finish, 13 kilometres to be exact. You just see there that you cannot catch out to Tom Bonham because he's all over this bike race. Again, oh, no. people put Zato is in difficulty, Phil. This has been such a long, hard race for him, and the wind is battering these riders from the left and from the right as they zigzag across the French Flanders. Philippe Pozzato, there are seven riders uh, up here chasing the one man, I think he's down to five now as they continue with Fletcher living up to his reputation as a great classic rider from Spain now just continues to keep this pace going, still dreaming of a second place where he's been before well, there you can see uh, Hushoft is just about to get up to the wheel there of uh, Juan Antonio Fletcher, and they put a distance between themselves and Tom Boonen, who I think now is starting to look feel like a broken man psychologically. He came to this bike race to win it. He didn't come to equal any records. He came to win the bike race, and he was caught out for 30 seconds of inattention in a 260-kilometer race. Well, the Pave here that Gruzon has had a little bit of things to say about it because it has caused that breakaway to split up as they come away three minutes, five seconds, the gap. Pazzato now, Loikemans and Roger Hammond are in trouble, Bonin as well, as they search now to move away from him and still Tom fights on. He will continue to fight Bonin. He's a brave man, he's a courageous man, and he's riding with the hopes of Belgium on his shoulders. Well, it's not going to smile on him here this afternoon. And he will just keep riding like this right down towards the end. It looks now, though, as if the stranglehold has been broken in that group because Fletcher and Hushoff have fled. Yes, um, Hushoff was the one who pushed the pace. Fletcher was quick to take it up, and there they are. So a Spanish-Norwegian tandem here as they push on towards the finish now. Hushoff was placed last year, remember, he's had a third in this race, Fletcher's had a second. They both know what the podium tastes like, and now they're chasing the Swiss rider. Well, the Sky a team coming to the sport for the first time uh, this year have got themselves some pretty fine performance already this year, and I think we're well prepared to look after Juan Antonio Fletcher this afternoon. There you can see Bonin, followed by Roger Hammond, just about to get caught again by Pippo Pozzato, who's riding this afternoon like a man possessed. Hushoft, Fletcher, they're now in pursuit. Three minutes, five seconds. A little bit of shaking down of those big thighs here just to keep them alive for a little bit longer. About 14 or 15 minutes, absolute maximum now. Good smooth roads again. And the ro hill roll just a little bit here now. But soon it's going to be time for this man to start celebrating, I think. Those time gaps are an awful big gap now. 
three minutes and five seconds ball that's the spread but slightly less to these two well only 15 seconds separating these two riders from the group behind but Juan Antonio Fletcher is really digging deep the next group on the road the Tom Bonin group is now off the cobblestones of Gruson the leader is looking at 11 kilometers to go to the finish in a couple of kilometers time you'll be not beyond the, the last real section of cobblestones of Paris-Roubaix this year the section from Willems to M Poor old Tom Bone, it's been a rough ride for him. I don't know what P Pazzato said there, but I, the wave of the left hand seemed to tell me that Tom Bone says that's it, the podium's gone. Yep, he knows he's lost out this afternoon. He knows he's known he knows that one, two, and three positions have disappeared away from him. They've gone up the road in what was a brave battle by him. He tried everything he could to get away from those riders with him to try and ride across the gap to Fabian Cancellara, but that's really, Phil, a very difficult thing to try and do, especially when that Swiss rider has the bit between the teeth. Looks across at uh, Tom Bonin. Bonin just continues. They've still got a race, of course. They know that somewhere behind is George Hincapie's group but we don't know exactly where. This now is Fabian Cancellara, the White Cross of Switzerland as the national time trial, national road racing champion rather, a title he really did want this year, or last year rather, and now he's showing us why. This great road racing cyclist is just ripping up Roubaix today. 10 kilometers to go, two and three quarter minutes the gap. And he's looking at a very impressive double as well, Phil, let's not forget, because it was only seven days ago on a Sunday that he won himself the Tour of Flanders. He's now about to bolt together these two great one-day icons of the sport, the Tour of Flanders and Paris-Roubaix. In the car there, just behind him, is a team manager, Bjarne Arise. Keep eating, keep drinking, my boy, but he's not too worried now because he's only got six miles to go, ten kilometres. Well, don't forget that if Cancellara does conquer today, and it looks like he will, then he takes over the mantle from Tom Bonin, as, who was the last cyclist to win the Tour de Flanders and Paris-Roubaix. That was back in 2005. And Paris-Roubaix, really, with the exception of the intrusion of Stuart O'Grady back in 2007, this event has been the Cancellara Boonen show. Cancellara in 06 and Bonin in 09 and 08, and now in 10, it's going to be Cancellara again. These two are not going to catch on, but they are pulling away towards the podium. Well, that's going to be a battle for these two riders. Uh, Juan Antonio Fletcher, winner this year, let's not forget, of Het Newsblad, which I still regard very much as being called the Het Volk, the early one-day cobblestone race in Belgium, the season opener for the Belgian Classics. And uh, that's why I think this year he came with a much uh, higher thought that he had a chance of winning Paris-Roubaix. But, you know, you have to say, and I think all of the bike riders, Phil, will say that about this performance today, Fabian Cancellara, over the last 14 days of racing, has been head and shoulders above everybody else in France and Belgium. Extraordinary form. Uh, a year ago, he was winning the prologue in February of the Tour of California, then retiring ill. It took him a while to get back into the swing of things, and then his season opened up. By the end of it, he won 11 races, including the World Time Trial Championship uh, as well. So now he's back on form. He's going really, really well this year. Better than you've probably ever seen him race. He's so confident now that any mountain can be climbed for Fabian Cancellara. This is Hushoff taking his turn at the front now from Fletcher. You can't see anybody beating Hushoff for second, or at least the ball Fletcher, but you never know. You never know when it comes down to a finish on the velodrome here in Roubaix. We may well have questioned the, the form of Tor Hushoff at the start of today because he never really showed that he was in great form last week in the Tour of Flanders, but he's ridden a race perfectly here this afternoon yeah. and he's in an ideal situation in the suburbs of M now as we head towards uh, the penultimate sector of cobbles uh, number two uh, which comes at 250 kilometers covered by the time we get onto these cobblestones leaving just eight kilometers to go and the gap uh, struggling but heading up to three minutes come down that little bit by the chase from these two I'm, I think he's got a right to feel a bit tired but I think actually he is getting tired well, uh, you can't blame him, he's coming up to around about 250 kilometres of racing in those legs this afternoon. And again, Phil, as it was a week ago, he has to say a massive big thank you to his team, Team Saxo Bank, because all of those riders, when the time was right, came to the front and they basically sacrificed themselves for one man. It was for this man, Fabian Cancellara, because they knew when they'd been training with him that he could play with anybody in this field. No, absolutely right. and. Um Yes, he is beginning to suffer now. It's only the two riders chasing behind Hushoff and Fletcher who are closing in by a few seconds. The Boonen group are actually still dropping away. 321. 
The banner in the distance now indicating the penultimate stretch of cobblestones here. This is number two sector, Willems uh, M, which is the town we've just come through here. It's 1.4 kilometres of cobblestones. And it's a little bit like a victory ride now for Fabian Cancellara, who is losing a little bit of ground to two chases, but basically there's nobody going to catch him today. This is only one star. Well, he doesn't have to worry too much, Phil, uh, because uh, right now he could lose a minute every three kilometres and still win Paris-Roubaix. And that uh, is feeling. not something that uh, I think a lot of riders would uh, take away from this man. He switches from left to right. Let's not forget a few years ago when Henny Kuiper won Paris-Roubaix, he was switching from the right-hand side to the left-hand side of the road here, and he popped his tyre off. So you have to bear in mind that the mechanical incident in Paris-Roubaix can be around any one of these corners but somehow I think that Team Saxo Bank have been very careful in looking after their equipment and their machinery making sure that Fabian Cancellara had everything on his side and I wonder in the back of his mind if he's casting his mind forward Phil to the Tour de France in the month of July which starts in Rotterdam <laughs> and on stage three goes over some of these very same cobblestone sections that we've ridden this afternoon and after the prologue he might well be riding in the Mayo Jean as a race lead of the Tour de France who knows but that's in the future and in July we're looking now here, the spring just about breaks through in France and uh, we have a Swiss rider being chased by a Spanish rider and a Norwegian rider in our new international sport of cycling here. This is Fletcher just on the back, he's going to have his hands full of out sprinting uh, push-off, I think he's going to have to try and attack him. Well, I tell you what, these two riders, that the way you look at their body language and the style that they're riding on their bikes, they are two men who are uh, digging very deep indeed. They are tired. They've battled on the roads of cobbles this afternoon to stay at the front end of the bike race. And now it's just a question of can they survive away from this group with Tom Bonin. I think Bonin has resigned himself to not getting onto the podium this year, but he will come back and fight again in the future and try and equal the record of Roger de Vlaming yeah. with four victories in this great Queen of the Classics. Of course he will. I Noting that shot there, though, that the work is now being left to Filippo Pozzato, who's been dropped twice uh, from that group, which is an indication that they've slowed down pretty drastically back there. Six and a half kilometres to go, 2.47 the gap. He's not pulling away from these two chases now, but you're right, they can't cross that sort of a gap in six kilometres. He's safe, it won't be the huge margin, though, that he seemed to be... Uh, uh, promising a few kilometres ago. Well, he's almost off there. You can see the banner, which indicates uh, the end of the last real section of cobblestones in this year's Pyrubay. After that, there's a small ornamental section of around about 200 metres just outside of the velodrome. Well, they're smoother than most of the roads in Britain after a hard winter. I can tell you that last section of cobblestones, and our roads are supposed to be very smooth. As under the banner, into the final and ultimate section there of M, uh, go the two chasers. Gap, 2 minutes and 47 seconds and uh, Fletcher anxious to keep this race moving on here this is a big result for the Sky team this new British team as well Fletcher remember giving them their first big victory at the start of the year of course heading at Eusblad first Belgian semi-classic of the year good start for Sky and a good uh, ride for Spain as well because as we've often said the Spanish riders are not normally renowned for their ability in the one day classics many of them actually fear them they're much better at home on the big mountains of uh, the Pyrenees or the Alps but Juan Antonio Fletcher is one of those special riders who has always enjoyed riding these kind of races in the northern Fra north of France and in Belgium across the border and today it looks very much certain that he's going to get himself another podium position at Paris-Roubaix and I wonder if again he will nurture dreams of one day winning this classic and the fact that Roger Hammond is sat at the back of these four now because he's defending for that escape of by his teammate Hushoft wouldn't surprise me if Hammond doesn't sweep up from that group and take fourth place and that would be a great result for him well he's a very good sprinter Roger Hammond in his own right and he is riding a defensive role for Tor Hushoft at this moment in time but for him the most important thing is just to hope that his teammate stays off the front and make makes the, the men makes the possibility of a second place finish for them just a few spectators out in the country now as gradually we'll be winding into the streets of Roubaix here on the borders with Belgium picking his way slowly but surely towards the finishing line Fabian Cancelo the shortest way around the corner straight across the apex of it and the same again so Fabian Cancellara is looking for the big finish now the gap 2 minutes 41 it's hardly changed for these last few kilometers but he's nearly home 
it's only three miles to go for Fabian Cancellara and he's still got a great advantage. He won't be pushing himself too much to the extreme now. He just has to make sure that he stays on his bike and in front of the, the two chases behind him and the four men behind that. He's got one last drag and that's the drag up through the small town of M and then it's all downhill to the finish and he will sweep onto this velodrome as he has done before but I think on this occasion Phil may be just a little bit more special because he's adding this on to his victory a week ago of the great Tour of Flanders classic as well. Inside five kilometres to go now, I have to say, here in the velodrome, it's one of the biggest crowds, I think, all around now. The centre is packed as well. He's going to get an enormous welcome when he comes in, that's for sure. He's unloading the weight out of his back pocket now. He's set fur for the finish. Inside five kilometres to go. The gap uh, just coming down a little bit more to 2.34, but it's all too little and too late. Certainly very much too late. There's just one false drag left for this man now as he climbs away from M up to the top of the, uh, to the circuit, the city of Roubaix, not too far away from here, and then it's downhill. This is the swing to the right, a little bit further up in about three or 400 metres, he will turn left and we have a big wide boulevard in front of him. It'll hurt the legs now, but the pain is easier to accept when you know you're going to win a bike race like this. Oh, indeed it is. But there's no doubt he is tiring rapidly now, Fabian Cancellara. I think he's earned the right to do that as well. But he knows now he's got the time on his side, they'll start to continue to nibble. He may only be just on two minutes by the time he gets the finish in the track, but that's time enough to enter the stadium and complete his one and three quarter laps of the velodrome before anybody else enters it. Well, Cancellara now has got time to think about this. It's not very often, Phil, that you get to a situation like this in a professional bike race where you can savour the victory, but he will be thinking on the back of his mind now that this is one of the monumental performances of his career. The two chasers, they're still two and a half minutes behind, and Hushov, these men are men who are just trying to survive and hold on to their second and third place because they are both extremely tired after what has been in a very long day in the saddle, a, a day which yesterday I thought was the start of summer. Today is like <laughs> casting ourselves back into the winter again. Yes, uh, remind me to bring an overcoat next time. <laughs> but it's gone colder by the minute, I have to say, but at least the rain has stayed away. Tom Boner now equally as tired. Join Lorkemans, another great ride from that man for Vacon Soleil, oh, the, the oh. uh, Dutch team. And there's the composition. Pazzato still in here now. The attacking idea of each other now is gone now. It's all history as far as they're concerned. They'll go to the stadium together. And then watch out for Roger Hammond. He sat at the back of these four, doing absolutely nothing now because of his man up front. And 2.31 the gap. This man, though, never seen anybody since 45 kilometres out from the finish. Well, Cancellara, he will know the time gaps. It's a minute between the two chasers and the group with Tom Bonin. So uh, second and third place is pretty much tied up as well there. And as you can have a look down there at the velodrome, and uh, the, there's the crowd that you were talking about a little while back. It is an incredible crowd, and uh, it doesn't really matter to the crowd, I think, Phil, who wins this. They know what they've witnessed this yeah. afternoon is a fine athletic performance by this man from Switzerland. This is a very, very special race. It has no counterpart in the world of cycling. There's only one Paris-Roubaix, the queen of the classics, they call it. The cobblestones of northern France are here to stay forever as long as this classic continues, as the stadium is, because it's about to be replaced. A new velodrome, part of the outbuildings will be knocked down this coming year, but this will stay as part of the relic of years gone by as this race is and they'll always finish Paris-Roubaix on this concrete track. Well, Phil, I'm not sure if you can, if you cast your mind back to last week when Fabian Cancellara was in a similar position. We're back here with second and third place riders on the road. Uh, Fabian Cancellara took that little, uh, little fairy out of his back pocket to show it to his daughter. Yeah. Now, the reason he did that was his daughter said, uh, Dad, what do you carry in your pockets and what are you allowed to carry? And he said, well, I carry my food and I carry this and a drink. And there's a little move here coming for Juan Antonio Fletcher, but he's not going to get rid of Hushov. No. But to finish the story, his daughter uh, asked the mother if they could buy that little thing and, and if he could put it in his jersey. Well, let's see if he shows it to daughter Juliana this time. Certainly, uh, Stephanie, his wife, will be watching, I'm sure, and cheering on. Juliana might be just a little bit too young to enjoy this great escapade by his, his father at the moment. From the helicopter to the workmanlike figure, the congratulations, and look at this, to 2.2 kilometres out. They know he's not going to get caught, and congratulations from the Saxo Bank team car to Fabian Cancellari. He's even picked up the newspaper there, he's thrown it away again. 2.27 the gap, he's uncatchable now, and he knows it.
Well, he certainly does. And there it is, Paul. That's the little uh, trinket. The angel again being shown to his daughter, Juliana. Let's see if it comes on. There it is. That's to his daughter, Juliana, because she asked her dad once what he carried in his back pocket. And could he carry something special for a special occasion? Well, he certainly has, and he's taken it out of his back pocket the last two weekends. A phenomenal <laughs> performance. How happy is That's that last man year. now? That's last week's picture, that, I'm sure. <laughs> it must be a replay. It's a replay from the Tour de Flanders. It is amazing, isn't it? A what? He's living through a dream. He certainly is. Now he's got to the top of that climb, Phil, uh, outside of M. It's on the flat part of the road. Now the road will uh, decline down towards the centre of Roubaix. He'll come along the long boulevards here before he makes that right-hand swing, swinging bend into the velodrome. And there's a huge crowd here waiting to welcome him home. Fabian Cancellara shows his angel to his daughter, Juliana. His wife, Stephanie, will also be watching now as he heads towards another huge career victory here and the second time for Paris Roubaix. Any fatigue suddenly disappeared from Fabian Cancellara. He's riding home on the crest of a wave at 2.27. The boys behind are racing for second place as they have been since 45 kilometres to go. Well, he's been riding on full-on maximum revs, Phil, for the last hour of the bike race. Pippo Pozzata again in a little bit of difficulty here. He's had a hard day. Yeah, I think that's Roger Hammond that's tried to jump clear. Well, this is interesting. Hammond has tried to go it alone. Tom Bonin refuses to give up and let everybody leave him behind. And hold that dog as we now go on to the last sector of cobblestones. These are the smoothies here. They're not worth the star. They're rather pleasant, in fact, as the great champion of Paris-Roubaix in 2010 heads home well this is a ceremonial section of cobblestones right outside the velodrome here in Roubaix and for Fabian Cancellara it is extremely smooth and it's extremely enjoyable for him after the cobblestones he's battered his body over Fabian Cancellara turns at one kilometer to go which includes the little trip around the velodrome into the stadium now stand by for the big cheers here from this immense crowd one of the biggest and they're witnessing one of the best winners for years in Paris Roubaix he's going to win by two and a half minutes it must seem an awful long way around the perimeter inside but there's the velodrome as he now turns in I'll let you welcome him onto the track because the crowd most certainly will Fabian Cancellara is home for the second time since 2006. He is, shakes his head in disbelief. It's just all too perfect. Everything he does simply works out this year. Cancellara, one lap to go to win Paris-Roubaix. Well, there's the bell indicating 500 metres to go. He doesn't have to sprint around here. He doesn't have to worry about anything, Phil. He can jaw enjoy the next 500 metres. The crowd is still cheering this man because they know they've witnessed a very special performance here this afternoon. A conqueror of Paris-Roubaix. He has demolished this race. And thanks to his team as well, he was put into the right place at the right time and he was always attentive no need to sprint just enjoy the occasion here as he rides the shortest way around the track on the Cote d'Azur the blue ribbon waves at everybody dress rehearsal now before the two arm salute in the back straight and he's very very excited because it's another huge victory straightens up the racing jersey and it's a huge victory for Saxo Bank as well the team that won't be next year they need some money now well, so back. Sorry, Paul, go on. They certainly do, but he cannot believe yeah. that he's adding the Tour of Flanders to Paris-Roubaix in just seven days of racing. And let's not forget the Grand Prix E3. Let's not indeed. It's a huge victory for Fabian Cancellara. Six hours, 35 minutes and 10 seconds it took him to win Paris-Roubaix. The clock has started now. And look at the average speed. Almost 25 miles an hour today. That is quick. 39.2 in kilometres. Well, if you think it can't hurt, now you can see he's just completely given up now. He knows that he's put in everything into this effort here this afternoon. A phenomenal performance. We've got to wait around about two and a half minutes, Phil, to figure out who's going to be second and third well there he is circling the track it will all come home in a minute's time he's totally exhausted now Fabian Cancellara 
the mental pressure is off he's the winner there's a little shot of him just celebrating the victory here we're still waiting for the arrival in the velodrome of the chasing two if indeed they are still the chasing two or whether they've split up or not well phil they call this man his nickname in the sport is spartacus and i have to say he really was like a great gladiator this afternoon a second and third place rider are on to the stadium now are led by juan antonio fletcher followed by tor hushoff they'll get the bell it'll be a tough one to call second place uh, already claimed by fletcher in the past third place has been claimed in the past last year by hushoff have a feeling it'll be reversed this time around hushoff is being led here perfectly by the spanish rider towards the line but they too get an enormous cheer here as the clock counts on they did close in quite considerably but then fabian cancellara did slow down on his final approach to the line now where will hushoff make his break i suspect as we come off the banking into the home straight he's going to leave it till the last moment because he knows that he must show the utmost respect to one antonio fletcher from team sky who has to start the sprint but wait 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 is the moment in time under the inside door left open and now the norwegian goes for second place not a bad second place after third last year and an applause there by fletcher well a great ride two survivors that was hardly a sprint there phil that was just trying to get yourself to the line in the shortest possible time as we see the man who gets second ahead of juan antonio fletcher now on the far side of the stadium i can see the next riders coming in and tom bonan has managed to get himself into that group push off there in second place the winner fabian cancellara oh. <laughs> and uh, and now he can have a little bit of rest before he builds himself up for the Tour of Switzerland later on in the season. He's giving an interview there for French television, but I'm not sure he's going to hear what's being said. He's so tired. As he smiles, though, he forced a smile. Our cameras need to go back out on course, but as you can't see it, I'll tell you at the moment, the three riders are half a lap from the finish. And we have Roykemans in the lead at the moment. Hammond is in second place and Tom Bonin is in the sprint position in last as they go down the back straight. So Cancellara congratulated, now we'd like to see the race again, but I'm not sure we're going to. There's Fletcher giving him a big hug as well. And now the sprint is on and as suspected, it is Roger Hammond who has made a run for the line here. He packs a very good finish, but pride is on the side of the champion of Belgium. And it looks as though he's not going to get up. Hammond finishes an excellent fourth place and Tom Bonin gets fifth. Well, Hammond uh, may really had the, the ride of his life over the last few kilometres. He was defending the position of Tor Hushoff. He gets fourth, Bonin fifth. Let's not forget Bjorn Lukemans in sixth place. But the man of the match, the man of the day of the week, I have to say, is Fabian Cancellara with a phenomenal performance. He was always attentive. He saw the move that he had to make a long way. It's a big risk to make a move like that so far out in a race like Paris Bay, but he did it and he had the firepower to pull it off. I make it his 30th win in his career which started only in 2001 but then only it's nine years ago already the 29 year old has had a phenomenal career as a professional a moment well, to consider just the enormity of what he has achieved well if i'm not I wrong think that's phil, stephanie isn't it yeah i think if i'm not wrong phil he's won every sunday for the last uh, three week three three weekends grand prix e3 that's amazing followed by the uh, tour of flanders followed by paris Roubaix. Big days, big days, and uh, well, that's certainly his wife Stephanie. But I'm just wondering where Juliana is, his daughter. She must be around somewhere. But that is a result. An emotional moment for a very nice man as well. I can tell you a little secret now. He actually telephoned Paul Sherwin during the week and asked him could he have a copy of the television program which we did in the United States because uh, he wanted it for posterity. He heard we said nice things about him. How about that? <laughs> well, there's the velodrome and there is the result. Fabian Cancellara by two clear minutes over Tor Hushoft and uh, Juan Antonio Fletcher. And then at 3 minutes 14 seconds, Roger Hammond delivers the goods for Great Britain with a 5-4 place ahead of Tom Bonin and Bjorn Lukemans. And it looks as though we've got Leif Hoster coming in now. I think he will be in 7th place because our camera's wandering a bit around the stadium. But that's still a very, very good ride. It's a tough day out there, six and a half hours in the saddle. Now the velodrome at the bottom of our picture, that is where they will demolish some buildings to build a new velodrome. But this old one will be preserved, they say, and will always be used for the finish of the 
Paris-Roubaix because the new velodrome will be covered and there won't be a way to race into the stadium. So they've got to keep this one and keep the tradition alive. This is Sebastian Eno. I suspect he's finishing eighth, but all these are guesses right now. All members of that, that final breakaway. It was Eno that started the move, don't forget, out on his own and got joined by the heads and then uh, was put on the back burner a little bit. The gap is quite big here when you're looking at eighth place and already six minutes has gone by. Tour. Uh, it was very difficult, I think, for anybody today to get the better of Fabian Cancellari. Yeah, today was, uh, I think he was just unbeatable uh, when he attacked. He's maybe surprised us a little bit, but uh, I think we all understood that uh, after this we have to race for second place. But for you, this is a, a very special race, third last year, second this year. Uh, you must be nurturing hopes of uh, one day walking away with a win in Paris-Roubaix. Yeah, that's my, my, my biggest dream, this winning this race. And uh, I'm getting closer and closer, slowly, but uh, I'm sure one day I'm going to win it. Roger Hammond did a good job to help you today, but could it have been any different if you'd had Heinrich Hausler here with Savella Test Team as well? Yeah, of course, uh, we, if we had uh, Heinrich Hausler and also Andreas Klier, we'd be, we would be even stronger, but uh, we did a great race today. Roger Hammond did a uh, really, really good job, and we had Jeremy Hunt in the breakaway, so for team uh, Savella was perfect. Fabian, this has been a fabulous th three weeks for you, but uh, today seemed to be filled with a little bit more emotion. Uh, a lot more. I think um, the way and then the double and history and memory of the ballerini. I mean, there's a lot of things actually. What what go what was going through my mind or in my head on when I was alone. I mean. Uh, so not only to push me coming here to, to Roubaix was, was all those small details what gives me this more and more something what, what I needed to come to the end because I was one minute or two minutes or three. I, I was not look, looking on that because uh, you never know on this race what's going to happen and that's the reason why you need to, to go as fast as you can to the end and yeah, great day and uh, amazing day for the team. I mean, everybody was fantastic today. But it's a big risk in a race like Pyro Bay to make a move so far from the finish. Were you concerned about Tom Bonin being in the group and trying to get rid of him a long way from the finish? No, I was trying to make, uh, to see the first reaction, like a big reaction to to make a selection, like a bigger selection than was, was before. But um, when I went, uh, yeah, on the end I went and I think, or I don't know, I need to ask the other ones what they've been thinking about when I went because or they say he's crazy or, or they say now it's over because he already has his five meters. Like when he has, he's gone. Tor Hushoff said to me that once uh, you'd gone, they knew they were all racing for second place. <sighs> Thank you, Tor. <laughs> there he is, he waves at the crowd. He's brought on stage there by Bernard Eno, himself a past winner of the Paris Roubaix. He rode it just the once to tell the organizers he'd never ride such a horrible race again, and he won it. And now the man who's won it for the second time is Fabian Cancellara. Wait till he gets the cobblestone, I'm sure we'll see it. The ticker tape behind there, blown across the backdrop of uh, this, the building behind, which will eventually be knocked down to be replaced by a new stadium. There is the cobblestone. He's now got two of them. Looks like he needs to go to weight training classes. It's obviously very heavy. Well, there was no bigger dominator of Paris-Roubaix than this man. He rode away from all of the top riders and he held them off for 45 kilometers to win by two minutes today. Cancellara gagne en 2006, il était deuxième en 2008, il gagne à nouveau en 2010. And I think that is his daughter, Juliana, standing uh, with mum Stephanie. What a wonderful occasion for her. Tor Hushoff comes on in second place, a third one year ago. Warmly congratulates uh, Cancellara. I think they recognise this man is in exceptional form at the moment, but Tor Hushoff has pulled out a big result today for Cervello, second for him, and then Juan Antonio Fletcher, who was on everybody's lips as a likely winner. These two seem to be the best of friends. But Fletcher takes the third place today. 
So there they are, the top three finishers in the 108th edition of Paris-Roubaix, the winner. And there was no doubt about that from 45 kilometers out is Fabian Cancellara on the right of our picture. For Team Sky is Juan Antonio Fletcher. He's finished in third. And the other rider, Tor Hushoft, promoted from third last year to second this year. But there was only one man who was the real champion. And boy, wasn't he a champion today. I hope you've enjoyed the coverage today of Paris-Roubaix. Until next time, I'm Phil Liggett for Paul Showing saying so long for now.